This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. If you're getting any compensation, it's not charity. Russ Wakelin. You put me on a boat with freaking dragons attacking me and whatnot? Now we're talking David Weber in the third chair. Why is it that people like you always think you're more ruthless than people like me? Contribution from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listeners. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming. Coming at you with the speed of a Mason alignment dispatch boat with a streak drive busting through the IOTA band and the Kappa wall. This edition is brought to you by... The Adventure Creator and Solo GM Guide on Kickstarter. If you write RPG adventures or play solo, it's a metaphysical certitude you will like it. Tonight, our panelists, as always, are Russ Sir Sheridan Wallace Wakelin and creator of w- award-winning worlds, David Lieutenant Commander Watana Pongse Weber. I'm not even going to try. Anyway, let's <laughs> begin. Issue number one. Although the motion picture industry is now the single most experienced art form in the world, it is relatively young when placed against such things as photography, sculpture, and cave paintings. The advent of motion picture history is a muddled affair, with a scholar's exact definition of motion picture dictating an array of assumptions and expectations. However, most filmographic scholars agree that the very first filmmakers in history were the Lumiere brothers, born in the 1880s. Question. At their very first ever screening, the Lumiere brothers showed 10 short films that they had made in the months pre, uh, uh, leading up to the premiere. Which of the following was not one of those 10 films? Mm-hmm. A. The exit from the U- Lumiere factory in Toulon. B. The sprinkler sprinkled. C. Horse trick riders. D. Jumping onto the blanket. Or E. Bathing in the sea. Hal Roach Russ. I'm going to go with the sprinkling sprinklers. And I, I'm going to go with jumping on the blanket. Ooh. Jumping on the, unfortunately, those are both correct. Those are, the sprinkler sprinkled, also called the gardener, did in fact uh, show up in that series. And the jumping on the blanket was a, a beach scene. Uh, you missed it because the correct answer was the exit from the Lumiere factory in Toulon. This is the big league now, boys. <laughs> David's. Mm. I think you should get credit for the gardener. Thank there, you. Okay, Thank because you. he didn't tell you the right name. That's right. The reputation. No, no, no. no, no that is the correct name. Okay. The answer was A, the exit from the Lumiere factory in Toulon, because everyone knows, as everyone knows, the Lumiere factory was, in fact, in Lyon. Issue number two. Wow. Retrospective from Latin retrospectare, looking back, generally means to take a look back at events that already have taken place. For example, the term is used in medicine describing a look back at a patient's medical history or lifestyle. In media, it is often used to denote an episode or a stage in the development of a pr- property where nothing new is to be offered, and so things begin to turn back upon themselves. This can be done using time travel or other time-space anomalies, flashback episodes, or thinly veiled where where are they now episodes. (laughs) Question. In a retrospective of appearances by the memorable character comic book guy on The Simpsons, his first ever appearance, including the quote, you made me get off my stool for that, is one of the best. What comic is Bart Simpson and two of his friends trying to buy in that episode? Dr. Riveria Russ. Future Man. Duffman David. Oh, boy. Not a clue. Oh, no. Yeah. Radioactive Man, oh, number cool. one, of course. And oh. yes, you did need the number because big leagues don't forget. <laughs> Issue number three. In botany, an evergreen is a plant that has leaves in all four seasons, always green. This contrasts with deciduous plants, which completely lose their foliage during the winter or dry season. There are many different kinds of evergreen plants, both trees and shrubs. Considering the traits of an evergreen, however, it would make a great name for a company involved in any even not large number of exploits. Question. Playing off the scientific name for plants of the evergreen family, what would be the Latin translation of evergreen? Redwood Russ. Uh, Greenus Everest. Awesome. <laughs> Just See, him for, <laughs> See him <pray> Verdi. <laughs> oh, so close. And if you didn't already... Sip is, that, sip is Verdi. <laughs> oh, oh, basic translation. <laughs> this was the token slow ball, guys. <laughs> evergreen Semper. As in the Marines and the Coast Guard, Virens, as oh. in times with sirens, like the ones going off right now, because you guys are completely wrong. 
Ah, uh, well. And shoe number four. In literature, the literary element conflict is an in- inherent incapability between incompatibility between the objectives of two or more characters or forces. Conflict creates tension and interest in a story by adding doubt as to the outcome. A narrative is not limited to a single conflict. While conflicts may not always resolve in narrative, the resolution of a conflict creates closure, which may or may not occur at a story's end. Question. Name the critic who most forcefully put forth the idea that the conflict which embroils the protagonist of a story must be ennobling. Enemus of Rhodes, Russ. Oh, I'm going to defer to the author on this one. Diodus Gee. David. Gee, thanks. <laughs> um, don't have a clue. No, you pensive peoples of impropriety. Plutarch is the perfect parry, which, of course, makes you both imprecise. <laughs> That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening, and good night. This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by Gamesalute.com. Check out gaming news or find out what the new hotness is on Springboard. Gamesalute.com. And by Battle Foam, protecting your army so you don't have to. And by Conquistador Games, focusing on immersive and thematic games. More details at CQGames.com. And by Cool Mini or Not, the vanguard of a new genre bringing minis and board games together. CoolMiniOrNot.com And by Geek Nation Tours. Rise up and join the Geek Nation touring the world at GeekNationTours.com And Wargame Soldiers and Strategy Magazine, making historical wargaming less scary and more fun. And by MiniatureMarket.com. Want an even better deal? Like them on Facebook and click the D6G logo. Hello! 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 Hey, hey, and welcome to episode 131. It's all odd numbers. Of the D6 generation. I'm Russ Wakeland. I'm Craig Gallant. I'm David Weber. Hey! Hey! It's David Weber, Craig! Ed Weber. Sitting right there on the other side of Skype. This is good. On the other side of Skype, on the other side of the internet, is one of my all-time favorite authors again. Yes. This da- is insanity. <laughs> David, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Where well, we are thrilled, David, for you taking time out of your extremely busy schedule, and even busier now as we learn later about your very exciting Honor Harrington news, which we talked to you and the friends at Evergreen Studios about all that excitement. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. That is fantastic. So that's coming up a little later. And then yeah. we're going to talk to you. we got a world-famous author here, so we got to talk to him about writing. That's right. right? Um, so we're going to tie it into role-playing games, too, a little bit. So uh, it's yeah. going to have a little bit oh, of yeah. everything. A little bit right? of everything sprinkled in there. And then, and then also, of course, we had a big contest going on just summed up. So a little later in the show, we'll also talk about the results of the big contest. There too. we go. Okay. So up first, we have a few announcements to discuss here. Let's see. So, um, well, Gen Con's coming up. Gen Con is coming up. David, right you, corner. David, have you ever been to Gen Con? Uh, twice. Ooh, nice. W- yeah. What, what years? W- which town was it in? That'll date yourself. Many years ago. I believe it was in Columbus when I was there oh. one time. Oh, well, look at that. No, 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 no. I don't no, think no, that's wait, right. No, no, I think no, that's no, Origins. No. I think you're... Yeah, 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 that's Origins. Okay. Um... Was it in Minneapolis? You know, I have been to so many cons that I can't remember what towns they're in. Oh, it see? Will start blurring. Well, it's, it's very blurry. But anyway, Gen Con, of course, is the one that, you know, is built by Gary Gygax. Four days of gaming. It is. Yes. And, of course, it's coming up. It's, it's, by the time you hear this show, you, this show will be coming out right literally when Gen Con's happening. So, That's right. Yeah. I, uh, think, I think that the first time I went to Gen Con must have been back in the, in the 80s before I'd ever sold a book. Oh, wow. That was when I was involved with uh, Starfire. Oh yes, well, we, oh, did, we right, talked about right, last right. time. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. And, and Gen Con's fantastic, especially if you're an RPG or you, you got to go at least once in your life. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, oh, yeah. so while you're there, we're actually running an event Friday at one o'clock for all our listeners there. So if you're there, come on by. It's the only place you guarantee here. All the hosts will be there. Um, we're going to have live segments recorded there in the in the thing. We're going to do a rapid fire. You can see if you can get more answers right than our guests. And also, it won't be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, David. You've got a heck of a record here. If you add your two shows together. That's right. It is. Got David's two shows together, he actually is still better than the average of any other double host on the show. Yes, indeed. So um, come on by Friday, 1 o'clock. Come on by, say hi. We'll give out a patch, maybe a button, and uh, we'll have all kinds of free games and other things to give away as well. Yep. Yes. Our friends are using us as a conduit to give free stuff to you. Yes, exactly right. Now, also, um, if you are a listener to the show and you want to get even more content, and, you know, because four hours per episode Listen. isn't enough. Yeah. Uh, um, Craig, how do the lost chapters work? 
Well, it's the the most ingenious business plan I've ever heard. Uh, four hours for free, and then you pay for the next 45 minutes. Right. So you go to the uh, d6generation.com, uh, the website, and you look on the uh, right-hand column where all of our cool little artwork is, and you will see a very lovely image of a bunch of stacks, a stack of books, mm -hmm. and it says the D6 Gen G Lost Chapters. You click on that. And it'll lead you right into how to get the D6 Generation Lost Chapters, which is uh, a whole bunch of uh, episodes now. What are we on? 15? 50? No, I think we're, we're on, on 60 now. We're on six. There's yep. 60 of them. That's, yeah, I mean, right. that's And your best way is to subscribe because it works like Netflix. You subscribe, you get as many as you, you want to consume. And the right. latest one, people have been asking us to go back through some of the games we reviewed many moons ago. Do we still play them? So we go through some of the, some of the classics from two or three years ago and talk about... Are we still playing them, and, and, and where are they are now? Are they gathering dust, or are they still getting to the table? We covered a lot. We did. I think we went from uh, episode 18 up to like 60, or maybe even a bit beyond that. Well, you know what? That takes care of all of our announcements, Craig, but I can't wait to talk to David more. So what's the time now for? Oh, right about now, it's probably time for... Achievements in Gaming! <laughs> it is indeed... <laughs> Uh, and Achievements of Gaming is brought to us by Miles, who says, Woohoo! I had so much fun at Gen Con this year. Loved seeing and playing games with the old gang again. I'm already looking forward to doing it again next year. Jackie! And I still have no idea what that means. Okay, so uh, <laughs> up first, so David, we, want, we like to ask our guests, you know, what have you been playing lately? Uh, do you get much chance to game anymore? No, I have to say that's one of the things I regret the most about my writing schedule because I have not really had the opportunity to game uh, seriously in 15, 20 years. Oh. Although I did have a very interesting GURPS game in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico as oh, wow. a visiting player. Yep. Uh, there was me and uh, George R.R. R. Martin. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, Roger Zelazny. No way. And wow. Walter John Williams. No. Wow. And Jane Lynn Scold. No. And then you um, at then me and their friend Chip, and uh, <laughs> wow. I had been uh, Chip's uh, the luckiest assigned. man alive. <laughs> well, it was set. It was set in ancient Japan. Oh wow! Uh, and I had been assigned a um, sort of a ninja character whose uh, mission. Did R. R. Martin do the uh, the GMing? Did you? Right. Well, no, no, no. Actually, we Total were party all kill. players. We were all players. The GM uh, was uh, Melinda Snodgrass's husband. Right. Uh, at the time. Um, and, uh, my role was to slow the party of adventurers down. And when I couldn't fob them off anymore to kill one of them. Nice. And was this, what, what, it was, and what, I did it by writing haikus. <laughs> oh, that, okay. I, I would heart. stand in front of them and write a haiku and they would go, ah, yes, we must do this. And they would go off and do that. And finally they got suspicious. So one of them decided that he was going to like kill me the next time that he saw me and, <laughs> The the character the NPC that I was playing his special ability was that he could not be hit with a weapon. Oh, okay, that was his special ability. Right. Now hand to hand combat that was another story. Right. Um, and uh, so when they tried to chop me up with their uh, their katanas, they started breaking the heads off of all their arrows and whatnot because they figured I couldn't be hit with an edged weapon. Uh. <laughs> uh, and things were going really pretty well <laughs> except that I made three critical success roles in my attempt to assassinate uh, um, Hapsu Hung. Uh, <laughs> that was Roger's character. Uh, and somehow, all I did was render him unconscious. I, I uh -oh. think the dice were being shaved by yeah, the GM. Perhaps. Uh, Roger's character immediately, when he recovered consciousness, was like, oh, there were a score of them, but I fought mightily, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so meanwhile, Walter John Williams... Uh, Outlaw banker, biker, samurai had chased me down out in the moonlight. Um, and everything was going great until he rolled critically and dropped his sword. Yeah. At which point I found out where else he had buried points when he took the disabilities of illiteracy, homicidal rage, family, family <laughs> vendetta, and everything else. He'd plowed it all into hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> So, so I got away with my life, okay, <laughs> um, and uh, was hiding in the bathhouse when they came in. And they got their first clue about where the, the bad guys they were hunting had come from uh, in the, the, uh, the uh, 
coat of arms on the saddle blanket of one of the horses. Yeah. And uh, Jane Linskold was running a Buddhist, an <laughs> albino Buddhist nun. Nice. Uh, who suffered from incurable optimism. <laughs> uh, it was like, oh, how fortunate the roads are flooded. Otherwise, we would be sweating in the sun, you know. Um, and uh, she said, wait, wait. You know, why is this clue being handed to us so easily? It must be a trick. So the next day, when they came out of their of the village and headed on their way, I was standing in the middle of the road, um, and uh, and they they stopped looking at me very suspiciously, um, and I I gave them a haiku which said, you know, I can't remember it all now. I was writing these as I went along, of course, uh, but it says, you know, you have passed the test of 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 uh, wisdom. Go on, and they're like. What? Wait, that's too easy. And they're like, were you here to test us? And my guy says, hi, which is the first word he's ever said. And they're like, oh, wait, you tried to kill one of us. And I said, if I could have killed one of you, then you would not have been the appointed ones. And they're like, oh, well, I, I was trying to slow them up till the all in all in black killer assassin right. joined the group. Of course. So, so they said, well, we got this clue, and I'm wondering if it's a trick. And I said, oh, you are wise. And so I sent them off to the other end of the islands, um, and uh, and so they like they're like, oh, thank you, and come with us. I said, no, no, I am the tester. The guide will join you shortly. You will know him because he will be dressed all in black. <laughs> and they said, oh, thank you, tester, and went their way. <laughs> and as as I was leaving, Carl, who was running the game, is he, he shook my hand and said very quietly, and I thought I was nasty. <laughs> So nice. That was probably my greatest gaming achievement. That and selling well, a, bunch of, a bunch of D&D gamers dehydrated water. Nice dehydrated water, which empty bottle. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, you get two achievements for that, David. Um, crazy. That is fantastic. You know, it's funny because I, I, I watch the television show Castle, and mm-hmm. I, I see and every once in a while he goes and he, he plays cards with all these famous murder mystery authors. So mm-hmm. it does my heart good to know that in actual real life there are – Sci-fi, fantasy, and other authors who get together and play RPGs. I think that's fantastic. Oh, great! And and that was the last. That was the that was the year that Roger died. Right. Oh, um, that's and he was incredible, uh, incredible RPGer. Mm. Uh, Jane, I think, got him started in it, but yeah. he was he was great. Um, really got into it. Well, that's great. Uh, well, it's it's nice to have such great memories from that. Um, yeah. So is that what you miss most now that you're uh, now that you've got you're so busy? Is your RPG time? Yeah, really. Although to be to be fair, I seldom got to play a character yeah. because they insisted that I run the universe. Nice. Well, that's the best. That's that the, makes that's, sense. Yeah. Yeah, but it does sort of you know give you a god complex. <laughs> you know, it's like it does. It's all right. Yeah, but um, J, uh, Jean Jackson, Jean Morse, uh, her married name. Uh, I played. I started gaming with her and a group of about eight guys in uh, graduate school. And she used to record the sessions, and then she would do a tra- she would do a typed transcript <laughs> of all of the in character conversation back and forth <laughs> between the GM and the NPCs and the the player characters, and I've got probably ten thousand words <laughs> wow of that stuff filed away, you know. And nice. one of these days, I'm going to go back and actually turn it into. A uh, a comedic novel. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That sounds great. Well, fan, well, I'm sorry you're not playing much anymore, but that's a, that was a great t- tale yeah. of gaming. That, that yeah. So, I miss it. I miss it. So, Craig, what are you playing lately? Uh, <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, I've got my big reveal. But first, I played a lot of left, right, and center in Maine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where apparently my in-laws um, are much. Uh, much bigger gamblers than any of the local guys because all the local guys knew what it was. It's mm-hmm. a it's a dice game. It's very quick. It literally takes like ten minutes to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no skill whatsoever. There are no choices. There's no <laughs> tactics. There's there's nothing but rolling the dice and doing what the dice tell you to do. And it's literally do you pass your chips to the left, to the right, or put them in the middle of the pot? And and you just go around until only one guy has chips left and he wins. Oh. It's so simple, but at the same time, it's so much fun when you get down to like the last few chips rolling around. 
Uh, less fun for me when it's a dollar a chip, but you know. I was going to say. I, well, okay, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. But is there any drinking involved? Does that help the game? I have heard that it's there's drinking involved, <laughs> okay. but I, I have not witnessed it. Um, yeah. and probably I'm, probably uh, makes it less painful. I was yeah. going to say it's probably <laughs> actually yeah. It's the probably, money moves more fluidly when that. Happens. <laughs> oh, open again, <laughs> and they were doing a bunch of the rules wrong. But anyway, okay. uh, Peruto of course made its appearance yet again. Peruto is an awesome. Uh, uh, filler game that is constantly seeing the table still, and I played uh, War Machine. You did. I played I, War Machine. I played Craig and War Machine. It happened. There's an achievement right there. It happened. It did. I I, I, I want I want you to know that my ten year old son is yeah. beginning to discover Risk and Diplomacy. Yeah, and yeah. a couple of other board. And uh, okay, the problem is he's also discovered uh, Empire Earth. <laughs> Oh yes. Okay, and whatnot, and and you know, it's like, well, Dad likes the tabletop games. <sighs> <sighs> okay, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my my daughter's starting to play with me now too, and uh, it's it's funny trying to keep. Once they get the hang of it, it's hard to keep up with them. They're just playing all the time, yeah. so yeah, they yeah. get very good very quickly. It's like those video games. It's hard. Yeah. To now my them. daughters, my yep. daughters, spades. Oh, see, I haven't oh. done the cards yet. I have to do yes. that. Yes, very cool. So, so we got Craig to the table with War Machine, Craig. Now, what, what yep. faction did you play? Uh, I am playing Retribution, and Ooh. I am surgically altering the models that have cod pieces. Yes, I am. <laughs> so you, you <laughs> find the cod pieces embarrassing? Well, it's the, uh, in, in, a, in a universe that has a lot of very strange uh, graphic design choices, <laughs> mm-hmm. the, 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 um, the groinal defense armor... <laughs> Of the elves Look. is the single most disturbing, strangest graphic design choice. Look, in the when, you, when you're a, when you're a, when you're, a, when you're a dying race and your people are being born without souls and things, you've got to protect. I, apparently, you've got to protect. Got to protect the family to, jewels. I'm just saying. Fully articulated, stinger oriented. <laughs> right. Pieces, That's the reason the elves and war machine are still around and not like Tolkien and heading over across the sea. There, you know, right. they so, can I, keep I, reproducing. Option, but yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so I'll talk more in the modeling about what I've been okay. doing with it. But yes, I I have picked up uh, Retribution and I en- I'm enjoying the background. I got the book. I actually went all in. I got the dice. I got the tokens. Yep. Um, I enjoyed using them all, and I enjoyed my first game with Russ, which Yay. was uh, good because Jeez. Russ was going to play his uh, new army with me, and then uh, decided to go easy on me, which he'll talk about in a moment. Yes. But. So. Was, now, that was yes, that was my game of the week. Actually, my game of the two weeks. So I've been playing, um, David. I don't know if you ever played. Did you, have you ever played Diplomacy? Oh yes, yes. So oh, so yes. I got I got I got. This is kind of like your story where you you play with uh, well known authors, and I I play with semi well maybe moderately known um, by four people podcasters uh, micro on celebrities micro celebrity uh, Diplomacy by email, and we do one move a week. Mm-hmm. And now I've been successfully betrayed twice. <laughs> so I, it was funny. I was betrayed by England. Well, see, mm-hmm. so first I was England had a. I was from playing France, just to be clear here. And, I, and I'm, I am really uh, pounding the bejesus out of Italy, who is controlled by Stephen Bonacor, the man behind Stronghold Games. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen's name now is Stephen the Dirty Trader Bonacor. <laughs> for those keeping track at home. And so I'm beating him down. And so finally he's like, is there anything? What can I do? You know, I'm doomed. And I said, tell you what, I'll make an alliance with you. Uh, You help transport my troops through the Mediterranean. I will invade Austria and Turkey and that area, and we'll have an alliance. So he's Uh like, okay. So... So we do this, and I'm, and he's like, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And it's okay. So, and I'm like, he's got his whole half of his country is exposed to me now. But I'm like, I'm like doing my thing. And so England decides to betray me finally, and comes in from the north and starts invading. You know, coming through uh, Normandy there, and, and just you know, France is screwed again. But, yep. but uh, so while I'm doing this. Then Italy's like, no problem. I got your back. I'm going to help you fight England. And then he takes, starts taking back my land in, in North Africa, and just betrays me <laughs> utterly. Now and who's like England. England's he's well, he's got pr- to protect it from England for you. He, that's what he's... Well, he's not even claiming that. And yeah. England is being played by Jeff Engelstein. <laughs> who is, now, here's the problem. See, I should have seen this coming because Jeff Engelstein is now a successful game publisher. And guess who publishes his games? Stronghold Games. 
He's a game designer. Yes, game yeah. designer. His games are published by yes. Stronghold. Stronghold Games, <laughs> which is run by Stephen the Dirty Trader Bonacore. <laughs> so just so we're clear on what's going on here. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the situation now. So just like they say in Firefly, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. Ga- game well, starts to uh, starts to uh, resemble life. Yes, I am. I am still alive. We've had two in the last turn. Both in the same turn. Both uh, Austria and Germany were eliminated. So I'm just excited as France to have outlived Germany. I think that I'll take that as a moral victory for the history books. Well, you know, I I used to love to play uh, 25 millimeter tabletop Napoleonics. Oh yes. Oh wow. Um, and um, I used to use when I taught. Uh, I had a uh, quadruple assistantship in graduate school teaching uh, Western Civ, mm-hmm. and I used uh, diplomacy and the Third Reich both as uh, teaching tools. Yeah. And I discovered early on that the trick is to always absolutely 100% keep your word and, and to word the, the, the agreements that you're going to keep very, very <laughs> carefully because everybody knew I would always honor the letter of any treaty or agreement nice. that I made. Okay? It just, you better read the fine print carefully. So you're like one of those, you get, you get one of those wishing stones in Dungeons and Dragons and you know you got to be very careful how you word it. You're like that guy. I, w- I will remain <laughs> loyal to you until you attack me. Oops, I forgot to move that army out of the province you were oh, moving you it to. You've attacked me! me. Right. Uh, I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got. I, I, Diplomacy is a very interesting game. It's very simple. It's very elegant in its simplicity. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I, it's such a social game. I think it's hard to play by email. I think you almost need to be in person to really get it going. But it works best to, yeah. to play it in person, especially when you smile sweetly. At yes, the other see, I, while, while hiding the dagger. <laughs> I've discovered that, Craig. So, uh, you know, yeah. locally I'm kind of known for my Jedi mind trick ability. It doesn't work across email. I, no, well, that's it doesn't, a shame. There's a limit to the force influence you can do by, by yeah, distance. And that, that's the reason I've been, never been as enthralled by e-games yeah, I as mean. I am by tabletop and board games where you actually are interacting with the other player in real time. Yep. I 100% agree. That's why we play every Tuesday. And speaking of that, I just played this past Tuesday lots more War Machine, which, of course, is the great miniature uh, tabletop game. And... Um, so I've been playing a lot of this recently. I played against Rafe again, and he finally beat me with his Colossal. Yeah. He actually tabled me, wiped all my guys out. So good job, Rafe. And I am working for payback on that. I have a little army for you that involves lots of angels. So mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> Then also, um, I played uh, Chris, our local gamer, Chris H., who who's ran for us the War Machine League. Very nice to do that. War Machine League just ran up, uh, wound, uh, wound up. And he plays Signar. I haven't played Signar versus Signar in a while and had a good battle against him. That was fun. It happened. Uh, I know. I noticed that you're not writing down whether you won or lost. Uh, I did win that one also. Um, he got he was playing Kane and he got a little too close and I was able to assassinate him. Um, oh, so I was into that. Which then is what he did to me. Yes. Then I, I so <laughs> then I played then I played against a local one of our local best players, Blake. So I got the new um, so a brand new faction for War Machine just came out called Crisis of Convergence, which are these. These, it's, it's probably the most sci-fi I faction. I don't think it's called Convergence that. of Chris? Convergence I, of Chris. I, I, I believe it's the yes. Convergence of there's, Cyrus. There's no... Thank you. I don't know how to pronounce it. I just play them, okay? Crisis of Convergence. COC. Let's just call them COC. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. It is a crisis of convergence because you want to convert... So the, the, the fluff behind these guys... They're, it's, so I don't know if you're familiar with War Machine, David, but it's a very... It's a, it's a uh, sort of steampunkish. Um, medieval time period, but there's these giant steam-powered robots that uh-huh. that magic is used to control them mentally, that kind of thing. But yeah. this new faction just came out. These are people who are very mathematically oriented. In fact, they're into prime numbers, and even the ranges of the weapons are all prime numbers, that kind of thing in the game. And they their their fondest desire is to transfer their soul into a mechanical body. So that's what they try to do. So there are guys that are human still on the list, but the the most powerful guys have already had this transference occur, and now their their soul is in the mechanical mechanical thing. So I've got this. Uh, one of their 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 pieces are called the Clockwork Angels, which are all these female flying uh, robot angel soul infused ladies that kick major butt and have these swords that can deflect bullets and the whole thing. So I got a whole army of these, uh, and I played them against. Um, our friend Blake, who's really, really good in his cricks. Really, really good player. Blake's probably one of our strongest players, and I knew my list was strong, but I wasn't sure. I'm this this was the list he was going to take against me. Uh, right. New. So Craig hasn't played in a long time. I want to make his, his entry back to the game really <laughs> relaxing. So I, I tried this against Blake, and it, I defeated Blake in turn three, only losing three models. Have you ever beaten Blake before? Uh, 
I don't think I've ever beaten Blake in war. Uh, maybe once, maybe right. once. But I play many games against Blake, and I always lose. And and, and Blake is just the, the kind of guy. He's just really, really good. He's very, very logical. He knows every rule cold. Yeah. Yes. And so yes. he's that kind of gamer. And he's great. It's, it's good to play against him when you when you want to when you want a good challenge. Um, mm-hmm. And when that happened so well for me, I realized that Craig would not enjoy this battle at all. <laughs> and, so you immediately started looking forward to it. Well, yes. But then I decided I shouldn't do that because I want Craig to ease back into the hobby and actually enjoy it a bit before I get to the level where I just wipe right. him out. Yeah. <laughs> so so I switched back to my Signar list and took one of my more, uh, the list with a lot more pieces that Craig would recognize and know all the rules of. And we had a great game. Craig was actually taking me apart piecemeal. I mean, he was got me down to two models and... You just at the very end there, you got a little cocky with your Warcaster and got too close. And in War Machine, like chess, uh, David, the, the, the most powerful piece is your Warcaster, who is like the queen in chess and that she's the most powerful piece, but also like the king in chess. If you lose him, you lose the game regardless of what the mission is. So he got a little bit close, and my last piece was able to kill him, but otherwise... Uh, it took your last die roll, too. It did, actually. It took me the last die roll, and if any of those had bounced a little worse, you'd have had me for sure. So um, good game. I love that game. Oh, it was fun. a lot of fun. Uh, uh, many, many years ago in uh, the Greenville Simpsonville War Game Club, mm-hmm. um, we were playing a game of Zulus from the Zulu oh, yeah. Wars. Yep. And uh, it was down. I was I was the Brits. I was down to the sar- my my sergeant, and I was wounded. So my my sergeant was having to carry me, mm-hmm. and we were attacked by the last three Zulus, <laughs> and they killed the sergeant, and I killed all three of them with my Webley. And there I lay in the middle of the jungle, <laughs> unable to move. The last survivor from either side. So nice. I suppose I won. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a great story. That's why you play these games. I think the tiger probably won. <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I love, okay. I love these games where you get a great story out of them at the end that you yeah. can tell years later. It's always fun. So other quick board games I was playing, I played Alien Frontiers with all the expansions. Had a great time with that. I That's a fun game. Um played Perudo with Craig, as you already mentioned. I tried a new game. Uh, it got kickstarted a while ago, and it's making it into a local scene called I think it's Monster Boss or Boss Monster. I can't remember which, but basically it's a it's one of those games. It's a card game, and it's all 8-bit graphics on the cards, you know, artwork, so it's all like, like old-school video games. Yep. And the premise is you are building a little dungeon of rooms and defending against pesky heroes who keep trying to come in and steal your stuff. <laughs> Boss Monster. Uh, Boss Monster, <laughs> thank you. So it's, it's kind of like if you play Dungeon Lords, it's like a very light version of Dungeon Lords. Yeah, uh, sounds like fun. It's, it's very fun. So you play cards that actually put rooms in front of your main guy, and each of you have a, you have a main sort of evil overlord card that's your character, and there's different ones. And what's really fun is like they all, a lot of them are, are geek references. Like there's, there's like Johnny of the Evening Watch, <laughs> and he's on a little <laughs> frozen wall. <laughs> he's standing there, right? Um, so that kind of little fun little tongue-in-cheek stuff in there uh and then but it's got very simple mechanics you play in like 15 20 minutes but it actually does feel like and the cool thing is you're trying to lure the heroes in your dungeon because as they come in and die you get 50 points for the, the kind of heroes you slay but um if you're not well defended the heroes will actually do damage to you and can actually kill you off mm. and you attract the kind of heroes you attract based on certain kinds of rooms in your dungeon so if you have a lot of, of holy stuff like if you have a lich he might be plus two little onks, which represent clerics. So clerics are more likely to come and fight you because you got a lot of undead in your dungeon. You put a lot yes. of money in there, you get more thieves, that kind of thing. And you're trying to be the guy who gets more of the thieves or whatever you want to do. If everybody's equal in, in thief attraction, the thieves wait until someone is more valuable. So you're you're trying to play the place like a metagame going on where you're trying to figure out, well, if Craig's saving for swords to lure fighters in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for money. But then, oh no, Randy's also going for money, so I better switch over to cleric, that kind of thing. So it's a fun little yeah. game. Plays yeah. fast and fun. Um, a couple other quick games. Fish Eat Fish is a fantastic family game. Played it with my daughter a couple more times. She loved it. She loves that game a lot. Uh, great components. Very simple to play, but also good fun if you're older because it's a nice little screw your neighbor element to that one. And then The Duke. If you like uh, abstract board games like chess or checkers mm-hmm. but are looking to take it to the next level, I cannot speak highly enough of The Duke. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's basically um, chess, but they're square wooden pieces that have a grid on the top that shows you how this particular piece moves and you're reaching into the bag each turn and summoning new pieces to the board that have different movement patterns. And the last little caveat to this game is every time you move a piece, you flip it over to the other side, which is a slightly different movement pattern on it for your piece. So, for example, if you think of a bishop in chess, on one side, he might only move diagonal left to right. And on the other side, he might only move diagonal right to left. Or a rook, same sort of thing. Or maybe you've got a guy who can move like a knight, but then when you flip him over, he moves like a rook, that kind of stuff, all kinds of crazy movement. It's really neat. Great, very can fun you, game. Can you choose to flip him over before you move? No, or, that's the thing. Oh, so he flips was... after you move him. Now, you can look at your own pieces other sides. Yeah. Um, but one of the things is you, you always start with just a duke on the table, 
and mm -hmm. two halberdiers, which is like a standard piece. But then you have this giant bag of other pieces. And every turn, you can either move a piece or reach into the bag and summon a new one and put it adjacent to your duke. So wow. you're kind of reinforcing. It's very simple, very elegant. Really like this one. So take a look from the store shelves. It's every yeah, weekend. sounds like fun. It's a lot of fun. So, Craig, where are you playing your games? Where do you play these games? <laughs> oh, haha, you got me first. Well, I play these games at Myriad Games in Manchester, New Hampshire, but also check out their great store in Staten Island as well. Uh, owned by uh, or Salem or Salem, right? And Zev from Z-Man Games runs the Staten Island store, so be sure to check Myriad Games out if you're in the uh, New Hampshire or New England area in general. Uh, you're probably not too far from Myriad Games. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, David, you mentioned you played some Napoleonic stuff. Did you have you ever done a lot of modeling, and collecting, and painting, and that kind of stuff? Oh yeah, I, at one point I had, uh, oh gosh, um, I had the entire French Agincourt. Uh, army. Wow. Um, oh, we actually beat those pesky English longbowmen because I refused to charge across muddy fields. <laughs> nice. Um, the, um, and I had, we did um, uh, the Hyborian Age, mm -hmm. uh, which was, was a lot of fun. Uh, I got uh, to be Shem with all the archers. Nice. Uh, and uh, I've always, always liked missile weapons. Mm -hmm. um, I used to, I used to, I had a running correspondence with Gary Gygax for, Oh, wow. months at one point about why the missile weapon sucked <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. Well, okay, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons when we were using Greyhawk and Chainmail because right. nobody had invented Dungeons and Dragons yet. Wow, old school. Uh, so, you know, I felt I, I felt no awe. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was okay to argue. Um, and he was basically, no, you're not going to kill a level three uh, warrior with a lucky hit from a longbow. Nice. Not going to happen. Nice. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right, be that way. I love it. That's um, awesome. With the, one of the more um, interesting campaigns that I wound up putting together combined um, Cloud Galleons of Mars uh, and Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons, and GURPS. Oh wow! Oh, it, yeah. It was. It spread across about four universes by the time we <laughs> were done, uh, including the member of uh, Her Majesty's Parhuni Rifles, who picked up a Vulcan minigun. <laughs> uh, and had the batteries in one bag of holding and the belted ammunition in another one, <laughs> and awesome. he referred to it as the uh, the mighty artifact McCulloch. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome! Uh, it's awesome. Uh, role playing games are so much fun. Uh, yeah. So, Craig, what have you been doing for modeling lately? <clears throat> uh, well, this is what I did. I, I decided <clears throat> the people I like playing games with and who are showing up on a regular basis were playing War Machine. And uh, a couple of my other friends were getting back in War Machine, and I thought, I've always said it was a solid uh, system, a solid system. I thought I can enjoy it if, if I just kind of like, you know, just decide to suck up the whole cast or kill concept. And, uh, I, but I need to really enjoy and appreciate the army that I'm collecting and I'm painting. So I went back and I looked at them all again and I did already did Signar and uh, they were okay, but they didn't really do it for me. I uh, already did the trolls and I really didn't like the comic element uh, behind their design. Uh, nothing else really appealed to me. I kept coming back to the elves because most of the elves don't wear full armor, so they don't have that ridiculous piece. <laughs> so elves <laughs> don't have it. Their battle mages don't have it. Their, J their rangers don't have it. Their uh, artillery bowmen don't have it. And I would be looking through it going, I like it. I like it. I like it. Oh, crap. There's more heavy armor. <laughs> and so I, ev I eventually, and their jacks, their giant robots have mm -hmm. the exact same thing going on. Right. And uh, and I don't still don't get it. <laughs> but I decided that I was just going to do it. And I, I I was I love other than that one element. I love the the design of the models. I love the because it's it's kind of like I, I don't like beer, but I love Guinness. It's kind of the same. <laughs> I don't like the aesthetic of this game, but the elves, which take every element to the extreme, them I like so. Nice. So I did that, and uh, I basically went to Myriad and I Myriad Games in Manchester, New Hampshire, <laughs> and. Um, they have a used section where people who have traded in their models can, uh, you know, you can you can buy them and you can buy them at a discount. And sometimes it's a substantial discount if somebody has tried to paint them and not done a very good job. Yes, yes, yes. So, so <laughs> I decided I was like, you know what? There's there's like two units and five or six models solos. I'm gonna get everything they have. I'm not gonna get the robots because the 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 paint job on the robots was too bad to fix no matter what mm. so i bought all of the i got all those i just spray painted them i based them so they would have some nice basing 
Uh, I just primed them, reprimed them, so they're not the best. They're ch- kind of chunky. Some of the face details been missing. Yes, uh, but I didn't really, I didn't want to spend a lot of money, and I don't have a lot of time, as David said. So uh, I, I basically got just what I was going to need to make a decent force, and started painting up that. And I'm enjoying paint, painting them. Like I said, there were no armored models in that group. So <laughs> I didn't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I did a big trade a couple days ago where I got basically everything I'm ever going to need. Nice. A bunch of heavy armor guys, which I am going to clip, 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 uh, and then model. Uh, and I put together two robots today. So I have put together and painted 21 models, uh, infantry models wow. so far. And uh, I to get today I put together two of the Myrmidons, the, uh, the big giant robots. The Aspis and the Phoenix, and uh, and I also made rec markers for them too. Nice. So uh, so I'm enjoying the modeling aspect very much. Oh, you good. guys, you guys remember Avalon Hill's game Wooden Ships and Iron Men? Yes. Yep. Actually, okay. Yeah. Well, that was based on a game called Ship of the Line, which Craig Taylor in Atlanta designed. And if you ever can find the Jabberwock. Uh, miniatures rules for Ship of the Line, you will find that one of the playtesters listed is David Weber. Oh, cool. Really? Um, and I still have about 120 scratch-built Ships of the Line and frigates oh, wow. uh, from when we were playing at Tabletop oh, uh, nice. that I have occasionally hauled out uh, the uh, Wooden Ships and Iron Men rules right. and right. the uh, ping-pong table. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Laid the, the gridded sheets out and gone to it. Yeah, what scale were those, David? How big were those ships, roughly? Uh, they were roughly one twelve hundred. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that a hundred and twenty gun ship of the line was the next best thing to uh, inch inch and a half long. Nice. Right. That's a fun size, actually. Yeah. You can get yeah. Big fleet they're they're, going on they're yeah. they were expensive if yeah. you bought the the cast metal, which is why right. mine are all all uh, uh, sculpted balsa. Yeah, uh, which my children are forbidden to even look at. <laughs> Do hard, not touch. You know, yeah. it's, uh, that's awesome. That is awesome. So I did a little painting and modeling myself. I, I got I was working on my Hammersmith, and then uh, Convergence came out, and I got totally distracted. So I decided I really wanted to build out uh, this, uh, you know, Maidens of the Gears uh, list, which is a tier four theme list based around the Warcaster Aurora, who is the winged Warcaster. Uh, she looks like a giant angel, which makes sense. And so I got, I built out 12, I actually got five units of the angels, which is the maximum field allowance you can have under her, under her theme. Um, but, and I figured I was going to blast through because the great thing about these guys is they're all robots. So it's pretty easy to paint them. You prime them black, you dry brush them a little silver, you know, you hit out some, some glowy eye bit colors and you're done. The problem was assembling these was so hard. They were all metal models. Um, and each individual angel is six pieces. Um, so gluing together metal, A, is slower than plastic, uh, but B, you know, they got a little filing, got a little fiddly, and they, were, they look, I love them. I think they look fantastic, but um, they are a lot of work. So getting those together, I also built out two, I did manage to build also two convergence vectors, which are what their words for heavy jacks, uh, and I painted them all up as well. So I'm, I'm making good progress on this list, and I think by Gen Con, I'm hoping to have them all at least uh, table ready. Uh, yeah. So that I can bring them in my little because uh, it's a very small army. So I can bring for, them in my little for, bag. For the list, you guys, you guys, you guys are making me feel very, very old. When <laughs> I started doing doing miniatures, man, Scrooby uh, <laughs> was there, and Minifig was still a gleam in somebody's eye. Oh yeah, um, that's was, how long ago it was. And if you wanted, if you wanted uh, ships of the line or whatever, you. Built the you built them. I know. No place else we we them. live in a very good time, David. There's stuff. Yes. Pretty soon, you know. Pretty soon, it'll be just like your books. There will be. You'll have a, a 3D printer in every home and just making your own models right there by oh, push a button. Oh, that would be uh, that would be a reason to have a 3D. That's printer. it's close. I mean, it, it's really close. Actually, yeah. Close. Um, in fact, there are miniature companies now who use 3D printers to get the prototypes out and then just send them to a casting system. So it's getting uh-huh. really close. It is. Um, but- go ahead. I was going to say I spent about two years uh, casting my own Napoleonics, yeah, uh, and that was you know it's like okay the fumes are getting well, kind of yeah. intense in here you know <laughs> yeah uh, I, I never went there although we do have some friends uh, and Craig is one of them who use a lot of the dental molds and the dental plaster yeah. to make um, you know dungeon t- tiles and stuff like that yeah mm-hmm. terrain so we, yeah, yeah exactly right yep, yep, um, yep. All right, so we're going a little long, but I want to wrap. I want to get some some of our other in our other section here. We talk about you know reading any good geeky books, seeing any geeky movies, watching any TV geeky shows, 
like that. Uh, David, you catching any? You find any time between writing to to watch any uh, any uh, geeky stuff? Well, um, to be honest, uh, the time is really limited, and mm-hmm. I am a baseball fan. I oh. should point out that uh, while having this conversation with you tonight, I am missing a game Uh-oh. in which, although I am certainly not complaining that I'm missing it, uh, <laughs> Atlanta is leading Colorado 9 to nothing in the 7th. Oh, beautiful. However, you know, <laughs> these things happen. Well, we appreciate uh, your, your sacrifice. Appreciate the well, sacrifice. Actually, yeah. there is one TV series that I'm following right now. Oh, yeah. What's that? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's Continuum. Ooh, I'm, I'm not sure. Craig, have you seen that? I'm not sure. I'm, I've yeah, seen that. Not. What's that well, about? It's, 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 it's time travel. It's about a cop who comes back from 2077 Ooh. Um, and leaves her her uh, her son and her father her, and his father behind. Uh, she comes back as, uh, as as a result of a botched attempt to execute some members of a mm-hmm. anti corporate terrorist group. As she begins to discover, after she has met the the I think eighteen year old iteration of the genius who changes the world, oh, wow. that there are all kinds of. Uh, subplots in play uh, Mm -hmm. that she didn't know about, that it wasn't actually an accident that anybody got sent back. Oh, wow. And it's been kind of fun watching them peel the onion if they could keep it up. Okay? It's kind of like when I saw the original Highlander movie. Yeah, right. Okay, all but the last 10 minutes were great. Right. (laughs) You know? (laughs) And it's kind of like you you, you just hope when when you're you're spending the time in here going, ooh, I wonder where that thread's going. You hope it's really going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. so far, so far, it's been it's That's been cool. cool. I'm, I think I'm enjoying it as much as I've enjoyed anything since. Uh, I think I'm enjoying it more than I enjoyed the remake of Battlestar Galactica. Oh wow. Okay. I'll Pro- check that. Out. Probably about as much as I've enjoyed anything since B five. Wow. Nice. So wow. that's that's Continuum, and what what network is it on? Do you know? It's on the Sci-Fi Network. Sci-Fi, okay, great. Okay. Yeah, they actually have some Sci-Fi on the Sci-Fi. Network. I know, right? Besides That's wrestling, okay, good. So, yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. I thought it was Wrestling Network for a minute there, but yeah. Oh, and Sharknado. It's also the Sharknado. It is network. definitely yeah, Sharknado. <laughs> uh, Continuum's on Friday night, I think. Okay. Uh, at like ten and eleven, which is right. a pain for people who are watching the baseball game that ends. <laughs> Like 10, sorry, I'm sorry, ten and midnight. So to to catch it, you know, unless you really want, unless you really like to spoil, you know, the right. the the fun, you you wait till the midnight, which works pretty well because I usually work until four in the morning anyway. Yeah, I so, go. I remember the know. last time you were on. You you're a, you're a late yeah. night writer. Yeah. 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 yeah cool. Um, Craig, what have you been uh, watching or doing? <clears throat> well, David, did you 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 did mention earlier that you had seen a couple movies? Which uh, which movies oh, have yeah. you seen? Oh, let's see. We did Oblivion. Uh, oh, yeah. Which I thought was not that badly done for where they were going with the story idea. Yeah. Um, what else did we see? Boy, that says a lot for my mental fatigue. <laughs> uh, well, I, okay, it's not a real recent release, but uh, I I was very pleasantly surprised by The Hobbit. Oh, mm. yeah. Uh, because when they announced they were going to do it as a trilogy, I was like, oh, my God. God, <laughs> but at least for the first one, he's pulled enough from the Silmarillion and sort of the the, the right. prequel to the Hobbit, yeah, uh, to to make it work. Whether or not, again, it's one of those you know, can you keep it up, right, uh, yeah. through an entire three movie arc? I, um, I kind of, you know, it's kind of like admitting you like Manischewitz wine, <laughs> uh, but I kind of liked uh, the the most recent GI Joe movie. Oh, I kind of did too. It, yeah, you know you what. Know. The cliff scene was totally worth the price of admission, let's be honest. Yeah. Like, that yeah. Was, that, I mean, everything else is just candy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, that's kind of... I'm, I'm trying to see more movies, despite yeah. the fact that I really don't have the time to see them, um, because of the uh, uh, the upcoming project right. with Honor. The awesome, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I, okay, I'll tell you what I watched. What? Uh, okay. Although I watched on Netflix. Not, yeah, not that's fine. The theater. Uh, I just watched uh, Expendables 2. Oh, yes. I like uh, that. I did too. I was, you know, I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's just silly fun. It's, you, it is what it is. Right. It is what it is. It's kind of like Independence Day. You know, yeah. you just right. got to kind of close your eyes, right. pretend no science involved, and watch the Right. Movie. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, was, right. Yeah. Yes. yeah, exactly right. Um, awesome. Well, that's great. Yeah, so like you, I'm glad you get some time to, to relax a little bit there, David. That's good. Um, Craig, what, do you, what have you been doing? 
Uh, okay. Well, uh, we went and saw Pacific Rim. Oh. As a big group. Uh, a whole bunch of us went and saw it, and I wanted it to be my big summer movie, so I was I I pushed everybody to see the IMAX 3D, blah blah blah. We got a ticket. I mean, there there had to be like 15 of us. Uh, our friend Joe wanted to sit right up front, which uh, was the beginning of the end, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and um, and I liked it, but I didn't love it, and I was very 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 upset and disappointed. And I started to think as soon as I left, like why didn't I love it? because it had all these elements that I was looking for, and I decided I needed to give it another chance, and I went all by myself in the middle of the day. I took a little break from writing, and uh, I, I just went on my own, and I saw it 2D, no IMAX, and it was exactly the movie I wanted it to be. Oh, I yeah. loved it. That is, uh, if you see only one movie this summer, see Pacific Rim. I'm yeah. sorry. That movie was fantastic, and it was. Well, I saw it twice myself, same as you, Craig, and and I saw it the first time, and I I was in love with it right from the beginning. The movie knew exactly what it was doing. It knew who its audience was. It knew, it knew. It's like we have built giant robots to <laughs> fight giant monsters, and yeah. if you're going to accept that premise, then we're all good here. How are you? You know, <laughs> and, and it was great. I mean, it was just that kind of craziness. I mean, you got you got them picking up container ships and beating each other with it. It's just awesome. And my my daughter, my youngest daughter, my nine year old. My oldest daughter, she's into sci-fi and stuff, but but she's a little bit, she's more of a fantasy person. My youngest daughter is more of a sci-fi person. She's like, I want to see this movie, Dad. So I after saw it once, I was like, there's nothing really scary in here. They've seen Lord of the Rings. It's not that scary. So I took her to see it, and the whole time she got the biggest smile on her face. And so we're walking out, and my wife says, Kit, did you like the movie? And she looked at her deadpan and said, Mom, it's got giant robots fighting giant monsters how could that not be cool? <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> what could go wrong? That's my daughter right there. <laughs> so it was awesome. I, I love it, Craig. So I didn't mean to jump in there about it. Pacific yeah. Rim. No, no, no. Yeah. That's, uh, okay. yeah, and I loved it. So uh, I highly recommend, if you haven't seen it yet, go see it. I would mm-hmm. recommend that you see it in 2D and not IMAX. Because I would, too. What I, what I experienced was you just don't get that emotional connection, or at least I don't, when it's this big, larger-than-life, huge thing, and you're constantly craning your neck one way or the other to try to catch it all. And, of course, the 3D, that, that whole element of 3D film that forces you to focus and doesn't really allow your, your eye to float from object to object where you would maybe want to catch some of the peripherals, I really, really don't like. Uh, like I, I mean, it can be great for visual f- effects and be stunning, of course. Yep. But no, I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. We were down uh, in Florida for the last shuttle launch. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. And the, uh, the Terminator, I mean Terminator, Transformer, uh, I think Revenge of the Fallen was coming out that same weekend, was premiering. And we watched it in the uh, IMAX theater there at the Space Center with Werner Vinge. Um And... The 3D effect was highly distracting. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think I think 3D is a very potent weapon, but I think that the problem is that when you use it throughout, right. and when you have when you focus, I, I think you are absolutely right. When you f- the the focal point of the scene is always where the 3D is maxed out, right. and it just it pulls you away right. from so much of the rest of the movie. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, so there is it. Uh, I did just see not a geek, geeky film, but I saw the way way back uh, for my anniversary with Karen, uh, oh, okay. which ought to tell you something about what what we like best out of life. <laughs> what the, the evening that we have, we go to a dinner and a movie. Um, yep. But yeah, we saw the way way back with Steve Carell. It was awesome. If you like, watch like the first thirty seconds of the preview, and if you like that, stop watching the preview because it'll show you most of the funny bits. But it's an awesome, very touching. Has very little any any geeky stuff in it whatsoever. Uh, I loved it, and it, Steve Carell was awesome as a jerk without a single laugh line in the entire movie. Oh wow! It was really I he he pretty much plays the same character in everything, and he just varies the wackiness from one level to another. This was a totally different character, a, a flaming jerk that you really if it wasn't Steve Carell and Karen, my wife pointed this out if it wasn't steve carell the movie would have been a hundred percent darker and probably you wouldn't be able to enjoy it because it's steve carell he's being a jerk and you're like wow that guy's a jerk you're not if it was another actor like if if it was like a um i can't even think of a of a of a similar actor that doesn't have that sort of lovable uh meta uh career element instead 
But if it, if it had been any other act, you would have just been like, oh, my God, he's evil. Oh, and, and, <laughs> but it, you know, there, there was not enough in it to make up for that. Yeah. Right. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. And as far as what I'm listening to right now, I'm listening to Ender's Shadow. Oh, excellent choice. Mm-hmm. Which is the uh, the sequel to Ender's Game. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to it primarily because um, uh, at the end of the 30th anniversary audio book edition of Ender's Game, uh, Orson Scott Card has an hour-long author's commentary that was phenomenal uh, where he actually traces the origins of the short story all the way through to where they are right now with the movie. Oh, wow. And uh, they're talking about, he's talking about the uh, previous iterations of the movie and why those fell apart and why this one's working. And a big element of why he feels this one's working is that they're actually bringing in bits and pieces of which people who li- later on listen to our conversation with David and the crew from Evergreen uh, <laughs> recognize bringing in bits and pieces from other books to actually layer things together mm-hmm. to make a coherent story that yes. uh, that actually has a couple different shifting points of view. And and so the big thing of that author's commentary was uh, was Ender's Shadow, which of course is the sequel where he follows Bean, the the little kid who's the mm. the other genius in yeah. the whole thing. And I'm I mean it's not Ender's Game by any stretch of the imagination, but it's I'm still enjoying it. So that's what I'm listening to, and uh, I'm listening to it because I got it from Audible. Yes, indeed. And if you go to our website, thed6generation.com, and you'll go again on the right-hand column, and you will see the Audible logo, you mm-hmm. click on that, you can get 30 days of membership for absolutely free, including one book, uh, one credit, which is almost any book in their entire... Um, which includes the entire Honor Harrington series. <laughs> it indeed, which I was about to say, and I listened to the last Honor Harrington. This is the first Honor Harrington book I listened to instead of reading. You know, it was uh, very frustrating for me, David, because it took him a long time to get Honor Harrington on there. Yeah, it did. It was um, many years. I, they, they've done really well by a sense. Allison Johnson is great. Yes. Um, yeah, but she is. she's the one thing that, that is wrong in, in the books that she's reading oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. is it's Manticoran. Uh-huh. Not Manticoran. The problem is, it's not her fault. It's my fault. Uh, because we emailed before this whole thing was done, and yeah. she asked me, you know, which of these pronunciations is it, Manticoran or Manticoran? And I told her the wrong one. Oh, no. Uh, and um, <laughs> and I, I went back and I found the email. So, yes, indeed, oh. I am the oh. one who is you responsible like, for that so, error. So that went down like this. I could not have told her that. That was not yeah, me. Pretty much. And yeah. she's like, sir, I've already narrated the entire book and you told me. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Well, that's good. Well, that's good. So, well, it'll be interesting to see how it lines up in the movie then. Because <laughs> all, the, all the audible listeners will be like, no, it's Manticorin. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of um, funny. But yeah, so, uh, and so, yeah, so yeah. Audible is awesome. In that 30 days, you'll also, of course, get at whatever sort of promotions that they're running. And if you had done it in July, which by the time you're listening to this, it's too late. But if you had done it in July, they have a, a thing they do every July called Christmas in July where they make 10 books that they want to feature free. You get to pick one of those 10 books for free. And this year was uh, Slim Pickens. The, there was only one that was uh, sci-fi fantasy-ish. It was a, a post-apocalypse shared universe that was actually created by um, a bunch of different authors coming together and agreeing on the rules and the history, and then they wrote four different short stories. So I'm looking forward to reading that eventually, but uh, it was free, so there you go. Well, that's awesome, Craig. So I um, I just finished some Audible 2 here. I just finished the uh, Book 8 in the Dresden Files series. Uh, good stuff. And uh, Oh, Sharon you, loves those. You know, Jim Butcher's also a big role-playing player so we got to get him on the show we got to figure out if we can get jim if anybody knows jim out there let us know we'd love to have him on yeah um actually we're talking to the one of you who we know knows jim yes (laughs) (laughs) right offered before and we can't find you in any of our emails so please email us again right right advantage of that authors are awesome we love on the show i said um also um so uh Friend of the show, also Eric Summerer, who is we was on the show not too long ago, was a voice narrator, a uh, voice person. He recommended a book that he had just finished narrating called Defiance, uh, book one of Dragonics and Runics by A. Wrighton. Okay. And I just got through this book, and I so I had a question for it. Now that we have a world famous, best selling author on the show, 
Yes. Good. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, yes. So I had a you question for you because I, I've, so this book, um, first of all, Eric did a fantastic job narrating it. He did great accents and great job focusing the characters and pronouncing. He was fantastic. Um, the author, I, I don't know if, if, if uh, he or she, I'm not really sure if it's a man or woman, uh, is um, new or, or a young author or just their first book. They, she really likes her, or he, I, I feel like it's a woman, they like their adverbs mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. to the point where, like, in any scene, I know this person is, is excited by about 50 descriptors about how excited he, they are. He, he, he quickly, smoothly, right. effortlessly glided across the room. Right. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And, and any one of those would have done the job. Or, yes. or I, I remember I read Stephen King's On Writing just because I thought yes. it was interesting. And he, he is like, he's a Mr. Anti adverb. Uh, and he pointed to the fact that like in any dialogue scene, if you have to use adverbs, you may not be doing good dialogue kind of thing. I think, Do you I share that view? I think that's true. I think now I use adverbs yeah. um, quite a bit, uh, but I actually go through on adverb extermination hunts <laughs> in, the, in the final draft. Yeah. My feeling is that usually, if you've picked the right verb, mm-hmm. you don't need an adverb. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you might need like you know he moved quietly. Yeah. Okay, but if you know he he sprang to his feet, yeah. okay, um, he strode across the room. Right. Uh, he glided across the room. You know, if you pick the right verb, it will carry a lot of the strength of the adverbs. Now, I know nothing at all about the the book that you're talking about or the author, so mm-hmm. I couldn't presume to to critique the writing style. Um, I will say that one of the things that it's really, really hard, uh, especially for young writers to or new writers to, to understand, is that if some is good, more is not necessarily better. Ah, yes. Um, and that you have to, uh, you have to uh, pick the... John Ringo, when he, when he started writing, yeah. um, when he and I did the Prince Roger books, mm-hmm. he had... Um, and absolutely, I mean, he came up with an absolutely great ending for one of the books. Okay. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he then proceeded to come up with three more absolutely <laughs> great endings for the book. And they were all great. Okay. I mean, they were strong. But yeah. the problem was that it was overkill. Right. And so we had to pull back to, to the yeah. one that, that we thought was the strongest of, of the three. Um, and that is... I, I will tell you that experienced writers find themselves falling into that trap. I fall into it sometimes with my infamous info dumps yeah. um, because I operate on the theory that the the reader has to know the capabilities of the hardware, for right. example, to understand the menu of choices available to the to the officers making the decisions. Right. And I prefer to just stop and, as the narrator, give you that information rather than having officers who know perfectly well what they're doing explain it to each other right. uh, in the course of the book. Now, with the, with the, uh, the peeps um, following the short Victorious War, uh, I was able for quite a while to get away with having the officers explain because they had the dim-witted people's commissioners on board who mm-hmm. didn't know crap about right. naval things. And so they had to explain, explain everything. To, their, to, to their commissars what they were nice. doing. Um, but no, I, uh, every writer, every single writer I know, except maybe Patricia McKillop, who is, in my opinion, the greatest prose stylist writing in fantasy today, wow. um, has, uh, a little quirk in his or her gallop that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and part of it is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sure. <laughs> and part of it is if you can figure out how to fix it. Do it gently. Yeah. That makes um, sense. But no, it's uh, adverbs are. Um, I was never the big fan of Hemingway that a lot of people have been. Right. But Hemingway was absolutely right when he hammered, hammered, hammered on verb choice instead of adverbs. Right. And, and, and I don't mean to pick on this author because the story is so good. Like, I really like the overall plot. I want to listen yeah. to the next book, even though I 
the style is is it doesn't appeal to me as, as other some other authors as much, but yeah. but the story itself is great. So I hope I hope that as uh, he or she, I should really look up the the, the gender. Uh, I, works I, forward. I got some info on you on that. Is it he? Uh, here's the deal. Yeah. The website A Writen, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. The title they this person has given themselves is creative evil genius novelist and screenwriter. Oh, okay. And okay. the about <laughs> section just has credits, interviews, and reviews and awards, oh, which okay. led me to believe, oh, they must have been around a while. They've got some awards. Their mm-hmm. awards are. Advanced Achievers Award, highest honors in an MFA class. Oh, dear. <laughs> Course Director's Award for Creative Writing Portfolio 2. Course Director's Award for Editing for... Okay, okay. In- Do not brutalize this person. Yes, I know. So I don't, yes. know. I don't mean brutalize. I'm just saying this, this, as many of my friends are and or were actors, this is a website that many of them would have designed for themselves mm. as self-promotional... Yeah, it just means... Tool mm-hmm. rather than like a like there, there's not a lot to rest on. So, yeah, so there's, there's, only thing I thought it's a girl, but the only re- a woman. The only reason I know that is because on one of the things uh, it says she runs her own. There you go. So that's great. Book. Well, she it's a great book. You like the story? She does. Well, she does a great job. But just okay. I'm, there's different. there's a balance. There's yeah. a balance between story, substance, and style. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and you're not going to succeed long term unless the substance of the story is there, and that is part of what I don't think anyone can teach you as right. a writer. Um, they can teach you to do it better, and you can yeah. learn to do it better from experience. But that's a, a hard part. But I have always told people that a weak story, strongly told, will succeed, where a strong story, weakly told, will fail. Mm. I think that's true. Because the style, the voice in which you tell the story is the interface that the reader uses to get into the substance of the story. Yep. And if it's a distraction rather than an attraction, that's one of the reasons I love Patricia McKillop. Uh, She writes small books, which obviously I do not. Um, But every single word in a McKillop book uh, story has been carefully selected for what its function is yeah. uh, in the sentence, and the sentence is chosen for its function in the chapter, and the chapter is chosen for its function in the novel. Um, if you anybody who has not read Patricia McKillop should go find the Riddle Master of Head series. Oh wow! All right, I'll go, uh, I'll go add it to my the list Riddle Master of H E D. I cannot recommend it too strongly. Awesome. Well, I've you, never met Patricia. I'd like to someday. Well, you know what? Uh, we, should, we should talk to you more about writing, David. I later should, in the show. So why don't okay. we do that later in the show? Craig, are you ready to wrap up achievements? Uh, I am. I've, I, I, I'm achieved out. All right. That then is achievements. We're going to be right back with David talking more about uh, what's coming up with Honor Harrington and then later more about these awesome writing concepts he's already starting to elucidate us upon. Is that elucidate. even the right? Oh, that's good. not even. I'm not even using the right words here, and I'm, I'm picking on adverbs. I don't even use the right words, people. I'm clearly not a an author. Elucidates a verb. All right, I'll take it. All right. <laughs> that's wow, Russ. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> See, <laughs> clearly, I am the one in the room who has never written a book. That's clear. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the D6 Generation. Born to gain. Hey, and now it's time to talk about Battle Phone. Oh, yes, it is. You know, um, we love, we are so excited and thrilled and flattered to have such fantastic sponsors on this show. And Battle Foam is bar none. Um, one of our, of, the c- Cadillac of a Cadillac sponsor for a Cadillac product. I mean, there is no, literally, I can say this with the utmost confidence without any exaggeration. There is no better way to transport safely your models than a Battle Foam bag, period. And they have so many different options now. You're talking about the uh, the magna rack so you can magnetize your models and put them on there yeah talking about of course black label which you could shoot if you really you want can run it. over the truck but here's the thing craig you know if you're like me and you're buying a t-shirt right and you're like why are gamer t-shirts always black 
You know, I, I, I like a little fashion. And then you go to get your bag, and it's like, why are gamer bags always black or military green? What is that about? And, and of course, they all blend in with each right, other. Right, and you take it, and you put it on the table, and yours looks the same as your friends, and you're trying to identify yours. Now, Battlefilm has come to the rescue again. They've got different colored, whether it's the 720, that I was looking at, at Gen Con, the new War Machine bags are all colored now. You get bright red, uh, bright blue, black. Um, right. They look fantastic. A great way to just kick it up a notch and say, yes, I own this bag of awesome, and it is indeed colorful and awesome. And don't forget, coming in September 27th through mm-hmm. the 29th, in Phoenix, Arizona, Dual Con 2. The con with the coolest logo ever, it featuring awesome. half a Space Marine and half a uh, Warjack, because Dual means two different game systems, 440,000 and, excuse me, War Machine. All kinds of stuff. It's also going to be the unveiling of uh, Wild West Exodus. And someone you know and are listening to right now may well be there. Yeah, so I'll be there. And uh, no, I will not be there. It'll be the other one. But you know what's exciting is uh, also is they're going to have to change the name now, Craig, to Tricon. That's true. Well, if they're going to have Wild West Exodus there. They, sp- they spell it dual D-U-E-L. So see. Oh, very clever, Romeo. Very clever. I like it. So anyway, head on over to Battlefoam.com. Check out all the great stuff there. Protect your army. Make sure it gets to where you're going. So when you're traveling, you don't have to worry about your miniatures being in the cargo hold of the plane. They're going to get there, no problem. <laughs> and now, what's in the news? With the shout out. Check out the Adventure Creator and Solo GM Guide on Kickstarter, a book for GMs who write their own adventures and solo role players everywhere. Hmm, that sounds cool. Check that out. And now, well, the news. Up first, of course, Gen Con weekend just passed us by a little over a week ago. Uh, fantastic time was had by I know by the D6G crew. It was great to meet all those listeners out there, uh, as well as have the great attendance at the Play by Mob. Look for that in the next episode. All that great hotness will be in there. Uh, but we should report on the attendance numbers are out for Gen Con, and it was a record-breaking year. Over 159,000 turnstiles, many people walking through another door, but there were over 49,000 unique attendees. That's 20% over 2012's previous record of 41,000. So great year for Gen Con. Happy to see that. Also at Gen Con, a new Guinness Book of World Records a record was set. Uh, the world's largest game of Catan was played with over with 922 players. <laughs> Just kind of fun. Let's see. Also, big news from Gen Con. Let's see. Uh, Gale Force 9 released the Firefly board game, which sold out in about the first day. Uh, it was very, very hot. Uh, also, uh, from Gale Force 9, as part of their, the Firefly game inside their Gale Force 9, you, know, you might remember they uh, sort of surprised the gaming industry last Gen Con by releasing Spartacus, the, the, uh, the licensed game that actually was quite, quite good. This year was Firefly, and uh, most people played it and really, really enjoyed it. Great invitation, great pickup and deliver game with great theme, of course. And Gale Force 9 has announced also that they will be doing Sons of Anarchy next year uh, based on the TV show about motorcycle folk. So that should, looks interesting as well. Let's see what else came from Gen Con. Let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, well, this was interesting. Uh, not Gen Con. Well, it came out the week of Gen Con. Privateer Press released their digital app for iOS and Android. Now, they've already got War Room, the app that lets you build army lists as well as play games and track damage and all that fun stuff. Now they've got the digital app, which basically lets you track and buy all their digital material. Uh, what does that mean? Well, basically all their, their book material now digital form. So, for example, you can buy No Quarters, their magazine, all the way back to issue number one. And they range from $5 for the newest issues back to about 3 bucks for middle issues and then all the way back to only a dollar for the older issues. Uh, also, you can buy all the faction books. Uh, they're usually about... Uh, let's see, the faction both Force books are $25 digitally. They're normally $30, so a little bit of savings there. The rule books are a, a better se- savings. Prime and Primal Mark II rule books are $21 digitally, and normally those are around $30 as well, so you get like nine bucks off a book there. Uh, and then also you're getting the Iron Kingdoms RPG books there as well. That's about $40, which is much cheaper, $42 as opposed to the $60. Uh, so some great deals there. I'd expect to see eventually all the Privateer Press books on there as well. Uh, Wakeland played with it a little bit. What would you think, Wakeland? Oh, it was pretty fun. So Wakeland liked it. He reported that uh, it's faster than most PDF readers on the iPad. It's got great uh, tech, full text search on all the documents. Also got a nice table of contents. Uh, so he seemed to enjoy it. Let's see what else is going on here. Oh, also news from Gen Con. Let's see. Uh, Fantasy Flight Games announced the new Star Wars capital ships for X-Wing. So this is a Corellian blockade runner. 
uh, as well as another ship there, and they are pretty large. They're going to range about uh, was sixty to seventy, eighty dollars. Uh, they are big though, uh, and they look nice thanks to the scale of the X wings and Tie fighters and other ships. Also, Fantasy Flight announced a new version of Battle Lore right the week of Gen Con, and they were demoing Battle Lore version two at the convention. Uh, the, the rules look interesting. Um, and what's interesting about it, too, is the miniatures are completely redone. They're on a larger scale. The big thing about them is that the monsters and fantasy creatures feature much more prominently. So the original Battle Lore was very historical-based with just a smattering of monsters thrown in and then some magic system, which was interesting. But the new Battle Lore is much more fantasy-focused. Uh, so that should be interesting as well. Command system is still in there. The color system has changed, though. So now in this one, you're, you're doing more control of your units. Each unit has a card and is more, more flexible than simply a colored flag. So it should be interesting in there. See what happens to that. Keep an eye on that. It's not out yet, but it's coming soon. But it was neat to see the demos. Also announced at Gen Con at the um, Wizards of the Coast uh, press, an- press announcement, they announced the Lords of Waterdeep will be coming to the iPad uh, this fall, which is very exciting. Uh, Playdex doing it. Same guys that do Summoner Awards and a lot of other great board game conversions. So if you like, if you're Lords of Waterdeep fan, that's pretty exciting. Also, let's see, D and D Arena of War has been announced. The uh, the digital online game way to, way to battle things. And speaking of digital news, also this past week, Disney Infinity came out. This is the uh, Disney's answer to Skylanders. It's kind of a cross between Skylanders and Minecraft. You can build things as well as buy plastic characters, Disney characters, and inject them into your games. The Wakefield family seems to be enjoying it. So we'll see what happens with that as well. And that's What's in the News. And now bear with me for a moment as we wax eloquent about Conquistador. That's right. Our friends at CQ Games always doing great stuff uh, for the gaming industry, whether it's their great podcast, whether it's their great games. Um, but now they got something new going on right now, Craig, right? They do. They have this awesome uh, Kickstarter called The Best Damn Metal Gaming Coins Ever. Oh, yes. They look awesome. Looking at some amazing looking coins. Roman coins, mm-hmm. uh, sci-fi coins. They're talking about all kinds of stretch goals, medieval coins, mm-hmm. uh, campaign stuff. Yeah. Uh, you're just looking at all kinds of coins, and they just look up. Oh, look, there's like a theater coin. Yeah. One that's got fish on it. And uh, they're, they they look beautiful. They're heavy. And, of course, nothing blings your game out better than actual metal coins. Mm-hmm. And the Kickstarter's going great. They've already blown through their stretch goal. They've got uh, over $23,000 for a $5,000 stretch goal. The, 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 it's climbing like crazy. You know it's going to deliver. they got a lot of great stuff coming in here. Plus, 17 days left. So you're, if you've been thinking, I need to bling my game out, and Craig has already done a great job with his games with the metal coins, it definitely kicks it up a notch. I'm always excited to sit down with one of Craig's copies because I know it's going to have really cool extra little bits. And the yeah, coins just make it that much more fun. Look at the Roman, man. The, the I know. Accent, the V and the I. Yeah, right. And they look like they stack nicely for those games that, like, like that, all kinds of great stuff. Um, just check them out. So head on over to cqgames.com or just go to Kickstarter and search for best damn metal gaming coins ever. Best damn best bestest damn metal clearly in coins ever. Ever. You're listening to the D6 generation. Born to game. Hi, welcome back, and we are very excited now to welcome to the show Scott and Julie from Evergreen uh, Studios, and of course, welcoming David Weber back to the show. Hey guys, welcome. Hi. Howdy. We're doing a really cool Hollywood conference call right now. I know, now, I, feel so very, I feel very Hollywood right I, now. I feel like I'm in an episode of uh, Episodes. Right. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, some very exciting news happening uh, in Evergreen and the Honorverse. And uh, we uh, would really love it if you guys would. Why don't you guys tell us a little bit about what's going on and then we'll delve a little deeper. Well, um, what's going on is that we are looking at the Honorverse movie um, and quite a few other things uh, attached there unto. And um, I've been out here since uh, Sunday evening uh, doing conferences and generally uh, making trouble for Evergreen. And uh, <laughs> I think I think that um, I'm very, very, very uh, impressed uh, about where we've gotten already on this. And uh, I know you're supposed to say when they're going to turn one of your books into a movie, oh, I'm so excited! Well, you know, I really am. Um, <laughs> these guys are, 
They are, as nearly as I can tell, uh, deeply, deeply committed uh, to maintaining the integrity um, of, of the universe, of the characters, um, and of the storyline um, in the existing books. Well, that's fantastic. Now, how did, how did Evergreen and, and you, David, get together? I mean, uh, who approached who, and how did that whole ball get rolling? Well, Mike Devlin, who is the founder of Evergreen, was a longtime Honor Harrington fan. And when he came up with the idea of the company, which is focused on doing multi-platform storytelling, including films, games, graphic novels, webisodes, television, he thought that the Honor Harrington world was kind of a perfect fit for that just because it's so fully imagined, it has so many facets, it has action, it has politics, it has history, it has science, it has tech, all the things that are really fun to dig into and really great to use all different platforms to kind of tell that story. So we approached David uh, and uh, he was gracious enough to listen to our plan, which is not your typical Hollywood, let's make a movie plan. And we've been out, he's been out here talking about not only the movie and the artwork that we've been doing for the movie, but about the graphic novel and about the gaming and that we're going to be doing even before the movie comes out. So it's, uh, it's been fun. One of the, um, the wonderful things for me as the author of the Honorverse novels uh, has been the intense loyalty of the fan base and the degree to which they know what's going on in the books to the point at which I've had heated online debates with people about <laughs> how my universe works on <laughs> right, occasion. Right. <laughs> um, what, what Evergreen is looking at here is in many ways, how do you move beyond that long-term, deeply loyal, deeply focused fan base to take the same story and the same characters to a bigger audience, which may not have the time to invest in learning all the ins and outs of the honorverse the way that the followers of the novels have done. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking at the ways in which that accessibility quotient can be can be increased in a way that will not step on any of the elements of the story that long-term fans are invested in. Right. Um, right. Obviously, we're not going to be doing the, the technical explanations and so forth that I stick into the books, but the way in which the ships and the weapons function right. will not step on any of the explanation in the books. That's what high-budget CGI is for, right? Beg your pardon? That's what high-budget CGI is for, right? That's, well, <laughs> that's one way to look We're, at it. Yeah, we, we want, we want uh, a visual to be able to express right. the ideas that David and, and all the fans have come to understand are kind of the real reality base of the Honorverse, which is really... And ultimately, from what I'm hearing right now and what we've been talking about, there's actually going to be sort of what you might think of as a layered accessibility. If a new fan meets the, the series and wants to dig deeper, Evergreen is going to have uh, um, hyperlinks and stuff in place to help them move to that greater background knowledge of like, okay, that was really cool the way they fired the missiles in the movie. How did the physics behind that work? Oh, wow. So nice. if you want to delve into that kind of information, you'll be able to get it. So this but, is, and, but you'll... Sorry, sorry go ahead. Oh, no, well, I, it sounds like this is going to be some a multimedia effort then involving not just a movie, but also... Uh, web content, and then also these games you guys mentioned. And the graphic novel that was announced at uh, Comic-Con as well. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The idea is that we use each platform for a different thing. One of the things that we're looking at is when we were thinking of what the basis for the first movie, obviously you think of on Basilic Station, we looked at that and we love that, but 
We also really liked Honor of the Queen that had just a little bit more action and had a little bit more of kind of uh, the battle feel as opposed to being a bit of a mystery, which Basilic Station is. Mm -hmm. But we got to hit both things, we think. Honor of the Queen, um, the plot encapsulates better than Basilisk Station. And there is more adversarial action from the very beginning, if you will, in Honor of the Queen. A clear-cut adversarial action, if you will. Um, You can start with Honor of the Queen, and it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, By doing the graphic novel, by doing some of the other stuff we're doing, the entire storyline will be accessible to the viewer. And if there are critical components that need to come out of things that are talked about in Basilisk Station, then obviously in the movie you'll have to find ways to to provide the viewer with that information. Right. Sure. But it, it, it's, to my mind, what is more critical in a successful movie adaptation of a book than to get every single detail of the book, get all the characters of the book into the movie. The movie adaptation has to be true to the spirit and the story of the book. Um, What was the Clint Eastwood movie? Uh, Was it Absolute Power? Mm -hmm. Where he plays the part of the art thief. They combined several roles in that movie, and they made a movie that was significantly different from the book, Mm -hmm. and yet it was completely true to the book. Right. Okay, what we're talking about here, as I am understanding it now, is something that would be truer to the novel of Honor of the Queen. But you're obviously not going to be able to include all of the characters, sure. all of the subplots, all of the exposition, and so forth. So I think that what we're looking at will be a, a faithful screen adaptation of the book understanding that with 90 minutes of screen time, you cannot include every detail of a 100,000-word book. Sure. Now, David, I'm, I'm really curious, uh, how, what is, I mean, obviously Evergreen's uh, doing, you've, you've met with him for a while now. When did you guys start meeting? How long have you been in, in discussions around this, pro- this project? Oh, gosh, two years? A couple, couple of years. years. A couple yeah. years. Wow. wow, so you've really gotten to know each other, you're working close together. What's given you a lot of confidence in the way they're approaching this project, and, and what's giving you confidence in the idea that they're going to obviously have to change the story a bit to fit it in this format, but you're going to be comfortable that both you and the fans and everybody's going to be excited about it. Yesterday we spent 90 minutes talking about tree cats, and we still have a lot. <laughs> okay. When they are willing to engage with the author in that degree of discussion right. about how is this supposed to look, how is this supposed to move, how do we demonstrate the depth of the relationship between honor and Nimitz so that the reader, so that the viewer will understand it uh, as, as we go along. How do we communicate that? Um, when they're talking about which are the, the, the critical characters and how do we maintain the relationships between them? And when they're saying to me, okay, the political subtext of this universe is critical and we want to make sure that it's there, okay? Mm-hmm. They're not going to hit you over the head with it. They're not going to make the political subtext more important than the characters or more important than the action. But the fact that they're talking about keeping it in there and maintaining it and using it right. is one of the things that gives me uh, a high degree of faith um, at this point. I know that you know at this stage in the in the in the project every author is supposed to be blowing his confidence in the project out his ears and, you know, breezing through and so forth. Um, and I will say that going in, I have a, I'm, I'm operating on what I hope is a realistic assumption, which is that perfection is unattainable. Right. Okay. Um, but I've said, I've said many, many times, I have made the point that nobody has ever read a single book I've written. Okay, what they've done is they've read the book from their viewpoint, their history, their background, and that affects their understanding of the characters, which therefore is going to be subtly different from mine, no matter how well I did my job. Okay, this is in some ways more of the same. Okay, it is a collaborative project working in a medium which is not mine. And therefore, I have to have faith 
in the fact that the guys that I'm talking to uh, who, who are undertaking the project are first masters of their craft, which I believe I can safely say that they are. Secondly, that they really understand and are trying to make certain that they understand uh, the heart and soul of the honorverse. Right. At third, that they're going to do uh, the they are going to do the job in their medium that I would want to do in mine to tell the story the best way they can to present the characters as fully rounded and developed individuals and to make it a story in which the viewer will become as invested as the readers have become invested in the books. That's, that's, that's great. That's great. And, and Scott, are you guys taking any action to kind of interact with the fan base and try to, try to get their feelings on what this would be like or what, what, what they're looking for? We are. We've done a, some basic exploration into the fan base and just listening to what people have to say online. We've actually done, you know, a real thorough investigation of that and realize what are the key things. And what's really exciting about the fan base for the Honorverse is that they are so excited about the Honorverse, they really want to get it out there to a broader audience. Um, and they are aware that, you know, the books are, you know, intellectually really sharp and challenging. And there's, to some degree, to get it out more broadly, you want to make it accessible, but... At the same time, you really don't want to dumb it down because that's the heart and soul is right. that it feels just a little bit more real and a little bit smarter than some other stuff. Not that the other stuff isn't great fun or whatever, but that's a bit of our challenge because it, it presents this really grounded universe of like this really would be what the colonization yeah. of space would be like. Well, one thing that I see happening here. Um, and this is not just something that I'm saying I would like to see happen. It's something that I feel coming from the other side of the, of the, of the development project. This is probably going to wind up as one of those situations where you have a fully nuanced movie that somebody who has never been to the universe at all can enjoy. Mm -hmm. You have one where the people who have been come in and are new to the Honorverse, will see a little more depth in it. And there will be some things in there that people who are not fully versed in the Honorverse won't even know they're seeing. Right. Yeah. That people who are versed in the Honorverse will say, well, I know who that character is, or I know what that additional relationship behind it is. And the trick is to make sure that if that additional information isn't fully ex ex explicated, yes, for... Uh, <laughs> That's my big word for the day. <laughs> the no, the author, lot, everyone. So the author. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but if, if it's not fully painted, okay, that it doesn't contradict what the folks who know the truth behind that relationship right. know to be true. Sure. Okay? That, that sounds fantastic. That's exactly the way I think fans enjoy, because you can't capture an entire novel in a, in a movie, as everybody knows, but the best way I've always seen or always felt to go about it would be exactly as you're describing, don't contradict and allow for oh. just some subtle things for the, for the fans to hear. Now, I wanted to go back a little bit, um, Scott, and um, something David had said about, about hyperlinks and things like that. Are you guys, it sounds to me like you're going to be putting the entire Honorverse out there in a, in, on multiple platforms in multiple formats. Is there going to be things like uh, like wikis or like research things where people will be able to there click on There are indeed. Link? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there was already a, a wiki that is really good for fans of the Honorverse because it's very kind of inside baseball. If you've read all of the books, you can go and kind of cross-check against the source. Yeah, there are a couple of points on that wiki that we've tried to fix two or three times uh -oh. and the fans keep correcting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gave up. but, but our, our job, we look at our job as it's a little bit different, is that it's, it, what we're making is something that is inviting for the uninitiated. Right. Um, not the people who have already, you know, 
gone through the honor verse and then they're reading, you know, the Saginami Island mm-hmm. series and right. or the young adults are going through the uh, anthologies. We're really trying to make it accessible to people who go, wow, this is, sounds like really interesting. Gee, I saw that graphic novel that was announced at Comic-Con. I think I'll check that out. Um, you know, we got Matt Hawkins from Top Cow. Matt's writing it. He's pretty great. Mm. And he is so excited. And, you know, the thing, the way we hooked him, because they don't really do licensed properties usually, mm. is we said, well, we know that, Matt. But just read a book. Go ahead. Right. Just right. read it. And then, like, a day later, okay, should <laughs> what should I read next? Nice. And nice. he just kind of got into it. And it really is a little bit of, and this is what we found out from our fan study, is that there's no kind of organized way to get new people in. But people, once they jump into the world, they get really hooked on her story. And they, get ho- they can find a detail of it whether it's the science or the tech or the way the politics are played that just really gets them going. And our goal is to be able to let them explore that, but in a really kind of much more casual than committing to, you know, when you commit to the honor series, it's 14, 14, 13 books now, and it could be more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Never you never know. But but we need to kind of help guide them through and get them to the parts of the honor verse that that suit them and interest them more. So so when, basically, uh, you're 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 endangering national pro- office productivity, is what you're saying. That's the plan. That yeah, would yeah. be the ideal. The yeah. plan <laughs> would be to find things where you can you can either dip in for. A quick 15 minutes, then you could go home and luxuriate in a steaming hot one hour. Uh, you know, the whole thing. It just, it, it, it lets you kind of gauge it. And, and the way we probably are going to go out with our Wikia is through an app so that there'll oh. be a lot of little interactive nice. elements to nice. it. I think that we're, our goal is to find a way to really engage the fandom that exists and our new fans, and then, you know, we'll listen to what they have to say. David is has a great tradition of a great relationship with his fan base, and, uh, and you know, a dialogue where they tell him how the Honorverse really works. I, <laughs> I want to be as hands-on with this project as I can be always bearing in mind that this is crossing into media that I don't usually work in. Mm-hmm. So this is not a situation where anybody needs me grabbing the steering wheel and saying, no, we got to do it that way. Okay. Um, and, and I went into this expecting that that would be the case. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, Evergreen has been very careful all the way through to, cons- to keep me in the loop uh, in terms of creative questions and saying, is this how you see it working? Is, yeah. uh, you know, or is this how you think the fans see it working? Um, the books, as written, um, I'm sure we have all heard of the infamous info dumps um, <laughs> in the books. Um, I have always operated on the theory that if I'm going to tell you the story and I'm going to show you the officers making certain decisions, you have to know what their menu of choices was for you to understand why they make the decision. And so in the books, I have no choice but to give you that information, to explain it to you. Okay, in the movie... You can see the TAC officer trying alternate solutions to his problem, and this one works and that one doesn't work. And we don't need to tell the person who is watching this movie and who doesn't really care a whole lot, perhaps, about the physics behind it, why this one works or that one doesn't work. But the guys who have read the info dumps and know the physics may know why this one works and that one doesn't work. Okay. Are you, are you guys already at the the? You just got me thinking about the visuals of how that scene would look already. And, and, and are you guys already in the storyboarding mode? Are you are you in the mode where you're actually laying we, scenes out and trying to figure that kind of stuff out? Well, we're doing a couple of things. You know, because we're developing this on multiple platforms, 
is, you know, job one, just because it is a time consuming process is let's get the screenplay going. Mm -hmm. The next job at, is we hired a, a very good production designer who is also, you know, directed a movie, Patrick Totopoulos, mm -hmm. who, you know, did Total Recall and Underworld nice. and wow. just did this new sequel to 300. And, nice. you know, yep. he's got a really great resume. He's even been on that show on Sci-Fi Channel Face Off. He was one of the judges. <laughs> so he's an awesome guy. Um, but we have to do the core assets. We have to start thinking about how does honor look? What's Nimitz going to look like? How are these ships going to look like? Mm -hmm. Just so that we have a level of consistency. And it goes to what David said about not stepping on what he's laid out is we wanted to have this overall level of consistency that even though each platform, you know, when you see a graphic novel, it'll be a 2D representation. Mm -hmm. When you play a game, the first strat the first game will probably be a uh, mobile strategy game, which oh, nice. kind of helps you get the vibe of how the ships run, the basics of some of the combat, um, and then maybe an adventure game mm -hmm. that goes in conjunction with the graphic novels so that you can actually go in and kind of explore what it would be like to be part of that story. Mm -hmm. So with each one of those things, we have to kind of set a standard of what's this going to look like. So one of the things, I mean, we've kept David pretty darn busy, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. he, he's a little exhausted, I think, because <laughs> we've been going through, and, and it's really fun, you know, a lot of writers have it all in their head, but David not only has it in his head, but he has these companion pieces that his colleagues at Bunine have done that are just like kind of art director's dream because mm -hmm. here's the science. This is how many guns. Then we get into the business of, well, we want it to look really good, but it's got to kind of make sense, too, so that when David, you know, is talking with his fans as he goes... Yeah, we kind of like held it to some standards yeah. that the the honorverse would demand um, so that when people really dig in, it's already going to be there. I right, mean, there's right. so much work. There's so much data that he's created. It's like we got to be on all these platforms to kind of give everyone a chance to dip in. Well, the, the, B9, oh. the, the B9 guys are the ones who just did the House of Steel companion to the oh, honorverse yeah. right. that covers uh, the Star Kingdom and Grayson. There will be two more oh, books nice. in, wow. in that series. Well, uh, the next one will be about Haven and um, uh, the Andermani and maybe Silesia. And then we'll do one which will be like the Solarian League and whatever we decide to actually tell people about the Mason alignment before the cutoff point. Um, but they have pulled together huge amounts of information. Um, I am to the point now where I am uh, sending combat scenes to Tom Pope at BU9 and saying, okay, do these work? Because you guys have are now the keepers of the... Of the and Tom, actually, we're doing um, a, a series in the Honorverse uh, set about the time of the discovery of the Manticore and Wormhole mm -hmm. Junction which is actually being written by, by Tim Zahn in oh, collaboration wow. with me and Tom. Uh, the first book is, um, is almost finished, and I am really, 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 really pleased with it. Uh, but that's how intimately Tom and Bu9 are involved uh, in what we're doing, and they are making themselves available uh, to Evergreen along with everything that they've pulled together on it. Which is great because... You know, I've done a few movies, and usually you have to go out and get guys who really know science and really know military procedure. Right. And to have that already there and guys who've really thought about it, it just means that we can spend our time being creative, yeah. uh, working with the information instead of having to dig up the information. Right. 
translate it to creative types, which sometimes can be a little a time consuming <laughs> sure. process. Yep. Now, are, you guys, be, be, are you guys no. already at the stage where you're looking at? I mean, do you actually have CGI mock ups of some of the ships and things? Are you at that level yet? Or are we still still early days? Well, I think we're still earlier than that. Yeah, we're ba- basically in 2D. I mean, we did do uh, a CGI mock-up of the bridge. The bridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because we have one of the things at Evergreen is we're, in addition to our creative side, we have a really strong technology side mm-hmm. um, because our founder came from, you know, as a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. So one of the things that we've been developing to use for the Oniverse and for other projects that we do is this prototyper, which basically allows us to develop storyboards that are using a game engine wow. so that we can oh, wow. in real time block light and photograph and turn that material over to editorial and cut scenes together wow. so we can figure it out. It, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, like I say, this isn't my medium, but they were showing it to us the other day. And when they're done running something through the prototyper, they've got all the lighting values, all the angles, all the cameras, which camera's going to do wow. this, which actor's going to follow that. I mean, it's just, it's it's really, really impressive. That's awesome. And, and what, it, what it lets you do is it lets you develop for the movie. Mm-hmm. We can also do game development, you know, concept development for games. And, and you know... The, all of that, and we can probably, depending on where we go with webisodes, we probably can do either all the previs for it, or in some cases, we might even be able to do some kind of production, depending on how we want it to look and what the format that we go yeah, for uh, is. They're talking They're talking uh, live action for this movie, mm-hmm. although obviously some members of the cast, like Nimitz, that will be a little more difficult for. <laughs> um, we are but, looking throughout the galaxy, though, for a tree cat who right. we think can play Nimitz. Uh, <laughs> we, we, think, we think it will probably be a little easier to find him than a six-foot, two-inch Eurasian female martial artist well, to play Right. Honor. That's what I was going to uh, ask you guys next. I mean, you know, the question of Muppet versus CGI aside for the tree cat... Uh, what what I, how are what are you guys looking at for casting right now for someone like Honor? That's got to be quite the challenge. How, how, are you, how are you approaching that? Well, let me just say as a starting point, and I think this actually represents uh, uh, a consensus of of my fans. Okay, from my having talked to them, we are more concerned with an actress who is comfortable with the physicality of the role and can. Pr- project honor properly than we are with having someone who is six feet, two inches tall. Right. Okay? Absolutely. We, what, what we want is someone who can, who can convincingly portray a seasoned naval officer in her forties while hopefully looking substantially younger than that. Right. Um, right. And who is going to be more Delin than Ivanova. When you're on the bridge with the, and I love both characters. I'm just saying that Honor is more Delin than Ivanova. Nice B five uh, reference there. The, <laughs> uh, and and who can carry the role? Right. That makes sense. Um, and it's obviously way too early days. When are you guys looking at releasing the film? Have you guys got even a broad sort of release time? Our, our plan, our target is summer of 2016. Oh wow! Okay. With uh, you know. But going into production sometime next year, oh, wow. um, you know, obviously it's a pretty su- significant uh, visual effects challenge to kind of do all the things we have to do. So it's a shoot and then a substantial post. Plus, we intend to do our engagement with the audience in terms of gaming and in terms of social and possibly webisodes, we hope, it. you know, we start with the comic book, which is coming out next January, uh, yep. and the game is, when is it, Julie? February. February. Oh, wow. So um, close, close. That's, that's the that's beginning. Cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, yeah, so you mentioned video games, you mentioned comics, and the movie's in uh, 2016. So so what are we looking at between now and then? You got the, you got the comic and the game. It sounds like uh, Q1. A couple of different games. 
where you'd have, as I said, the first one is kind of a strategy yep. and kind of orienting you to the universe and having fun running your own starship and then possibly mm. having Honor Harrington evaluate your performance. <laughs> That's awesome. if, they're um, like, if they're operating against pirates in Silesia, it could very easily fit into that two-year window between Basilisk Station and Honor the Queen when Honor was a senior captain. Yep. Um, and she could be sending you out and then coming back and looking at your battle report and say, this officer performed superbly or this guy should be dismissed <laughs> right. from the service right. or whatever. Yeah, and as we know, Honor is a great teacher, so hopefully you're <laughs> able to move through the ranks with some uh, speed. And then the other, the next gaming ideas are to do adventure games, kind of in the mold of um, the Walking Dead mobile mm -hmm. game, that it, where you get to interact with the story that is laid out in the graphic novels and explore that world and actually explore it from in a gaming sense by playing through as a character and, you know, having being part of that story, which we think is really a cool idea. And then once we get closer to the movie, we would go to direct apps that would be designed to be part of, you know, getting you oriented and getting you ready, but they would be fun in their own rights. And then we would see about going to a console game as we ramp up to the release of the oh, movie. Wow. One of the things that we feel pretty strongly, and this just comes from my own background, is in terms of a console game, we probably wouldn't be doing a play the movie game. It would be much more, you would be playing another part that kind of ties right into Honor of the Queen, but is not Honor of the Queen. Nice. Yep. Because I think it's just more fun to do that, and it kind of gets you into the right headspace for the movie right. instead of kind of repeating actions and things like that. You know, that's to us the great thing about the Honorverse is there's so much material that we can go and find kind of fun and entertaining ways to engage with it without having to kind of just right. we're going to make the movie and then we're going to play a video game where you get to pretend you're Honor Harrington. Um, There's also, especially for Basilisk, Honor of the Queen, and the Short Victorious War, there are interludes between the books mm -hmm. that can be explored for what's going on in this universe outside Honor's own life and experience. Exactly. That can be approached through games, through through fiction, which is written specifically for for distribution through the Evergreen um, uh, web web yes, yeah. uh, that kind of thing to help for the existing fan base to fill in some holes. Mm -hmm. For the new fan base to give them something to look at that will set the context for Honor's personal contribution to to the history that she's made. Yeah, I had a great experience. I did uh, produce Chronicles of Riddick, and oh, nice. one of the real lucky things for us is that Vinyl is such a gamer mm -hmm. and so deeply into it. And he was really insistent when he went to do the movie that he wanted to really guide that game and make sure that game was covering a little real estate that led into Chronicles of Riddick. And it resulted in a totally fun game. And frankly, while we were making the movie, there were things in the game that inspired us nice. to do things in the movie, cool. which is really kind of what you dream about. Right. Um, so that's that's kind of the way we see this, too. The books have always been internally synergistic for me mm. yeah. in that by solving problems and integrating things, I see other opportunities, other options that were outside my original storyline concept. I could readily see that happening here. Um, and... There is no, in my mind, detriment except amount of screen time available to adding additional storylines and elements to the existing books in movie form. Again, as long as you don't step on the existing books. Right. So if there's a character or a situation or a, a plot strand that develops in, in the gaming 
co- community universe, if you will, between Honor the Queen and Short Victorious War, it could very easily wind up adding extra depth and texture to a second movie. Well, one of the things that's really fun, I think this is one of the things that actually distinguishes David's work, is that the bad guys, the Havenites, are really complicated. There are some of them who are real bad and like the villain that you like to hate. But there are a bunch of them that are really kind of honorable people stuck in a kind of nightmarish situation. And the ability to kind of delve into that, it's just not that ordinary. It's usually there's the good guy, there's the bad guy. And we like those shades of gray. There's there's (laughs) bad guys inside Manticore. Right. Inside Grayson. One of the things that I think make the villains work in the Honorverse, by and large, is that very few of them are villains just because the author said you have to be a bad guy. Um, They have reasons for what they're doing that may not be your reasons, but they're internally consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's kind of like for those uh, who have already met the Mason alignment in the later Honorverse books. It's kind of like uh, Albert Detweiler, who is a a good family man, and he loves his wife, and he loves his sons, and by the way, he's planning on killing a few trillion human beings (laughs) in order to impose his view of genetic perfection upon the human race. Right. He's a terrible person, okay? But he is also a real person, and you understand why he's doing what he's doing. I think um, one of the main things, actually, that sets aside a great villain is that no great villain is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a villain in his own story, and I think you really capture that very, very well. And especially if you look at, I think one of the many reasons that Honor of the Queen is a great choice is that you've got great quote unquote bad guys that are not bad guys in that storyline that 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 becomes so important later on in the in the Honorverse. Um, well, yeah, well, as, as a matter of fact, one of the problems we have with adopting honor, adapting Honor of the Queen to a movie is we don't have enough bad guys. Right, yep. Uh, so we're going to have, to have to work on that, and I think we've come up with some ideas about how to do that, which will not hurt the integrity of the storyline yeah, right. at all. They're, yep. th- they're totally consistent with the novel, but that will give us a clearer delineation of Haven is the bad guys, even though Alfredo Yu and Thomas Theismann are really decent human beings right. who are serving Haven because they don't have a lot of choice. Right. Right. Um, I, one th- quick thing I wanted to touch back on, actually, that's completely out of order now. But when you were talking about the um, about the Honorverse Companion, which mm-hmm. I loved, I absolutely loved. One of the very cool things about that book is the visuals that are included that bring all of those ships to life. And I was just wondering if, if those visuals are going to be informing the, uh, the graphics and the visuals from the movie, or are we going to start from scratch with, with the ships, considering how important and iconic uh, starships are to a franchise like this? You know, we just spent... <laughs> Two hours talking about the following, which is all of that science is the basic science of how everything works. Right. Now our job is to take that basic science and make those starships really iconic looking, but make every one of them so that if you point to some, you know, thing on it, you go, what is that? We'll go, well, that's the gravitic array. Right, right. <laughs> that's the point defense. One, one thing that I think Honor Harrington purists are going to have to, to accept is that because this is such a, an overwhelmingly visual medium, the need to be able to tag a ship as... That's Manticorin, that's Havenite, that's Solarian, whatever, is a huge factor in 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 deciding graphics, deciding visuals. And so I think that the underlying design constraints that inform the ships in the companion, okay, are going to be accounted for 
but that no one should expect or anticipate that the ships that finally appear in the movie are going to be identical to, um, and in fact may be quite divergent from, the ships that they're seeing in the Companion right now. Right. The sure. ships that you're seeing in the Companion right now represent largely my visualization of how those ships have to conform to the physics that I set up in the Honorverse. Right. And the Bu-9 guys who include uh, nuclear engineering officers from the U.S. Navy, uh, master's degrees in spacecraft design, members of the faculty of the War College, you know, the whole nine yards. They took my visualization and refined it into what you're seeing in the companion when you look at it. Right. Uh, what Scott and his crew have to do now is come up with something that on the on the screen in a theater is going to be for want of a better term, branded for the viewer so that they can tell who's who and what's what. And so it's going to be a lot more of a collaborative approach than the ships in the Companion are. The ships in the Companion are me with assistance. Okay, This is going to have to be a a group effort between me and Evergreen and, and everybody else. And to some extent, and anybody who is going to have his works adopted, adapted as a movie needs to realize that this is going to happen. To some extent, the requirements of the movie are going to trump the, the, the elements, some elements of the book. Right. Especially visual elements. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you Storyline, background, history... Those can be preserved with a certain amount of rigor, but visually the movie has to not simply entertain, it has to not simply reflect the physics, it has to be sufficiently individual yep. that yep. the movie yep. has an identity distinct from other movies. Right. Sure. Okay? Sure. So I am I I was we spent this whole two hours of me saying, Well, I'm not sure that's just right, I'm not sure this is just right. <laughs> I am. Uh, but the Ultimately, ultimately, the product that you're going to see on the screen has to serve its function in a movie as opposed to a book. Right. And that means that there are going to be some significant differences. The, 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 the trick is to make the significant differences cool. Right. Yep. And do, it in, do it in a way that does no violence to the underlying constraints of why the ships are designed the way they're designed. Does right. no violence. No, because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that, that is really cool and I think a, a totally unusual element is that David has created this very interesting way of battling that has echoes of 19th century naval battling, has echoes of submarine battling and feels like, you know, we have to, when we look at making it as a movie, we have to find, you know, it's not all about like having the super cool two right. shot where right. the ships are so close and they're blasting each other. And I anyone... have a range of 500 million right. kilometers, but we're closing to 20, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, no, I'm closing. Whoa, we almost scraped the ship. Yeah. Um, It's our challenge to make that really exciting. And we know it can be done, Mm. but it's, it is going to be, it'll be a little different looking and you'll experience it a little different. You know, I mean, these are ships that are taking a massive amount of fire, you know, so we're kind of not going to be able to just cut to the shot of, fire going down the corridor and yeah. wiping out. Right. There's, you know... When, there's, it, when one of these ships takes a hit, there are going to be splinters flying everywhere externally. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. it's, it's going to be huge. But one of the things that I know you're not going to see is all of a sudden on impeller wedge ships, you're not going to see massive photon engines accelerating them into battle. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a... Um, As Peter Pan said when Captain Hook threatened to kill him, okay, it will be a great adventure. Right. All right. Right. Um, and and um, I am 
I am confident that I am not yet able to visualize the final product. Yep. But I'm also confident that wherever the final product comes out, it's going to have the honor versus DNA in it, and they're going to at least have discussed it thoroughly with me before they do something that is going that that might strike somebody from the honorverse fan base as whoa why'd they do that right okay yeah well, I um, and i'm i yeah i don't see yeah basically if the honor if what i want and what i think is probably going to happen here is if the fan base says whoa why did they do that but i really like it yep yeah right okay that's what i want to happen where it diverges from what the fan base expects i want it to add to to them um, and I know absolutely that there are going to be some of the Honorverse fans who are going to be disappointed Always. in yeah. some or all of this movie. But I think about Peter Jackson having the nerve to take on the Lord of the Rings. Right. right. And I personally have my half dozen things about the movie that's like, ah, how could he have done that? <laughs> but my overall reaction to the movie is, my God, how could he have gotten so much of it right? Right. Right. Okay. Right. And I think that that is really and truly, when you're talking about movie adaptation of a long-running literary universe, yeah. okay, that has to happen. Sure. There have to be points where fans say, but I thought Faramir was such a wuss in the movie. <laughs> okay, <laughs> There may actually be someone who missed Tom Bombadil in the movie. Right. Yeah, that yeah. one guy. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Speaking of, speaking mm-hmm. of long running universes, uh, you got uh, the Honorverse has got a big anniversary coming up, right? Yeah, this is our 20th anniversary, and as a matter of fact, there's going to be uh, HonorCon in my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina, in yeah. November. That's fantastic. Is, uh, is Evergreen going to be there? You guys going to be there in force? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We're going to be there in full <coughs> force. Yeah. Nice. We've been given the coveted Friday night slot. <laughs> um, and we're bringing, not only are we going to tell people, but we're bringing quite a few little goodies with us nice. Oh, nice. to let the Honorverse fans uh, be the first, you know, they're, they're our beta testers, nice. and you know. One thing that, Honor, one thing that, um, that uh, Evergreen has been talking to me about all along, and Honorverse, uh, HonorCon will be an important step in this, uh, they want the existing fan base to contribute to Evergreen's understanding of the Honorverse. Mm-hmm. They want input. They want feedback from the early stages. If we do the graphic novel and it mostly works, but there's some place that it's a little off, we want to hear about it. Um, if there is something that, that uh, fandom really thinks needs to be punched up, we they want to hear about it. Yeah. If there's a character that they would say, no, you cannot f- cut this character from the movie or fuse him into someone else. You know, it may be that they'll be wrong, <laughs> but we still need to hear about. But it. there also may be the thing where, oh, we didn't realize how incredibly cool Scotty Tremaine was and how his right. relationship right. with Horace Harkness is just like because those are the things that, you know it's. A lot of in a in a running series like this, you get to develop things over a lot of time. So we have to look at some of the things where we get to the essence of them a little quicker. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. For, when I did the books originally, I intentionally did not tell you everything that I already knew about Honor in the first two books, or the first three books, or even the first four books. Uh, I was kind of unpacking the character, peeling the onion a little bit, because I wanted you to be developing, discovering new things about the character before the events in the books started the character evolving and growing within the context of the books. And one of the things that I deliberately did there is that it is not really until the dinner party scene in Honor of the Queen that you truly begin to realize just what the relationship between Nimitz and Honor is, that you begin to see them as as partners mm-hmm. rather than human and cute, smarter than an orangutan pet. Right. Okay. 
Um, and one of the things that Evergreen has said, and I think they're correct about, is that we need to establish some of the depth of that relationship in the movie before the dinner party scene. So that we see her and Nimitz interacting, and it's clear to the viewer that Nimitz actually understands English, that he actually is a sapient being who is responding with yes, no answers to questions right. that Honor may ask him to elicit information. Mm -hmm. That we see him as uh, not an appendage of Honor, any or perhaps as an appendage of Honor, but only in the same sense that Honor is an appendage of him. Mm -hmm. If you see what I'm saying. So this is going to be some of the elements of the later relationship between Honor and Nimitz that's going to have to be pulled forward a little bit for the movie audience and which probably will not upset the fan base who knows that he's going to be like right. this right. later on anyway. Sure. He's a badass. <laughs> yeah, that was, part, that was part of the discussion. And there, one of the things we were discussing is, okay, how do we make Nimitz into a sufficiently badass, cute, fl fluffy, adorable critter? <laughs> right. right. Um, if, and we Conversation made, ensued. It's <laughs> easier to do in a book, let me tell you that. I don't, yeah, yeah, they you did know. it with yeah, Yoda. Tony. <laughs> yes, take my word for it. He's cute and fluffy, and don't piss him off. Okay? Right, right. Um, I want to back up to, to HonorCon for a second, because I think a lot of our listeners are going to be like, whoa, 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 they're doing a movie now? I want to see what, where they are with this thing. Uh, when is HonorCon? Where is it? And what kind of teasers can you give us? What's going to be there? HonorCon is in November. November 1st. November 1st. Yeah. Okay. There you go. See? Yeah. There you go. see? Uh, First, second, and third. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Greenville, uh, South Carolina. In Greenville, South Carolina. The, 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 the heart of the upstate of South Carolina. <laughs> nice. Um, we would we would love to see um, as many people as as want to come. Um, I am not actually personally on the con committee. Uh, Bu Nine is the con committee for this, and they are putting it on. And I am not sure. The last time that I talked to them, I think they said that they had uh, 300, 300 plus memberships already signed up for. Oh, great! Cool. And they were ta they were targeting five to six, I think. So they're still. There's still room. Um, I do not know how, for sure how much or for how long it will be there. Um, but um, you can find them on the, on the web um, under HonorCon. Yeah. Um, yeah, Bu, Bu 9 and I have been doing HonorCon for ourselves about twice a year mm -hmm. for about four years now. And they just come, either they come down and they sit around my kitchen table and <laughs> talk about stuff, or I go to Norfolk and we, we hire a, a, a conference room in a hotel or whatever. The, the novella in the front of House of Steel, yep. I Will Build My House of Steel, that entire novel novella was conceived in about 20 minutes talking around my table, and I wrote the letter and the final scene in it um, that same afternoon before the session broke up so that they could all agree whether or not this is what we wanted to do. <laughs> nice. That's, that's the kind of relationship that I have with them. And so I'm perfectly comfortable with them running the, running the con. That's and meanwhile, they tell me, go sit in your room, write, don't worry about the details. <laughs> sort of like Sharon's been doing with me for a long time. <laughs> that's, that sounds awesome. And an, an awesome opportunity for the fan base to get a chance to to interact not only with you but the folks from Evergreen and um, Scott and Julie I was wondering if you guys could tell us a little more about uh, Scott you mentioned the goodies that you were bringing what what kind of goodies can uh, can fans that are going to show up in Greensboro uh, expect Greenville. Greenville Greenville sorry Greenville Greensboro yeah. is in North well, Carolina yeah. you're there, you'll miss it all my experience <laughs> with the Carolinas is in the north I uh, I apologize boo <laughs> Well, we'll definitely have some advances on the comic. Yeah. Um, and we'll also have some games uh, that you, certainly the first game. The strategy game. To, and, and maybe a few apps that, that we uh, come up with. We're fooling around with that right now. Um, and then we, uh, we're, bringing, uh, we're bringing some folks from uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. We're going to preview some of the art, the sets, whatever we think we're, you know, just to give them a flavor of what it may look like, just so they can kind of get in their mind the tone. Great. That sounds awesome. And 
And uh, and as David said, you're going to actually be soliciting uh, some feedback from the fans. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. We're doing That's a presentation, sounds- and then we're doing panels. And yeah. I've been told uh, that the Honor fans are a, a very vocal and huh. passionate yeah. group. <laughs> so yeah. we're looking forward to yeah. that. Yeah. And we're going to launch some social media and, you know, the wiki and maybe some Facebook pages in the next month. So by the time we get to HonorCon, they're already going to be aware of the film. And that's another way that we can just get in front of them. But they'll start hearing about it in the next month. That, that's fan- sounds, that sounds fantastic. That's fantastic. Now, um, I know we got a wrap soon here. And we want to thank you guys so much for spending so much time with us today. Um, if someone's excited and they want to be able to follow this, and I know you've got the, the social media coming online soon, is there a web page they can start hitting now and kind of watch for that stuff being launched or anything? Not, not, <laughs> not specifically. One of the things that's going to be happening is like when I get back from get back to Greenville, <laughs> South Carolina, ouch, uh, ouch. from 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 uh, California, yeah. um, I am probably going to spend some time sort of writing up what I guess you would call a blog entry uh, about what we did while we were out here and, and how I'm how I'm looking at it, how I'm feeling okay. about it, and that will go up on davidweber.net. Okay. And eventually, obviously, when they have something for me to link it to, davidweber.net will be linked to, to them. And I'm sure that the Bain website will be as well. Nice. Um, so <clears throat> there's going to be what I think of a sort of a growing network of ways that you can initially get into um, what, what, what they're setting up. And it will probably flow both ways. I am sort of anticipating that once they are uh, up and running, there may be some original Honor Harrington fiction by me oh, nice. that will be appearing that fans can come to the Evergreen site mm-hmm. to get that will not be going up, for example, on my own website right. or the established, but which will be linked to from my my website. Great. Um, so I... They want, Evergreen very much wants me um, involved in this. And I very much want to be involved in it because I think that is going to be the way to best harmonize the elements that have to go into the, into the uh, movie, and into the entire across platform package mm-hmm. that they're right. talking yeah. about. And I also think that an author who is embarking on something like this has a responsibility to his existing fan base to make accessible to them the reasons that he thinks this is a good idea (laughs) other than they agreed to pay me a bunch of money. (laughs) Okay. Um, And... And I have a lot of reasons right now why I think it's a good idea besides they agreed to pay me a bunch of money. <laughs> um, and I expect to have more of them as we go along. So I want to have that hands-on. And I, I want, to, in, to some extent, if possible, to help serve as one of those um, access portals that they're talking about for the existing fandom. Okay, for them to know how I feel about what's going on, mm-hmm. and 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 where Evergreen is, um, and by the way, here's a neat uh, uh, five thousand word short story from the Honor verse mm-hmm. that's set when Honor was in Silesia between uh, Basilisk and Honor of the Queen uh, that you didn't know about, or or something, things of that nature. That will fill out and and help to make it as complete an experience as possible. Mm-hmm. Great for the existing fans. Well, that's fantastic. And, and uh, as, as longtime listeners of our show know, that Craig and I are both huge honor fans as well. So I'm sure we'll be frantically retweeting and facebooking uh, when this stuff launches and as anything well. Anything we find, <laughs> exactly. Oh my god, the movie's up! Oh my god. <laughs> Exactly, that'll be happening for sure. And uh, before we go, guys, is there anything uh, that we missed or anything that you'd like to throw out there before uh, before we say goodbye? Julie, Julie is yes. she's ready to go. Put her hand up. Interestingly enough, I've been quiet, but I thought this be appropriate time for me to bring this up. Obviously, one of the reasons we were so attracted to the books was what we talked about before, all the different robust characters, but. We didn't talk about her gender. Oh, that's and true. We oh, yeah. have 
talked internally that right now there are very few female um, commanding military officers, obviously, but there's not a lot of female action stars. I mean, we talked about Angelina Jolie and Salt and some others, Helen but there's Mirren. a lot of different... Mm -hmm. Sorry? Helen Mirren and Red. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Although she's an assassin. Yeah. And Red yeah. too. Women yeah. who are just now starting in the last three, right. four years to kind of get these roles when historically it's been a very a male dominated kind of role. And, and Scott even said to us last week, you know, when he used to be in these development meetings, they'd say, Great character, now just make him a male. You know, that's just <laughs> the way it happened. And right. I mean, that way, that is really the old Hollywood thinking. And I think. Oh, yeah. Let's let's see him try that with honor. No, right. yeah. I mean, listen. You know, Hunger Games uh, got a real threw a log on the fire. Yep. Um, but I think that that also the whole idea of women in command, because it's not like we have any doubt or anyone in the world has any doubt that we're going to have a female president, yep. and we already have female admirals yep. and officers. But their stories have yet to be told. Well, Hollywood doesn't have a good template for female senior officers. Right. We have all kinds of male templates that we can pick up. But we, the, the, the U.S., the Western world in general, does not have a store of historical great female commanders in history or in fiction. Right. Okay. And so historically, if you'll pardon my saying so in Hollywood, when you had a female <laughs> military commander, she had to out testosterone the guys. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was not conceivable to the writers that you could have a a female character who had a command style that worked for her, despite the fact that every successful male commander has his own command style. Right. And so one of the things that I see here happening with Honor and Mike Hinky and, and the other female command figures from the Honorverse is that there may be an opportunity to help build some of that template. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a few successful uh, female commanders that have come out of Hollywood. They have, I think, been the exception, not the rule. Exactly. Um, yeah. So and, now, and we're we're psyched, you know. Yeah. Joan of Arc has to move aside for Honor Herring. Yeah. There you go. Ooh, <laughs> there's your poster right there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. That that was all I wanted to bring up, just because you know our research that we kind of uh, examine. You know, they really are clamoring for this kind of role model and hero because in today's generation, you know, they've grown up with no one telling them no. They just accept that our Secretary of State is a woman. They didn't think about pushback. They didn't think about you know. The women's movement, it just it is what it is and they accept it. So, you know, they, they want it they want Hollywood to now start mirroring society. Right. And obviously David has been very ahead of the curve on this because, you know, Manticore is men and women an equal balance. And kind of one of the great things of honor of the Queen, to be honest, mm -hmm. is that you have this ability to kind of shine a light on that issue because yeah. the Grayson people have such a different attitude right. towards right. women. And one of the important things about the, the Graysons having that attitude is there is a historical reason for them to have that attitude. Right. And that means that once their historical situation is upset by the inclusion of the war between Manticore and Haven, the inrush of new technology, honors impact on them and whatnot, you get to see their response to it. Mm -hmm. Right and how how they yeah. how they attempt to adjust to it. Um, one of the things that uh, within Manticore, there is nobody who questions whether or not Honor Harrington is a woman should be a military commander. Right. So right. in a sense, we get to do both. Damn. We get right. to have we get to have her dealing with gender discrimination on Grayson. And one of the reasons it's so hard for her to deal with is because it is so utterly alien to what she's experienced for right. her entire life up to that point. And I think that that actually, the fact that within her society there is no gender discrimination to me is the strongest way to state that gender discrimination is doomed in our own time. Right.
Right. You see what I'm saying? 50, last time I looked, at least 50% of the human race was female. Okay? <laughs> and if somebody... If it's kind somebody, of been hovering at that number if, for a while, if right? Some <laughs> other, if, some other, if some other society or culture wants to deprive itself of 50% of its human potential and 50% of its human talent, that's fine, but my great-grandchildren won't be competing with them. Right. Yeah. Right. That's the way I see it. Yeah, that's cool. great. Well, well, thanks again so much for yeah, taking fun. the time out of your very busy schedule to join us here on our little show. We really appreciate it. Thank it you. Was fun. Thank you, you guys. And, uh, Talk to you again sometime. We will Absolutely. very soon, hopefully, Dave. Yeah, very hopeful. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye, bye, guys. Catch you later. Bye, bye. bye. Worlds to conquer, foes to vanquish, violence to sow, and medieval crops to reap. The whole world of gaming at your fingertips. The D6 generation. Born to game. You know, let's say it's time to talk about, I don't know, Craig Magazines. And you know, our favorite magazine, our personal favorite, is War Games Soldiers and Strategy Magazine. Because it is the magazine for miniature gamers, by miniature gamers, for miniature gamers. I mean, these guys paint the miniatures themselves. You know, we've had um, folks in the magazine before talking about, you know, we've got a big spread to do on the latest issue, and it's a big theme. We've got to paint a bajillion guys for it. Yeah. Uh, having a great time with it. Um, and the thing, the spreads look great. It looks like scenes from movies, but it's miniatures. Every page. See, it's crazy. And they do it right. They do it. The, they've got professionals writing. They've got these big names in the industry writing articles for them. They've got missions. They've got historical documents. They've got mm-hmm. background on the different units. And every issue follows a theme where not the entire issue will be about one thing, but the majority of each issue is going to be about something special. Look at issue 68, the latest issue that's out right now in your favorite uh, store that sells magazines pretty much anywhere in the world. They've got um, on the cover f- featuring Napoleon's last hurrah in Germany. And here you see some uh, Na- Na- Napoleon's troops there in their, in their funky Napoleon hats sneaking oh. along a, a, a damaged wall in a war zone area. Um, the technical term for those. Yeah, what is the technical term for those? Napoleon hats. Napo- it is. It's uh, fancy Napoleon hats. Um, but then, you know, there's, and, and there's a whole great theme on Napoleonics in there, which is fantastic. But let's say you're like, I don't know. No problem. Check out the other topics like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. I think that's about a World War II tank. I think it is. And Secrets of Beautiful Basing. We often talk about the best way to base your miniatures. Look at the dioramas in here. You're going to know these guys know what they're talking about. Just a great issue. Great. It doesn't matter what kind of miniature gamer you are. There's going to be great tips in here. You're going to look at the dioramas and be like, I want to use that that technique on my models. Whether you play sci-fi, fantasy, historicals, doesn't matter. There's great stuff in here. Check out War Games, Soldiers, and Strategy Magazine, WSSMagazine.com, and make sure you Tell them the D6G sent them. Use our code D6G and save on everything you buy there. That's right. This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days. Total Fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first. Starbuck is a guy. And Lestat now there's a vampire. Hey everyone, this is Nicole, your Total Fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakeland and check out my blog, TotalFangirl.com. This week's shout out is from Munji Studios. They want to thank everyone who backed Alchemist Academy on Kickstarter and remind you guys that you have until September 20th to decide to back it yourself. So check out Alchemist Academy on Kickstarter. I'm in the car right now, driving back from Gen Con. Woo! The best four days in gaming. Indeed. And I've been told I have to get a segment in now. Yes. By this guy who runs the show. I don't run, I'm just co-host. Co-host. The co-host who is in charge of getting the segments and putting them together. Right. So I said, well, if you're telling me now on the way back from Indy that I have to have a segment, you know, by the time I get home, that means you're going to be the segment. Okay, fair enough. So I decided I would have to figure out what we would talk about. And it had to be something from Gen Con. So I thought I'd make Russ talk about something that is near and dear to his gamer's heart. That oh, Firefly. No. Uh, that he was really excited about oh, wait, checking out. I command. No. No. It's much more magical. Oh, oh, magical. Uh, oh, we got the new Mage Wars buttons. No, no. not Mage Wars. No. Uh, Sparkly, cupcake uh, filled. 
Wait. happy and joyful. Wait a minute. Prancing. No. What would it be, Russ? All right, it's probably the new My Little Pony game coming out in November. The My Little Pony car game. Now, I got to tell you, this real hardcore gamer that you guys all think he is, what did we actually sit down and play a demo no, of? I was doing research for our daughters. So he says. Yes. So we sat down and we played the My Little Pony collectible card game. We did. And, Russ, what did you think of the My Little Pony collectible card <laughs> it's, game? It's not a bad little game. The theme is that um, you're, you're not fighting anything because... Well, we do fight some things, but you're not fighting each other. So it's two players, and basically the po ponies are cooperating with each other. So you're solving problems. So there's different problems that you'll recognize from the show if you ever watch My Little Pony. Wait, wait. Do, do you recognize those from the show? No. No, I don't. But other people were explaining them to me that way. You didn't know any of the things that you were no, correcting I me on? Actually, I, I was... I was saying the other day, I don't really know all the nuances to My Little Pony. So um, I'm learning them, though, for my girls and trying to figure out what uh, what this thing's all about. I feel like sort of a non-geek who's got a kid who's a geek. Uh, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. My kids, my daughters really like My Little Pony, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to become acquainted with My Little Pony. He's totally lying because I know he knows the characters know, better. Really oh, you do too. So what, no. we flipped over Rainbow Dash, you're like, oh. Well, I know Rainbow Dash because it's, it's uh, one of my daughter's favorites. Kids' uh -huh. favorite, yes. And then we flipped another card that was one of the other girls' favorites. But it was Rainbow Dash, and you knew the other one. Like, oh, that's her And I do know Applejack. Yeah, I do. Yeah, see? Totally lying. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't a bad game, actually. It's some really good interaction. Um, I like the mechanics. Now, it's going to be cool. Were they innovative? Uh, pretty innovative because what's neat about it is so you're working the, so there's basically two exposed problems. So there's a there's really three decks. There's each player has their own deck of ponies, so you're going to build your own deck like any other collectible card game. And then there's a, another deck that's the problems to solve. And two of these problems are going to be up. Now, either player, each problem is sort of primarily assigned to one player to deal with, but either player can start working the problem. So what's kind of interesting about it is as you're working the problem, you can play troublemakers onto the problem to sort of block out your opponent and stall them while they try to fix it. But the thing is, if you, if you get the troublemaker and you take care of it and solve that troublemaker's problem, you'll get victory points as well. So you kind of want to fix those. And then you can sort of steal the problems and, and solve them faster than your opponent can to get more victory points as well. Right, but it is true. You never actually fight each other. You're just kind yeah. of battling the problem. There are things like wolves and stuff that show up as part of the troublemakers, but both of you work together to solve those things. So when it comes out, are you going to be playing... My Little Pony, the collectible card game with your girls? With my daughters, yes. Yes, I will. Will I be playing My Little Pony collectible card game with you and the girls? Uh, probably, yes. The girls will probably ask you to play lots of My Little Pony. Both our, I, So I sent pictures of the My Little Pony uh, cards to both our girls while we were texting them to them, and they were both just freaking out and wanted us to bring it home. Of course, it's not available yet. In fact, it's so demo that the... Um, the backs of the cards themselves actually say demo on them. Yeah, it actually was really cute. It had a little pony, and it's like, oh, this is just a demo, right? And it was like she was peeking out from the top of the card to remind you that everything was in demo mode. That They had rules printed out, like, on just 8.5 by 11 paper. They're like, these aren't final. These will change as you go. So it was very much a work in progress, but I thought it worked pretty cute. Yeah, it was, it was really, actually, I was surprised at how, how good it was. It's by Upper Deck, so they've got a lot of experience with, with cards, card games, CCG, so I think you're going to find that actually it's got a pretty good rules mechanics. What I was most surprised about, and this is the biggest surprise I've had with My Little Pony, is how many adults are really, really passionate about the My Little Pony universe, uh, and it was interesting because seeing all the demos going on, it was one of the big hotness is at Gen Con and going in and watching the demos they had a tournament as well um, even though the game's not even out yet you go you can learn the game then you go play in a tournament there was a good number of people there all adults uh, a few teenagers but most very few little kids fill up playing with it was mostly 20 up 20 up even 30 up people checking out this game so there's definitely a very passionate following for it yeah, I would say it's on the level of something like Transformers and stuff but it's just you know, it's just my little pony. Well, and you know, it's funny too. I was taking pictures of the cards uh, as we were playing and putting them out there on Twitter, and it was it got such a response with people. How do you play it? What's this? What's that? Is that character? I'm thinking. So my Twitter feed blows up. The big news out of Gen Con on my Twitter feed was My Little Pony, which was somewhat unexpected. It was. I'm so I'm really surprised by people like it, but it's. And I, I think I mentioned this on the show before, but when I went to get um, some of the comic books, there's a new comic series that just came out this year for My Little Pony. I think they're on issue eight now. Um, or, yeah, I think it's about eight. I think and, it's eight, yeah. And, and uh, when I went to buy it uh, at the comic store for my daughter for her birthday, they said that it is the second most popular selling comic after Walking Dead. 
So there really is a very passionate following for My Little Pony. So from zombies right to happy little ponies. Yes, yes. So that is the total fangirl segment for this week. As we cruise through, where are we? We're still in Indiana, right? There's lots of corn. Yeah, we're almost at the Columbus line here. I mean, Ohio line. Col- yeah, Columbus is not a state, well, sweetheart. It's the edge of the state. Getting close. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, everyone. Thanks for listening, and I uh, hope you uh, will enjoy all the coverage the guys are going to give you about Gen Con. And if we saw you there, by the by, thank you for coming and saying hello. It was fun. We enjoyed meeting everybody that was there, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. You know, and, and Craig, we're always excited to talk about our new sponsors. And again, we're so proud to have such great sponsors on the show and another great sponsor to join the D6G sponsor family, miniaturemarket.com. You, and the what? thing the thing to remember with Miniature Market is their name says Miniature Market, and they do have tons of miniatures. But I'm looking right here. High Command, bam. Um, Sales of Glory, bam. Uh, yeah. You know, for pre-order right now. They've got a fantastic cro- uh, Crossmasters Arena. Bam! They've got a great selection of both miniature games and board games uh, and role-playing games. Pretty much, you name it, they've got it. And uh, great prices, too, right, Craig? You absolutely. And if considering we're talking sci-fi here lately, Mm -hmm. you can go through and they have pages of sci-fi board games. Oh, yeah. Literally, literally, uh, you're talking over 250 sci-fi board Mm -hmm. games at the best prices on the Internet. And, you know, also, they have the newest uh, miniature sci-fi stuff, too. Like, for example, uh, Attack Wing, Star Trek, already oh, on their go. website. Bam, you want to order that at a good price? Nailed it. Uh, miniature Market has everything. Very easy to navigate. How about Hero Clicks, X-Men, Wolverine? Now available at Miniature Market. Bam, it doesn't matter. Ooh, wow. So, exactly right. So, head on over to MiniatureMarket.com. Get what you need. Fill your stuff up. Um, I, I, I kickstarted Crossmaster. I can't. Very, very good game. Can't recommend it highly enough. They were selling that, those things like crazy at Gen Con. If you've got kids or you're just an anime fan, check out Crossmaster right now. You will not be sorry. Anyway, check it all out at miniaturemarket.com. Great hotness. And head over to their uh, Facebook page and check out the D6G deal, and you'll get a little little something, a little something special. Pop <laughs> I am Rafe Hollywood Granger. And this is the Hollywood Minute. Welcome to another edition of the Hollywood Minute. This is for episode 131. So as I record this, the gang's winging its way back from Gen Con. I can't wait to get together with the gaming crew at this night's tabletop gaming at Myriad Games and hear about how what their travels were like, what the things they saw were like, hear the stories, hoping to soak it all in. I'm actually looking forward to just hearing the stories more than playing any of the new hotness. I am excited. Uh, Wakelin picked up. He was very kind to stand in the privateer press line, and he picked up for me the boxed set of The Butcher. I can't wait to get my hands on it. I want it for the diorama purposes. You know, I'm not a big Butcher player. I hear he's sick with the 2R guy. Um, I play Circle, too, so it's just... Man, I'm just psyched. I can't wait to just see the box and see everything and... uh, and then paint it up and have it have it sitting in my um, office. You know what I'm thinking about is I'm like I'm wondering this is how crazy we miniature gamers are, huh? I'm thinking about getting two of them um, so that I can have one to play with and one to keep as a true diorama. But I'm not lying when I say this. Uh, they're limited qualities quantities, so I, I don't want a hog too. I mean that's preventing someone else f- from getting one. So. I don't know. I doubt that I'm going to remember to bring my pieces home from work. I want to have a nice display case at my, at my office. So I don't know. Uh, to play or not to play, that'll be the question. Speaking about miniature gaming, so um, slight show of hands. If you could just, I don't know, send me an email or send me a tweet. Um, the Like I said, I, I get sometimes I get ruminations about doing the documentary again. So this time, what I'm thinking about doing is the I have the opportunity to do a Kickstarter, raise a small amount of money, use my local film crow here in Portsmouth that I've gotten to know. Um, it's funny, I'm a lawyer for two films now. One of them's called Real Life Heroes. 
and um, that's done by the Double Midnight guys, um, Brett and Chris. Stay tuned for my Twitter feed to that. They have a really exciting idea. They're getting some known talent. Um, I'm not sure I'm able to disclose that yet, but I sit on that board. And the um, the other film I can't discuss because I'm the council. It's considered um, uh, confidential. Actually, it's not a film. It's a pilot. I was shooting a pilot, but there's some... Um, pretty big names uh slated to be in the film i don't think it's locked down yet um, but that'll be pretty exciting to work on that the, again the pilot the tv show not the film but anywho through those connections um i'm planning a whiteboarding session i want to do a tv show similar to man versus food similar to american pickers um similar to you know pawn stars minus the pawning start basically just uh get out on the road and meet gamers see their gaming lairs show the camaraderie among fellow gamers and try to put that in an episodic format this time what i'm going to do is i want to raise just a little bit last time i raised about 5600 bucks kickstarter that'd be plenty of money to take a film crew go to a certain destination, film it, film some gamers, put it up on the web, and see if I can't fill uh, 20 minutes of uh, TV airtime. Um, it's a lot harder than it looks, and I'm looking forward to the challenge. I'm looking forward to getting my secret gang in place to do some whiteboarding. So what I'd like to see, hear from you guys, just a slight show of hands of all you DCG listeners, is that something you'd like to see? Are there any particulars that you'd like to see similar to those formats? Um, this is your chance to kind of write in and um, have a say in some creative development of, of where I want to go. I'm not 100% sure if I want this to be a character-driven show or a theme-driven show. Um, I'm thinking a mixture of both, and um, I've got a connection with a Hollywood screenwriter that is willing to look at my raw material, see if it's good, see if it stinks, give pointers, stuff like that. So... Um, show of hands if you think that's interesting. Um, on the other news, um, I'm missing my MMO time, man. There's just not much going on in Latro. I think you've heard me say that. Um, we did get a new kin house. I went ahead and, and sold my Hobbit home that I had in Latro for about five years. I decided change is good. I bought a house on one Chestnut Ave in behind where our new kin house is and this time it's a home from brie so instead of a hobbit hole it's just a simple little stone house and i'm kind of psyched uh, i got some new decorations you can check my twitter feed i'll have um i'll put up a picture of stony in his new home in the brie lands and that's that also got a post from noah i finally put that up about eve online and uh, i kind of want to try eve again I, I i i just got stomped but I want to try it again. I think I've got to somehow join Eve University. Noah, help me out with that. Is that something I join as a guild? Um, I mean, a corp? Is it something I take online classes for? And, of course, I'm a little bit holding Eve online because I've heard it you know, can be like a job, um, especially if I take this uh, TV show, if it goes to the next level. I'm not sure how much time I'm going to have for fooling around with MMOs other than bacon pies and lacho. But I am upset with myself that I didn't renew my my subscription, and I'm kind of upset because I wanted to see it further than I did. Um, what else? Missing Gen Con. You know, you know, sometimes when you miss something, and then you realize that you didn't really miss it in your life anyway. Like I don't know, you've always gone to this certain gym, and you can never think about leaving it, and then you leave it, and you're like, oh god, I, I like this. It's free. I don't have to deal with this anymore. Well, that's not how I feel about Gen Con. If anything, it's synced into my mind that this is one of the cons that I really love attending. And it wasn't even so... I thought I would miss the camaraderie, which I do. It wasn't that. I missed all the sites. I wanted to see... I, it's funny. I thought I would miss the friendship part, too. That part just whipped by. Um, I am jealous of Dave and those guys that did a road trip. Um, that sounds fun to have all those adventures in the road. But, you know... That's okay. Uh, it was more like, ah, oh, what was going on? What was D and D next like? And what was it like? Would have been fun to you know buy the butcher and wait in line and and do all that. And there's a new um, there's a new RPG made by Luke Crane called um, Torchbearer, I believe. And I think that revealed the Gen Con. I'm not sure. It was a Kickstarter, and it's basically D and D using the Mouse Guard rules. Uh, or Mars Guard similar rules. I love the Mouse Guard rule set. And Doc and I had been thinking about converting Mouse Guard using D&D &D anyway, because some people don't get behind being a mouse, even though 
Um, David Peterson's drawings are awesome, and if anybody reads Mouse Guard will not have any problems getting behind a mouse. But anywho, I wanted to see Torchbearer, and so I realized that I really uh, missed the the uh, reveals at Gen Con. Um, didn't get to hang out with Matt Wilson. I uh, missed that. He's got a lot going on with War Machine Tactics. If you haven't checked that out, man, it looks really cool. Check out War Machine Tactics. I did, however, finish my Conquest. I had so much fun painting that thing and doing the base. It was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, don't worry if you guys have one. I was very intimidated by all that large space, but, man, it came together in a snap. And also the red was not a pain. Spray painting it red first, then base coating it was the way to go. I didn't have to do all the rivets. For some reason, the shading worked out well with the ink washes, so... Man, it just, I'm so psyched. Speaking of that, finally placed my battle foam um, order to carry both my battle engine and my conquest because I've been carrying those puppies by hand and I've just been having a heart attack that they're not protected in my good old Romeo battle foamo. So looking forward to getting those two pieces. Speaking of battle foam, my um, Vietnam forces should be coming back from painted figs any time now. And I'll be needing to contact uh, Romeo to get a case. Uh, I already have a War Machine case, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. If I'm going to get a whole other case or just the foam. Anybody have any two cents on that? Is it where you got the foam and you told yourself you would just switch it out within the case and you later regretted it and wished you just would have got a, um, a simple case? Um, I'd love to know your two cents on that. And um, that's it. Um, hope you guys had a... Had a great couple of weeks and can't wait to hear, like you, all the downloads that Russ and Craig have from Gen Con. Until next time. All right, Craig, time to talk about our friends at Cool Mini or Not. You know, whenever we talk about Cool Mini or Not, they are what they're most known for lately. I mean, they've been around for a long time, have a great website about voting for cool miniatures. they got great sculptures. they got great painters. they got great everything that makes miniatures great. But what they've really become known for in this age of Kickstarter is cranking out some of the most awesome, fantastically highest funding Kickstarters. And the reason they fund so high is because they have fantastic boatloads of miniatures at a great, great price. Yeah. And they just started a brand new one, Craig, Wrath of Kings. Now, what's the background on Wrath of Kings? Well, let's look at this and take a deeper look. Okay. A continent divided, a throne in contention, and a quickly unraveling truce all set the stage for Wrath of Kings, a fully scalable skirmish miniature war game using a number of unique mechanics such as a one-roll resolution system and combined activations that allow for on-the-fly offensive and defensive formations Wrath of Kings is a fast, fresh, and brutal new entry into the miniature wargaming genre. Check out gameplay, demos, trailers, mechanics, walkthroughs, and more on the Wrath of Kings Kickstarter page. Yeah, and it looks awesome. They've already uh, blasted through their stretch goal. They're already over two hundred. They'll be at a quarter of a million dollars by the time you, by the time you oh, hear this. Oh, two hundred thirty-eight thousand with twenty-one days to go. I know, right? But here's what makes this game cool. I mean. As, as all miniature gamers out there know, the rules sound cool, the fluff sounds fun, but it's all about the miniatures, baby. And these guys do not disappoint. Imagine a look that is like Asian, Japanese style, and then throw in just a little bit of steampunk. That's what you're looking at with some of these guys. They look fantastic. This dual sworded samurai here, Craig, or whatever he looks in the middle. Oh, uh, that looks pretty darn looks cool. Looks so bad arse. Uh, God, it looks like some kind of like fish dude here with like a trident thing. He looks awesome. Um, just some great looking stuff. A lot of over the top poses, as always, from these guys. Great looking models, great looking stuff. Does indeed look like like Japanese steampunk, which is a really interesting direction. Never seen that before. Um, so cool. check uh, check it out. Get over, check out Rathra the Kings. Check this crazy thing out. Don't be the guy that's like, oh, I should have backed that. There was so much plastic in that Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> don't be that guy, Greg. Don't is, be him. Is there any plastic in this Kickstarter? Uh, is it all metal? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think there's lots of plastic. In it. Is it plastic or metal? I don't know. Miniatures. I'll just say rephrase it to miniatures. Don't be the guy that missed all the miniatures in that case. Don't forget. Don't don't be the guy left out when all these miniatures come landing home. Right. This is the Dice Tower Network at dicetowernetwork.com. Hey, uh, we apologize. This has taken us far too long. It's really inexcusable. 
It really is it inexcusable. Is. But you know what? All we can offer is our apologies and request for excuse. Right, so, exactly. Anyway, but here we go. It is time for us to revisit the contest entries for the Core Worlds Crude Contest. Indeed. Uh, now, to refresh your memories, what we asked for was a pithy, amusing... I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to... Um, Speak in double speak now. I'm right. going to tell you actually what we were ex- ex- expecting. A, we were expecting a nice, funny, pithy description of artwork you could have conceivably made pretend that mm-hmm. would tie in both crude oil and core worlds. The games. Humorous ways. The games in some humorous way. Which coincidentally are also prizes provided to us by Stronghold Games. Indeed. Thank you. Stephen, the dirty trader Bonacore, for donating those prizes. Well, let's let's not forget that he is a dirty trader. Indeed. And uh, oh, in, in a game of diplomacy. Yes. In real, life. In real yes. life, he's great. He's a nice guy, but he's a dirty trader in diplomacy. Just saying. Right. Well, somebody's bitter. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to listen. Now, unfortunately, um, a bunch of the entries did get cut off by Skype somehow. I don't know what happened there. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we can so do. So if your entry, future. yeah. So so I recommend in future, uh, Skype worked for some people. I don't know if other people just hung up in the middle or what. Um, we did get, though, uh, quite a few good entries also uh, via email to contest the D6Generation.com. That seems to be the most reliable way to submit in the future. Those, sending, sending us those audio files yes. over the email. Is and, and we got, I don't know about, uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12. I think. Um, but, but a couple of them are actually not contest entries. They're just sort of like voicemails. <laughs> Oh, so okay. I, I just threw them in because, you know, one of the goals for this whole thing this year, remember, was increased listener feedback and participation. That's right. There you go. So uh, that's all in here, and we'll, we'll see what we get. As right. long as I'm not getting dry gulched, I don't care what they have to say. I'd love to hear it. Right, right. So here we go. Ready? Here we go. Uh, here's our very first call-in, which may or may not be no. a contest entry. It's a game in a game. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. My contribution to the Core World's Crude Contest is a one-to-one uh. paper mache scale full-scale model of the entire Core Worlds universe made into a mobile to hang above a baby's bed. (laughs) This gigantic mobile for wiring has crude oil derricks. (laughs) Every 20 minutes after the hour, the entire cosmos swirls and spins until the lights of the stars align, showing Russ Wakelin riding an elephant dressed as a howdah, (laughs) wielding an oil derrick in his hand as he leads an army of of warjacks. 40 minutes after the hour, it spins and the lights show Craig Gallant standing on a pile of comics and books bearing his name. In each hand, he holds his two novels for Wild West Exodus. Behind him, the suns of the core worlds blaze, illuminating him. Nah. At the hour, on the hour, the lights align, the stars come together, and the shining face of Stephen Bonacore looks down, <laughs> smiling with the words, core worlds above him and crude below him. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Now, first of all, it's very impressive, uh-huh. and this is Mark. Uh, Mark, very impressive to build a one-to-one scale model of the entire oh, Coral universe. universe, and then yeah. still get it above your uh, child's bed. Yes, yes, that is most incredible, sir. Um, and then having, I mean, clearly there is one accomplishment right above all others, and that is creating a Russ Wakelin head big enough to. <laughs> the rest of the universe. Right, right. Actually, very, actually that's not that difficult, no. You know, and, 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 and uh, getting Bonacore in there, very creative. I really like that one. So Mark's one-to-one paper mache model, which we are, without a doubt, completely certain you have actually built. Absolutely. Uh, there's no question about that in our mind at all. So, so that's great, and you are now our first entry yes. in the contest. And now comes the second entry, which, again, may or may not actually be an entry in the contest, or could just be random voicemails. Here we'll we go. We'll find out together. Here we go, right. Medium, fan of the show. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, uh, well, I'm on my way home from a show, and I wanted to say uh, thank you guys for uh, having such a great show. <clears throat> I spend uh, a lot of time on the road sometimes, so listening mm. to you guys is, is amazing, and it help, helps you feel plugged in. And uh, I'm really uh, excited about the stuff that Craig's doing, so. Uh, thank you. I'm kind of a fan. So I hope all that works out. Awesome. Just wanted Thank to you, say, man. hey, I'm not trying to plug anything. Thanks. <laughs> Well, that was that was Joe the comedian. Well, thank you, Joe. Oh, Joe. Joe is awesome. Yes, he's he's he emailed before, so thank you for those kind words, Joe. And uh, 
And you know, he sent us the, his comic uh, CD. Right. We, so, sadly, was, if, if you'd also built a model while you were in the car there, we'd have accepted it as true. an entry. Yeah. Uh, but that was a good, but thank you for the call, and Joe. That was very, very kind words. Very that was nice. very nice. Thank you very, very much. Okay, let's see. Next may or may not be a contest entry. Here we go. Ooh, here we go. Most of the detail of this extremely forced perspective painting is occurring at the bottom. The foreground has a bunch of roughnecks running around. Interspersed among them are space marines with weapons pointed toward the skies. From the image beyond, you realize that they are at the base of an oil rig that is under attack. The marines are shooting the attack wing of fighter ships that is attacking the base of the rig and the cable that rises thickly from it until it's just a thin line connecting to a listing small rectangular object at the top of the painting. Some small explosions stop the length of the cable. Tiny swarms of fighters are nearby. The rectangular object at the top is not more than a few inches long. There are small explosions along its length, and it looks to be pointing one side down towards the cable. That is clear. A gigantic space freighter sits vulnerable in space as it's hooked up to the space elevator that is delivering precious crude to its hold from its core world. All right, so that, that was impressive. Now, Craig, it was at this point when I was <laughs> assembling these that I remembered at one time we may have mentioned the fact that we wanted people to keep these to 30 seconds. I think we did. I think but we, did. we were not consistent about that. No. So that's not an official rule, but I think it's bonus points if you can describe a structure so large as the one uh, Jim just described there. Yeah. Uh, and massive and epic inside 30 seconds. So, yeah. so bonus points, Jim, for that. Yeah. Um, there are some here that are not that are longer than 30 seconds. So just saying, but but Jim, that was great. Love the references to Rough Riders and Space Marines. Two of the guys that Craig and I played in 40k in the past. Nicely done. That is a long time listener right there. Uh, all right. Let's see. Um, ooh, who do you think's next, Craig? Who do I think is next? Yeah. Uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, let's find out. Hey guys. This is Chris with an entry for your listener art contest. My piece of art depicts the conquest of a once great alien civilization called the Crudos and the annexation of their homeworld, Crudos Prime, into the galactic <laughs> core worlds. The Crudos, unlike humans, subsist entirely on oil. Their planet was conquered by private armies funded by mega corporations on the <laughs> core worlds to take the oil for profit. Nice. There's only one art form that could handle a scene of this epic scope, and that's the diorama. You know those things your kids make in shoeboxes for school? Right. My diorama begins with the High Priest of Crudos. They've formed a ring around the sacred oil well from which they believe their civilization came. <laughs> the Crudos look a lot like rodents, so I used the minis from Mice and Mystics to represent them. Oh, excellent choice. Oh. Unfortunately, the priests are being slaughtered by space marines. Uh-huh. Above, in the background, there's an epic space battle. Ships from the Core Worlds, represented using the Klingon minis from Star Trek Fleet Captains, oh, nice. are blowing up the space stations of the Crudos, represented by the space docks and war suns from Twilight Imperium. Oh, nice use of bits. Anyway, it's the best diorama you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, he gets full points for actually naming the models he used. That Clearly. definitely lends credibility. It does. You know this was made. Yeah, because not, you know one was not to take anything away from the one to one paper shea one one model. Right, but if I if if I was a betting well, man, you question that one? N- no, not necessarily. Oh. I'm just saying that this Chris here could could actually name the bits in his diorama. It was quite impressive. So that's pretty impressive there. So it would have been more impressive <laughs> for Stephen if all the bits had come from uh, Stronghold Games. Oh, is that a ding? I don't know if we I don't know if we made that rule though no, in there. No ding. Yeah, no. yeah, okay, okay. I prefer these. I prefer all the. I think he yeah. is the perfect model. He's I'm in the bits box, pulling things out, making it work. Stephen, I love it. Stephen's a dirty trader and doesn't get a vote anyway. He, exactly right. That's why he's not judging this contest. To be honest with you, he was gonna sure, but then, then we oh yeah, oh yeah, oh and yeah, it was gonna know. happen. And I was like, no, no, no you're not. Just because you're giving these games away to our listeners and being a nice guy about it, we're not gonna let you. Judges contest because you're a dirty again, trader. Once again, more stuff given away. Yeah, right. But you know, it's still dirty trader. I'm, okay. I'm, not, I'm not bitter, though. I'm not bitter no, at all. No, you're not bitter at all. Right. I'll, I'll buy his games, but I won't smile doing it. I will not smile doing <laughs> it. I'll play his games and I'll have fun, but I will, right. sure my I will, face not, I will not smile while doing it. All right. No matter how much I enjoy myself. All right. So here we go. Here comes the next one here. Let's see who this is. Modern art audio tour. Item one Wakeland's Wolf Dragon. The Prodigy's early work foreshadows her tenure at Privateer. Whoa. Item 23, shenanigans. The bare metal offends and disappoints. <laughs> Item 53, crude core. A multimedia study of the tension between commercialism and exploration. Suspended from the ceiling by Jane Con lanyards, each planet sports an oil well from which, like black gold, gushes the omnipresent voice of Bonacore. Each one from a separate podcast appearance. They overwhelm all who enter their orbit. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> All right. Ouch. So, oh God, that hurts. I have to include an excerpt from uh, listener Monique, who's mentored many of our contests before, and she clearly uh, is skilled at this sort of thing. Uh, she in, in, in had a little additional information in her in her uh, thing. So this is an excerpt from a 
museum modern art tour. You know those little audio things you hold to your ear? So that's what you're yeah. hearing. You're walking about in the various exhibits. Uh-huh. I love that she referenced my daughter's wolf dragon. Yes. <laughs> which was great. And then, of course, the shenanigans comment references the fact that Craig and I have been playing with bare metal models. <laughs> the, the metal. And then, of course, the excellent description of the actual artwork that she had built that was on display at the Museum of Modern Art. The audio of Stephen Bonacore's <laughs> voice. Appearing on the podcast. Yeah. Right. And clearly, you could almost hear the dirty, rotten traitor antics <laughs> going on by Stephen. So it was fantastic. Let so uh, Let it go. And, and she stuck to 30 seconds here as well. So there's a lot going on with this one. Money, great entry. Great entry. And clearly, not only did you build this, but you also built the entire museum and the audio recording equipment. I, it's Monique. I buy it. I, I do totally do, too. Uh, I totally do. So here we go. Let's, let's see who's next. Welcome back to National Meeple's Radio. I'm Charlotte DeVoltas, and at this hour, we explore the recent debate surrounding the latest work of art by the famous gaming artist known as Spooky. <laughs> Greetings, Charlotte. Also with us is outspoken <laughs> critic Jetro Smith, spokesgamer for the organization Department of Interested Critics of Entertainment, or DICE. Good day to you, ma'am. We'll start with you, Mr. Smith. What is it that you and your organization have against this particular work? Well, for one thing, we are disgusted by the amount of money from the National Endowment for Gaming Arts that were spent on this project. <laughs> Prudes. Ahem. <laughs> We feel that mon- the money wasted here would have been better spent on more relevant projects, like providing gamers with clean black t-shirts for wearing at tournaments and conventions, or funding a new Euro game based on, I don't know, organizing and running a sewage treatment plant or something like that. <laughs> or maybe a Star Wars 28mm tabletop game whose miniatures don't suck. You know, something productive. <laughs> uh, Philistines. Instead, we get this monstrosity that is best described as... Now see, Charlotte, this is an example of the bigotry and prejudice that an artist such as myself has to overcome. You are no stranger to controversy. True. My groundbreaking work, Barbarian Woman in Chainmail Bikini with Sword, was very controversial for the time. As was your piece in which you had dice placed in a jar of... Zima, yes. I figured the shock of using the worst band of alcohol known to man would garner a reaction. Then there was your work of flowers that suspiciously resembled dice bags. Indeed. So how would you describe this piece? The piece is this multimedium sculpture I call Core World's Crude Fusion. I wanted something fantastical but grounded in hard reality, like you'd see walking down the street every day. So, of course, the base is a trio of three brontosaurus. There is no such thing as a brontosaurus. Well, of course not. They were hunted to extinction by the exploited companies that you represent in Crude, the oil game. (laughs) No, it was a fossil mismatch. It's it's got nothing to do with oil company. Go on. Well, on top of these maligned and noble animals, I have a flat platform representing the game board used in Core Worlds. But, But Core Worlds is a card game. There's no game board. If I might speak here... Huh... And on that board, representing the peaceful bordering kingdoms that live in harmony with the Empire and Core Worlds, are aliens that I have based off of Earth animals. The chimpanzee, the meerkat, the ant, the dolphin. I chose them, you know, because man is the only animal that wars with its own kind. Of course. Seriously? Have either of you ever watched Animal Planet? Those things are trying to kill each other all the time. And the barbarian kingdoms of the game are trying to destroy the Empire. In the center is a spaceship I made, using some leftover sprues and the boxes that these games came in. That spaceship is shaped like a... It's designed to be open to interpretation. <laughs> Use your imagination. <clears throat> if you have one, Mr. Smith. I, I, I was going to say oil, Derek. It, it looks like an oil, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the symbolism of that iconic image is lost on you. I borrowed this concept for the Hypercubus works of the late 1700s. You have no fracking idea what you're talking about, do you? And, of course, projected on top of all these services is a flowing melange of photos of girls in chainmail bikinis I found on the Internet. I notice you don't seem to have a problem with that, Mr. Smith. Well, well, the the nude human form is a tradition of Western art, and it's been uh, used to express ideals of male and female beauty and and other human qualities uh, dating back to Greek times. Of course. Hey, at least it gets a reaction. It's apathy I can't stand. Thank you both for coming today. Of course. It's good to speak to someone so open-minded. Yeah, whatever. Go paint a freaking mermaid on the side of a conversion van or something. <laughs> Once again, this is Charlotte Del Valtos with NMR Radio. Please join us next week as we explore the role of gaming in the medieval Appalachian art. <laughs> so another fantastic interview by Spooky. Spooky. Uh, that was amazing. Now, uh, obviously longer than 30 seconds, but clearly a lot of work there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and once again, once right, again. and and having to deal with critics is challenging. So um, the fact that he went on and debated was was pretty impressive. Yes, indeed. Right, and, and so, you could tell there was a lot of emotion there. Right, very very impressive work. So uh, great entry there too. This is getting hard, Craig. It is. Are, are you making notes here? Because um, you know, I am. Okay, good. Keep track of what you like here. But how do you spell bikini? I, I was calling that one art critic debate, but uh, oh, you know, you well, could you, you know, could also call a chainmail bikini. To each uh, his own. Rough. Clearly, we, we know where your we know where your eyes are attracted in these sort of art, art projects. Art is 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 a subjective. It is subjective, right? Yeah, so right. You so take it's, away what you know. Each of us takes away something. So anyway, not B-I- not surprised what you're focusing on. Okay, so moving on to the next entry. Here we go. You ready? Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. My masterpiece artwork is a series of eight two foot by four foot panels. Not only are they art on my walls, but they are functional as acoustic treatments. All eight panels consist of insulation bats within a wooden frame and are covered with custom printed fabric. Oh, wow. Each panel is based around a different sci-fi franchise. Oh. Since the face is on printed fabric, the number of colors had to be kept low. So I went with a somewhat minimal and subtle design for each of the panels. Moving on to describe each panel. Oh, wow. We're going to do this alphabetically by IP. (laughs) That's really the only fair way to do it. Uh Uh-oh. Wow. So first up is Battlestar Galactica. Uh, oh, the okay, wait, wait, wait. The face wait. of a Cylon. <laughs> oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. So wait, so so I, here's. I, yeah, I think what happened here <laughs> is what's his what what Brian what? Brian and okay yep. Brian actually has art that he created. Yes, which is awesome. It is amazing. Unfortunately, it's not exactly what we were looking for. No. Um, and so, and, and he went on at some length yes. describing each, each work of art and, uh, and, and what they were doing and how he went about it and what different logos, uh, we actually have pictures of all yeah, of them. Yeah, he sent along amazing, so these are actually canvas panels in his room, each one after a different sci-fi theme from Mass Effect, Battlestar Galactica, Serenity, uh, Star Trek, and they look fantastic, so we will post pictures of these. Yep. Uh, on our website to just show off his great artwork. But I think there was a misunderstanding between submitting actual artwork you've done that is geeky related or or um, other clearly actual artwork these people have built, but related to Stronghold Games, Core Worlds, and Crude. So, right. and, But Brian, thank you for sharing this. The, the pictures were was, fantastic. Was, was it Ryan or Brian? Brian, as in B. Ryan, Brian. right. That's what I thought. And then yeah. you said Brian. And Ryan, I, I apologize. Uh, clearly, what happened it was my acting. Right. The better. Of yeah, we, we, we actually make it sound too much like real art, we did. as we you did. can see. But your art is de- indeed real and looks fantastic. And if you it do prints awesome. of those, let me know if you ever do prints because I will buy them. They look awesome. They do look awesome. All right. Up next, uh, let's see who's next here. Here we go. Hi, at D6G. Adam from Massachusetts here. Oh, hi, Adam. I am so excited about this contest. It just so happens that I am a professional artist, you oh, see. Oh, okay. Cool. My strength has always been abstract paintings, and so that's what I've created for you today. Oil on canvas. Mm. It came out wonderful, and I wish you could see it. <laughs> I started with a swirled mix of soft blues, greens, and tans, mm-hmm. representing the rich beauty of the natural world and how all its separate elements blend together in a oh, soothing nice. harmony. I can imagine it. Overlaid on top of that are crisp, bold circles of both deep black and bright green. These are the oil and money which go hand in hand, both blotting out nature's harmony underneath, but also <laughs> providing the riches of contrast and interest that are Ooh. so important to our modern world. <laughs> Next are the fierce slashes of bright red and orange, representing, of course, the attacking alien armada. Of course. Jealous over both the beautiful world and its rich resources. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And finally, I'll confess I was deeply inspired by the latest Star Trek movie. And so, as a finishing touch, the entire painting is enhanced by a massive lens flare effect. <laughs> and that is why, to the untrained eye, it may look like just a blank white canvas. But a true <laughs> appreciator of art will know better. I hope you like it. Very creative, Adam. Adam, very, that was very good. Very good. That was and a, that I was buy good. it. I, I believe I somewhere do. in his house is hanging a beautiful, pristine white canvas. Right, which is an actuality. Uh, and a masterpiece. Lens flare uh, with, yes. this awesome abstract oil painting. Yeah, lens flare is brilliant, by the way. Uh, yes, very sci fi and captures the whole album. I thought he was going to say he burnt the whole thing. <laughs> right, right, right. All right so at see. the end, I exploded it. All right, let's see who's next. Here we go. Hi, Russ and Greg. The Earth is my canvas for this art piece, and my brush is a high powered orbital laser. I'm using the laser to drill into the center of the earth. <laughs> the laser will energize the molten core, causing it to geyser out of the drill hole like an oil strike. The core of our world as crude oil. 
Judging by the level of seismic activity, we should be close now. And yes, here it comes. A huge spray of molten core. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> oh, I better go. <laughs> that was an awesome entry from uh, Ray Greenlee. Now, I should mention that Ray is actually the gentleman running our diplomacy campaign game. Oh, really? Uh, so he, he is not a dirty, rotten traitor. Oh, he, just, he allowed the dirty, rotten traitor. He does. He did. Yes, he, he has facilitated that event. But I love that entry. That was fantastic, Ray, and very, very creative. That was um, awesome. Very nice sound effects. Sound effects were fantastic, too. At first, you're like, oh, he's got some kind of distortion. Oh, wait, that's the laser. <laughs> All right. So great. So that was awesome. So here we go. Here comes another entry now. Hello, it's Phil from sunny England. Uh, Hi, Phil. Here to tell you about my piece of art for the Core Worlds contest. Uh, I was suffering a little confusion. Uh, uh -oh. and I misread the description, not as art about a Core World, confusion. but as a world within a Core. My piece is a sculpture inspired by Dyson spheres, except mine is cylindrical. I'd read about these massive hypothetical constructions in Article 27 of a science magazine uh -oh, wait a minute. on a revolver full of <laughs> sci-fi literature at the library. I didn't have a lot of time and space to make uh. it, so it's a little crude, but it does give the look and the feel that I was going for. On the inside of the tube are hundreds of tiny miniature buildings, colonists and vehicles. I wanted a sci-fi outer rim outpost kind of feel, <laughs> I so I included there. some livestock and all sorts of other crazy creatures. Painting hundreds of tiny model space sheets and sticking all those little devils in place would drive most people over the edge. And myself felt a bit of a space cadet afterwards, uh, let me tell you. Nice. But it did feel good when I finished each flock and I hit those milestones. To carry on the sci-fi theme, I needed to add a sun to the sculpture. So I crafted a huge glass ball with dozens of lamps in the centre. It took a computer program nearly 800 lines long to make all the bulbs pulse and colour change just like a real sun. But as I typed the final character on code 777, uh, it was a very satisfying achievement. Unfortunately, it gave off a lot of heat, and I wondered if the plastic miniatures would survive, but it turns out that was the least of my worries. My glass sun was extremely heavy, you see, <laughs> oh, and it no. started to go wrong. I was at full panic station, and all I could do was watch in horror as the weight caused my sculpted tube to buckle. So it's a good thing you don't want to actually see my sculpture in person, as all I have left is a broken glass ball and a long mangled tube, all because I forgot the pole as a weight limit of 250 pounds. You knew it was going to go there, didn't you? You knew it was going to end up there. Nice, Phil. That was like watching a skillfully <laughs> thrown boomerang Not only, race fully through the sky. The other thing that was very subtle in there, and you have to listen to it a couple of times, he names every single Stronghold game title. Yes, that was awesome. Uh, which was also very well done. So, Phil, a very clever entry from Confusion. He's got them all in there. Uh, although yeah. he did not mention... Did he mention survive? He did. He, oh, he did. did. He okay. was afraid that his model. Oh yes. Survive. yes, nicely done. Article twenty-seven revolver. Uh, I'm going to ding him some points for not including the subtitles. However, okay, fair enough. Time and space. I just received in the mail a review copy. That looks fantastic. That's out there. Uh, so even though Bonacore is a dirty, rotten traitor, he's still sending us games. That, well, that's uh, true. which is very kind he's of him. He's sending them to you by accident and means to be sending them. Well, to I you. explained to him that depending on the depth of the backstab, it may require more games. <laughs> no. Okay. So the whole thing here is, I may lose diplomacy, but I'm winning games. That's true. See how that which works. Ultimately, is okay. It's the meta game, Craig. It's how yeah, you, how you it's work. all. It all. It's all how you work the meta. It's all uh, about the meta. All right. Let's see. They got one more left here. Let's see what this is. Here we go. This is tough. It is tough. Before us in the foreground of this oil painting, from the shoulder up, is the silhouette of a galactic grunt, their blocky armor supporting an equally trapezoid assault rifle. The figure looks away from us to a horizon lined with petroleum pumps, the plumes of acrid black smoke rising to the air and beyond where in the stratosphere one can make the hazy outline of a capital starship, highlighting the contribution of a single soldier who watches over the crude oil, which in turn feeds the galactic monstrosities known as starships enabling the crusade onwards to the core worlds. Do, 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 do. Hey, the music. And who was that? That was uh, Jude Cole. Who? Uh, Jude... My contribution to Oops, the... Sorry, we're going back to the beginning. Jude Cole. Was... Now, what's interesting about Jude Cole, and okay. what was interesting about that one is, I thought that one, the entry itself was very artistic. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It the was music sort of serious that. art. So this is tough, because we got some... So that's all of them. That's all of our entries. 
thank you. First of all, thank you to everyone for putting all the time into this. Uh, clearly, a it lot also of you, says we need to do another one of those that requires absolutely no effort whatsoever. Well, well, you, but yeah, but it's fun. Look at this. We got. Oh, we got I like this. Right? I like these. We got great entertainment here. Um, so I was entertained. So thank you guys for submitting all this stuff. Now oh, comes the hard part. Yes. Now we have to pick from all these fantastic entries. Yes. Um, you know which one our favorite is that sticks with the theme of the contest slash very vague and incorrectly stated several different times rules, <laughs> uh, which were that it may or may not need to be 30 seconds long. Uh-huh. That may or may not have been a rule. Um, <laughs> that it had to be about core worlds and crude together. Yes. Which I think that was, I think that was pretty clearly I think restated. that was pretty clear. Yep. And that the artwork uh, should be described in some way. Right. I think it's pretty much what the rules were. So I think most of you nailed that. Uh, but the 30 second one is optional. So we got to decide yeah, that's, creativity. Yeah, that was, we weren't really strict about that. But clearly, a couple folks put a lot of extra time in there to make it indeed. cut it to 30 it's seconds. Not, it's it's so. not easy to do that. Brevity is the soul of wit. Indeed, it is. So Sorry. I don't know, Craig. What are you thinking? Of? What do you want to do? I just pick three and then see if we have any overlap? Uh, yeah. Why don't we go ahead? All and right. Do... Okay. So uh, talk okay. amongst yourselves. It'll be a topic here. Bing, bing, bing. Uh, I'm gonna Wood go Island with... is neither a road nor an island. Discuss. Right. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna like that one. Um, that one's also good. It's riveting radio. It is riveting radio right now. We're thinking about this. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to decide between, you know, mm. comedy or some of the more serious. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're all kind of. Most of them are pretty, uh, pretty, pretty humorous here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Oh, geez, they're so good. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with. Okay, I've got mine. Okay, I have mine. <clears throat> All right. Did you put them in order? Or did you just pick three you liked. No, I just picked three. Okay, I, I might have sequenced mine. Well, <laughs> shuffle them up. Here, I'll pick. I'll pick one. I'll pick one of my three favorite ones. Okay. Uh, it's hard because I like Jude's a lot. And so I'm, I'm going to give honorable mention to Jude, who is the one, the last one we listened to. Right. Yes. Which that's my honorable mention. So if you picked it at all, then we'll get, it's going to get double honorable mention. Did you pick okay. Jude's at all? Uh, no, but I'm going to give honorable mention to Chris. Chris was the game, oh yes. the game bits. Uh, oh, the bits. Yes, using the bits in his diorama. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I like. Yeah, I like that one too. I'll, I I'll second that. Um, yeah. Okay. So my first of my first three finalists, in yeah. no particular order, I've removed yeah. my order. Good. 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 There you go. Uh, Phil from England. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, first of all, the poll joke for me never gets old. Never, ever, ever gets old. And as we're, as we're near Gen Con, actually, this will be airing after Gen Con. We're actually recording this right before, literally the weekend before we leave for Gen Con. Uh-huh. And since the poll joke originally came from Gen Con, I just think it's extra appropriate. But also, it's hard to write that meaningful You know what that sense. means? That's fifth anniversary of the poll joke. It is. It is. It's crazy. There are <laughs> countless marriages that don't make it to five right. years. And, and our poll joke is going strong. So, Phil, kudos for, to you for, A, getting all the names of the games in there in a cohesive sentence yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or paragraph, and, yeah. B, keeping the poll alive for five years running. Indeed. Because it is in no small part thanks to you that and your true. continual Phil, entries in these contests does not that the poll joke has yet fail. to die. He does not fail to sign off any email he sends us with Viva La Poll. Right, right. And... And as anyone who knows me for any length of time knows, I love a good callback joke. Uh, uh, he, <laughs> Russ is the king of the callbacks. All right. So that was my first nomination, Craig, as a finalist. What was okay. one of your first nominations? Uh, in no particular order, I'm going with uh, Chainmail Bikini. Which one was that? Oh, that was, that was Spookies. Spookies, okay. Spooky, Spooky was a Chainmail Bikini entry. Okay. And I believe Mrs. Spooky was involved. She there. was, clearly. Now, what drew you to this other than the obvious Chainmail Bikini reference? Uh, well, I really enjoyed uh, the humorous element of it <clears throat> mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, all the different little aspects that went into it. And I laughed a lot when they were doing it. Yeah. And um, there you go. All right. Well, my I will admit that my second choice was also the art critic debate, uh-huh. a.k.a. Well, there you go. the chainmail bikini slash yeah. there's no such thing as a brontosaurus. No. Uh, <laughs> which I, I really enjoyed. I Clearly, I, there's a lot of clever humor. In a there. lot of work in the dialogue. It's very hard to come across as two different people on a show. I should know. I fail it every week in the news. <laughs> so it was just really, really well done. I, I thought it was excellent. Uh, very creative. Um, the art critic debate was brilliant, taking it to the next level. Um, so, yeah. So two votes for uh, Spooky's entry. Okay. Uh, and then who was your uh, a in third? In no particular order. Your next choice, Craig, yeah. Uh, my next choice was Monique. Ah, an excellent choice. Uh, yeah. I think I, 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 yeah. 
<clears throat> I mean, the, the the quality of what was going on there, mm-hmm. the, uh, the the concept behind it, and mm-hmm. then the quality of the skipping through the artwork until she got to the right one <laughs> yeah. uh, was an awful lot of time, effort, and humor went into that. Very creative. And again, I also liked the... Um yeah, I liked everything about it. And again, I like the concept of taking art to the next level. How do you present it in an art format? So both Spooky and Monique did, both did that really cool yeah. cool thing. So so um, she was my third choice as well. All right. So, But Craig, what was your third choice? Have you given my three? third choice yeah. in no particular order yes. was Phil. Phil, oh dear. Because, because to be totally honest, first of all, there's the poll joke. But I didn't even I didn't even see that one coming. So that I, I was loving it already because he so... First of all, the the art that he was describing was cool and funny. Yeah, right. But Racist. on top of that, he managed to get every stronghold game in there, mm. and I and I think that's bonus points enough to uh, to offset the bonus points that he lost for not saying survive, escape from Atlantis. Right. And it's a shame that that Stephen Bonacore is such a dirty rotten trader because I would have loved to have him here and listen to that particular entry with all the references to the sure, games. Although, really although I think Monique's joke about Bonacore and having his being on all the podcasts that was classic was classic yeah so I think we're given these three tie-ins here especially well I'm leaning Phil and Monique were particularly good because they tied right into it but Spookies was also fantastic so what are we going to do Craig oh, we, we, I, we both chose the same three so now what smarty pants well I, I I mean should we should we try to break it down to two yeah and then d- roll a die. I mean, this I is the D6 it is it is a D six generation. Roll a D six. Roll a D. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So I'm going to be totally uh, politically incorrect here. Oh. And I happen to know. Uh-oh. See, I think I, I, I don't want. You're using insider information. Well, I I know that Monique won the last contest. Um, see, and I'm just now I'm being like all spread the spread uh, the love spread thing. the spread the joy. So as much as I think Monique's is equal to the other two entries and clearly had a lot of work. Really, yeah, really, you're doing you're doing this. Huh? I don't know, or we can roll it right now. I think either we got to roll it right now and let the dice fall where it may, and let the dice decide if we could have a repeat winner. I think we got to do it now. Okay, okay. Because I think all three equal. So I'm going to ask, and because I've already displayed my bias, even though Monique, I love you stuff. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to see you win again. Just saying. So, Craig, I want you to roll the D6 right now. One or two, it's Monique. Yep. Three or four, it's Spooky. Yep. Five or six, it's Phil. Okay. Here we go. Right here in the air. We're going to decide right now. Yep. Okay. Roll it. My mic so you can hear. Yep. (laughs) And it is Spooky. All right. Spooky, congratulations. Woohoo. All right. Nicely done. Uh, Congratulations, Spooky. We will send out to you. I think we have your address, but send it back to us anyway. Uh, And we will be sure to send out to you uh, a lovely copy of both Core Worlds with the expansion and Crude. But you know what we should do? What should we do? To be totally honest. We should forward these to the Dirty Rotten Trader. Oh, we should. Because he he, he is always very generous. We can't promise anything. He is. But yes. we'll, we're going to forward the two um, honorable mentions. Honorable mentions, yes. and uh, and 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 we'll see what he has to say. Okay, fair enough. I don't think that's, that's a good I, idea. I think we should do that. Yeah, we can we can do that. That's I doable. mean, I think we should also promise that uh, the two honorable mentions won't get more than Spooky gets. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> Very good. Uh, well, they, he's getting us game and expansion and another game, so he's already way ahead. He's, he's way ahead. He's way yeah. Ahead. We can see what we can see what uh, you know. No promises, but we'll we'll definitely share these entries with Stephen, and I know he will listen to this particular episode. Yeah. Yes, he, um, he might stop listening if I call him a dirty rotten trader one more time. One more time, yeah. But I, I won't. I'll stop right there at five or six or whatever the count is at. Yeah, there you go. Um, so there you go. Well, th- again, thanks everyone for entering. Yes, and absolutely. we look forward to our next contest. And hopefully, we'll get uh, more entries. But we love our repeat. We we love uh, both everyone who takes t- time to do this. But we love the fact that we've got some great listeners out there that love to participate in all of our our contests. It just really uh, warms our heart. And is we just love to know that there's people out there that that uh, listen to our work and contribute to the show and make it make it a lot of fun. So we Absolutely. love listening to your work. That's and great. we realize that those of you who are our first time contributors spend a lot of time. We on do. This yes. Show, so please don't think that. Yes. That we're discounting you. Right. On that. Um, right. And, and, and it takes practice because you you have no idea what we're looking for because we do not articulate it very well at all. I am the first That's one true. to take full responsibility for the fact that you know these contests of ours are extremely vague. You the know, opposite of kudos, the, that's what we take. The, the, the only thing of kudos. The only bonus, kudos. The only good news is as you can see the fields are usually small. Yes. So, you know, given everything else going on there, you got a pretty good chance of winning something, you know. Right. And so, yeah. and so but thanks for participating. We really appreciate it. And we we'll hope to listen to you guys again soon. 
Yes, thank you. Looking for not too horrible insight and entertainment beyond the usual paltry four hour D6G shows? Well, there's only one place on the planet you can find it, and it's in the lost chapters. Go to the d6generation.com and begin your quest. Damn, farming games. Why did it have to be farming games? All right, all right, Craig. Time to talk about our friends at Game Salute. You know what makes Game Salute so awesome? It was great. I was I was at Gen Con this past uh, weekend, and I had my cool Game Salute pin with the little meeple and the little wings next to it. Of course, them. of course. And people are like, "That is the coolest pin ever." Wherever did you get that? I said, "I got that from Game Salute, the best game publisher on the internet. Get your stuff out there." You know what's great about them too? <laughs> zoo Fu. I'm looking at their website right now. Zoo Fu, Craig, fighting animals in the zoo. Path of the Samurai Zookeeper. Right. It's awesome. So these guys help game designers like you. If you're an aspiring game designer thinking, I want to get my game out there. I, I, I have the idea. I can do this. But, you know, Kickstarter is intimidating. All the things you've heard, the horror stories about guys losing their homes, about not calculating shipping properly, about now knowing how to properly price it. How do I get in touch with an artist? How do I make all this stuff happen? That's where GameSuit comes in. They're helping to make sure that you, the, the, the up and coming game designer, can get your stuff to market. Or if you're just a gamer who wants to buy some crazy new games, you want to support new designers, you want to support new stuff, want to try new things. Check out all the great games at, at Game Salute. They're supporting right on Kickstarter right now as we're talking about this. Legends of the Frontier with like Davy Crockett. Davey, all those guys. Exactly. Davey Crockett. How about you're into boxing? Top promoter. A game all about uh, boxing and getting in there. Um, thing. Yeah, exactly right. Dwarven Forge. It's not really Dwarven Forge. It's King's Forge. Dwarves forging things. There's no dwarf. It's just a guy with a big beard. and He and feels like a dwarf to me. I, he but he's, he looks like a, a little dwarf. dwarf. Maybe 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 a Viking? There's nothing there there that you could actually give any sort of <laughs> scale of size. No, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do. But all kinds of great stuff. Head on over to Gamesloot.com. Check out all the games they're kickstarting. You know they're going to be backed well. You know they're going to they're gonna have people that know what they're doing. They're going to be have great components, great well-tested rules, just great games in general. Gamesloot.com. Mm. Six Generation Podcast. All of the mysteries of gamer culture revealed. The D6 Generation. Born to Game. Hey, welcome back. And uh, how excited are we that we have David Weber with us for the entire show? I'm excited. That's that's just that, David. Thank you. I mean, this is oh, yeah. so much time out of a crazy, crazy schedule. Really we, appreciate it. We just really appreciate it. Oh, I've been having a good time, you know. Thank you. Uh, so what we want to do is we're gonna, we're going to wrap this up with uh, I, for one, am uh, very interested in writing and writers' processes, and I think a lot of our listeners are as well. And so we're going to uh, dissect you a little bit, if you will. Oh, and, wow, that sounds uh, painful. It's, it's, it's going to be painless. It's going to be painless, uh, uh, mostly. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, and then maybe at the towards the end, I'm I'm very interested in 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 character and things like that for role playing game. But, but we'll see if we even get there. So, first of all, just very quickly, um, I, you were back all the way in uh, episode sixty six, actually. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're almost like du- we've all, very close to doubled the number of episodes we have in our show since the last time you were on. So that's wow. October two thousand and ten was wow. The last there episode. you go. It's Ow. <laughs> I'm See? Like much older. I I, I, wow, like, I know, right? What happened? Yeah. Um, so uh, what are you working on right now? I mean, we just talked about uh, about the film and everything that's all super ex- that ridiculously exciting. Um, <laughs> as far as like what's on your writing table right now, what are you working on? Oh, well, let's see. Um, the seventh Safe Hold book is coming out in January or February. I'm not working on that one at the minute. We just I just finished the copy edit before uh-huh. we headed out to Los Angeles. Um, I am uh, waiting for uh, Eric Flint's half of a collaboration in the Honorverse, uh, Cauldron of Ghosts. Um, Tim Zahn and Tom Pope and I are just wrapping up the first of a trilogy that Tim's doing. I think I probably mentioned that while we were talking about Evergreen. I think so, yep. 
Um, and Joelle Presby, who is uh, a new writer, she's done a uh, couple of pieces of sor- short fiction for Bain, um, and I are dusting off the multiverse books, uh, Hell's Gate and Hell Hath No Fury, and we are currently working on the third book in that series, uh, envisioning uh, a minimum of four. Mm-hmm. And in mm-hmm. my copious free time, when I get done with all that, um, Tony Weisskopf has agreed to uh, let me begin my fantasy magnum opus that springboards off of the Basel books in uh, North Russia. Oh, cool. So I anticipate being relatively, you know, find something to occupy my time for the next six, seven, twelve wow. years. No wonder you haven't been given much lately. Holy mackerel. <laughs> yeah, well, we are getting towards the end of the Honor Harrington story arc. Uh-huh. Um, that we, we, we've got a little bit of a problem in those books because um, the Mason alignment got pulled forward. Uh-huh. And they weren't supposed to be discovered until the military hardware equation had sort of evened out. Oh. Uh, so that the so that the 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 Mantis and the Grand Alliance didn't have such an overwhelming military advantage, mm-hmm. and I'm having to do some uh, some readjustment, kind of on the fly, that is causing me to go a couple of places I hadn't planned to go. Uh-huh. But one of the things about the Honorverse is it's big, uh, mm-hmm. and so even after I finish the Honor Harrington arc. There's 2,000 years of history there mm. uh, to mine, okay? There's, there's you know, I, I want to write the story of the, uh, the founding of the Andromani Empire, oh. um, for example, because Gustav Andromani has always been one of my favorite characters, and you've never, ever seen him right. Uh, right. on screen. Um, I'm delighted with what Tim is doing in the discovery of the wormhole period, the early days of the Royal Manticoran Navy. Um, it's going to be a very different flavor from Honor's time because at this point, you know, the Star Kingdom is basically Denmark. Um, and it has not yet become this huge military and uh, merchant empire right. uh, that it later becomes. Um, and the um, I will probably be wrapping up the... Um, current safe hold story arc mm. in about two more books um, as well. And then there'll be a, um, a hiatus uh, before that whole storyline kicks up again. Not necessarily a hiatus in book production, but a hiatus in the storyline that will jump ahead about 20 years before we pick up again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's, there's some stuff going on that is really kind of tectonic uh, in terms of where I am and what I'm doing. Right. Um, and then, of course, the movie figures into all of this, and I have no idea how much of uh, a time commitment that's going to take uh, before this is all over. Um, with the, you know, we already talked about with, with Scott and uh, about the extent to which they want me to be hands on with this project. Right. Um, and that's going to, that is, I know, going to use a lot of time that um, otherwise would be going into books. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a bit, that's, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot on the plate, but a lot of exciting stuff. Yeah, there's a lot. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm one of those people who, <laughs> one of these days I'm going to have to learn how to, how to slow down. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, um, because if I'm not actively, I used to take a couple of months off between books mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and actually just sort of sit back and go, hi, I know you, you're my wife, <laughs> um, and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, now I just go, I go straight from one project to another. And Bob Asprin said something long, long, long ago at a convention called Magnum Opus Con right here in Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, wow. yep. Uh, when I had like maybe three or four books out, uh, he was, we were on a panel and he told the panel, he said, um, writers are like rats. If we don't wear our fingers down at the keyboard every day, our fangs grow through our brains and kill us. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob and I didn't see eye to eye on everything, but he nailed it on uh-huh. that. Most successful writers have to write, right? Mm. You know, it's, it's an addictive thing. I wouldn't want to say that we were obsessive-compulsive, but my wife doesn't hesitate to make that allegation. 
Um, now, yeah. when you talk about uh, like giving yourself a couple months and then delving in again, about how long does it take you to write a book? <sighs> Depending on the length, mm-hmm. usually. Uh, sometimes more on the subject matter, but as a general rule, uh, I can figure that I can turn out a hundred and eighty to two hundred and twenty-five thousand word book in about <laughs> three months. Wow! wow. And if <laughs> Oof. Well, when, when I'm in the, when I'm in the groove, yeah, when, when the writing is going the way it's supposed to do, I will do a minimum of five thousand words a day. Uh huh. Wow. Um, and uh, now, obviously, I'm not writing every day. Right. Uh, at, at that rate, I'm not one of those people who goes in and sits down and says, "Okay, I must be in front of the computer from eight a.m. to eleven every day." Mm-hmm. Uh, I tend to um, I write in chapters. Uh huh. Um, and so I tend to say, okay, I'm going to write this chapter today. And if it's 5,000 words or 7,000 words, sometimes I, I've written a chapter that went to 18,000 words. I read it, <laughs> wrote it in one day, and then I went and divided it into five chapters. Ow. Went wow. back and found the logical breakpoints. But I was just, I was, I was in the flow. Yep, yep. And so, so I kept going. One of the stories, one of the novels that I want to write, um, is uh, if you've seen uh, the new anthology beginnings, um, we have sort of the courtship of Honor's father in that one, mm-hmm. and we find out that he was a uh, a Marine sergeant, bef- master sergeant before he he ever became uh, a naval officer, and we find out why he asked for a cross transfer in medical training, um, and the, the short version of it is he was way too good at killing people. <laughs> um, and so one of these days I want to write the novel that tells the story of how he discovered that uh-huh. uh, about himself. He found – it's kind of like Honor has often said, you know, I, I could be a monster right? Yep. under the wrong circumstances. Her dad came to the same conclusion oh, about wow. himself. <laughs> and when Honor says to her mom, yes, but I know who I got my temper from talking about her father, he, she's being absolutely <laughs> accurate. <laughs> and a lot of people – didn't realize it because her dad is, they think of him as the big teddy bear, you know, kind of thing. And he's, he is in many ways, but he wasn't always, if you know what I'm saying. Yep. So right. that's one of the stories I want. My problem is, and it's a good problem to have if you're a professional writer. My problem is that I have more stories to tell than I have time in which to tell them. <laughs> right. Oh, that is a good st- problem to have. It, it's a much better problem than having a contract and not knowing what you're going to do with it. <laughs> Good uh, but um, it does. I don't. I I hope it's kind of like you hope somebody will take your car keys away from you when you get <laughs> past it. Uh-huh. Okay, I kind of hope that somebody will say to me gently, "Dave, you're drooling on the keyboard. <laughs> you know, you you're, you're no longer doing your best work. So you might want to, you know, pull back." Um, but I'm not to that point yet, mm-hmm. and I don't expect to be there for quite a few years yet. Well, we hope not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I uh, have to say, I have to say, we were talking about Roger Zelazny earlier. Yep. We wa- we lost Roger way, way too early. I think he was only like 56. Yeah. When when he died. Yeah. Um, and uh, George Martin and I were driving over to. I flew out to to Albuquerque for a wake at the uh, Saber Hagen's house. Fred and Jones Saberhagen, lovely people. Um, anyway, uh, George and I were—I was riding with George when we were driving over there. And George was like, "You know, I—I—I I, I, I can't believe he's gone." You know, um, and I said, "Well, you know, it's—I—I it, I miss him too, but nobody can ever say that we didn't get a chance to see what Roger Zelazny could do." Right. Okay. Right. And George said, "But he wasn't finished yet." And I said, "George, if Roger had been 107." He wouldn't have been finished yet. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's the kind of writer that he was. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I'm feeling all the guys who I read mm-hmm. when I was beginning to really discover science fiction are pretty much gone now. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and I still, when somebody walks up to me at a con and starts talking to me about you know, how much they love my books and how they've been reading them for 20 years and whatnot, I have this urge to look over my shoulder and see which of the guys I read for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. which, like Annie McCaffrey. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 Roger. Yeah. Uh, Keith Lawmer. I mean, you know, the, Robert Heinlein. I mean, this incredible yeah. list of people who I met right. science fiction through. That's who I think they're talking to. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I guess I, I, I prefer it that way. To be like, oh yes, you may kiss my <laughs> ring, you know. Kind <laughs> right. of thing. Um, but the uh, there's so much, so much of our science fiction heritage, if you will, is because it's no longer in print. Mm. Right, is lost. And some, I, I actually, I actually heard someone say uh, about an Andre Norton novel. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, it's pretty good, but the story's been done so many times uh, <laughs> without realizing that what they're reading is the first time right. anybody did it. That yep. was like that was like when they were criticizing John Carter for the same thing. It's like yeah. you do realize that's from like <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, they stole that from Star Wars. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah. it's like yeah. 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 Tolkien I stole actually, the elves. You know. <laughs> yeah, I actually I actually heard somebody say that. Right. You know, it's kind of. But there's also, it's like I don't like bowdlerization. Of an author, yeah. Okay, it, I think he should stand on his own or her own two feet, mm-hmm. um, without somebody making apologies for him because the language is no longer acceptable or or something like that. Right. But there are times when H. Beam Piper was way way ahead of all the other writers in the field mm-hmm. with the notion of women in the military. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, he was so far in front, it's not even funny. But he was writing at a time when the terminology hadn't settled. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay? And there's a line in um, uh, the Uller Uprising um, where he's talking uh, about a female sergeant. Okay? Yeah. And he uses the phrase, the girl sergeant. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's going to get right up the nose of any feminist. It's going to get right up the nose of most female readers right. today. Okay? And yet, he was actually way out in front mm-hmm. right. when he used it. So that's one of those cases where I actually think that a little discreet editing, uh-huh. if, if he was reissued, just change it to the woman sergeant mm-hmm. right. or just the sergeant. Yeah. And right. suddenly the passage reads completely differently. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure exactly how I got off onto that. <laughs> no, it's interesting though. Any tangent you go off on is a tangent we want to hear. That's right. That's uh, right. This whole show is a tangent anyway. Let's be honest. Yeah, so, actually, you know. the, the the existence of this show is right. a tangent. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you know, you guys were talking about uh, characters and characterization. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, my belief is that it doesn't matter how much whiz-bang technology you've got. It doesn't matter, you know, how great a uh, story concept you've got. If you don't have characters that the reader can actually believe in, mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily have to like all the characters, but that the reader can actually believe in, the story's going to fail. Right. Okay? Um, and I think that I get asked sometimes, you know, okay, you write Honor Harrington. How the heck do you, do you, you're six feet three, you used to ride a motorcycle, you used to be covered with hair, you still are from the neck down, um, you know, you, you are now substantially heavier than you were when you rode a motorcycle or drove your Spitfire, um, but how do you write a convincing female character? Yeah. To which my response is, I don't. Mm-hmm. I write a convincing human being who happens to be female. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think that that is the key to successful characterization. Whoever you write has to be convincing. And the bad guys don't usually, you know, wake up and decide, you know, we shall call ourselves the Alliance of Evil. <laughs> um, there are, you know, you've got to have some villains who are just plain scum of the earth, right. like Pavel Young, who, mm-hmm. whose only redeeming characteristic was they provided food for worms after he was gone. <laughs> okay. Uh, but most of the villains in books most of the bad guys in books Mm -hmm. aren't really rotten nasty people right okay I mean they're they're very few people see themselves as villains 
Exactly, yep. And if you can get inside them and look at their motivation, look at where they're coming from, they aren't any more villainous than you are. They're simply starting from a different place with a different view of the universe. And they're trying to do the best that they can the same way that you are. Right, yep. And I think that's one of the things that draws a certain type of reader to my books is the sense that even the bad guys are people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Uh, now, some of them you're hard, you can hardly wait for honor to get a hold of, but they're still people um, kind of thing. And another thing that I like to do, I love, and this is a problem for making movies, <laughs> I love secondary and tertiary characters. All mm-hmm. right, yeah. Um, and I, I don't think you'll find too many places in my books where, you know, the, the honor speaks to the lieutenant. Okay. Right. The lieutenant right. has a name. Right. And that name has somebody behind it when I wrote the story. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a lot of those secondary and tertiary characters, you wind up meeting again later on in more important roles. Um, and in fact, I, I've got one problem, which is people say, well, I haven't heard anything about so-and-so for a while. Is, is he all right? <laughs> you know, you know, well, you know, there is a war on. Yes, but is he all right? <laughs> yeah, so, right. But I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's important for the characters to be, to some extent, they have to be real for the writer. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay? Um, you, you, when you start losing track of the fact that they are fictional creations, you <laughs> probably need to go take some time off. But by the same token, it's kind of like you don't have to plan the, the dialogue or the response for the character because you know that person so well right. that you know how they'll respond. And when that happens, you know that you've actually got that character down and, and you're ready to go with it. Now, when I shifted over from um, keyboard to uh, voice-activated software... Uh-huh. Yeah, does that, uh, let me ask you this. Does that make you feel like a sci-fi author that you're actually writing with your voice? <laughs> uh, Do you feel like you're living in the writing future? with a computer when you understand that I didn't have my first computer until I was 26. Oh, good point. So you've been through the whole thing, gone from typewriter to... Yeah, to I'm, PC I'm or... one of the world's last trained linotype operators. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, that's okay. right. Yeah, when, when, you know, when, when, when the EM pulse kills all the computers, right. I will have a trade to fall back upon. You're ready, right. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, of course, I'm also one of the few people who can identify World War I battleships from photographs, <laughs> which is another incredibly useful skill. That's right. Um, it is. It is. <laughs> hey, you know, I collect useful skills. Um, <laughs> the main thing that shifting over... I. I broke my wrist uh, on icy steps, Ooh. and I broke it into 57 pieces. Oh, really? Is that exaggerated? Yes. Is that real? Wow. They could figure out where 56 of them went when they put it back together. I have the 57th in a jar on my dresser. <laughs> oh, oh, that's uh, just not right. It's very small. You know, uh. I hardly miss it. Um, <laughs> but I also have two plates, 12 screws, and six pieces of wire in oh. my wrist. Um, and that means that I can't. And, and because I used to use manual typewriters and linotype machines, mm-hmm. I beat keyboards to death when right. I type. Um, and the repetitive shock in the wrist, just I can't do it for more than right. about 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I broke it in the middle of a book for Jim Bain. Oh. And Jim is like, oh, crap. Uh, how long <laughs> are you going to be? Oh, four months. <laughs> oh. and so he was like, uh, have you ever tried voice activated software? I said, I don't think it would work, Jim. You know, and kind of, well, if I got you, would you try it? So he bought me like version 2.2. Now, what, what year was this? What, when was it? When did this Oh, happen? God. This was. Uh, is it the 90s? Is it that early or is it in 2000? It was 15, 16 years ago. Oh, wow. So it was the late uh, 90s. Sharon Cher and I are coming up on our 15th wedding anniversary, okay. and it was the first winter after we were married. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so it's been, it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, and Dragon, to be honest, was not real good mm-hmm. uh, at that point. But I had no choice but to make it work. Um, and I discovered an interesting thing, which is that I had always been telling the story to somebody who was just on the other side of the display. Mm-hmm. But I'd been communicating it to them with my fingers because I had to text to them, right. if right. you want to put it that way. Right. Um, and so when I shifted over to the to the voice activate, it's not something I can do with anyone else in the room mm-hmm. because I feel like I ought to be talking to the human being. Oh, right. Present. 
Hmm. Uh, but um, there are some things that are different. Um, I think uh, I mentioned to you guys before the show, um, I have caught myself on occasion doing a reading at yeah. a con, and I'll be out of the way, exclamation point, close <laughs> quotes, she exclaimed, period. And I'll stop, and I go, wait, wait, let me, let me go back and do that over. I was going to say, have you, ever, have you ever been in casual conversation, t- telling a story to someone, not reading, but just telling, and you just started throwing in the punctuation there verbally? When I'm really, <laughs> really, really tired. Uh, it actually happened at a couple of cons. Uh, it happened uh, with Sharon after the, con- after the room party in Des Moines, <laughs> where the Honor Harrington fan club uh, introduced me to the technique of uh, it's a drinking game uh, called uh, pod salvos, <laughs> <laughs> and you really don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. But I was already tired before I went into the room party, and afterwards I I did wind up back in the proper hotel room. Oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> which was was probably good. Um, but uh, yeah, I I will occasionally when I'm really really tired. I'll start doing that. And there are a few words. Dragon is is biased towards uh, professional uh, business and technical writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you say, he smiled weakly, remembering the adverbs, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> it assumes that you mean he smiled once every Thursday, whether anything was funny or not. Uh, nice. uh, oh, yes. <laughs> and it's prejudiced towards proper nouns. Mm-hmm. So if you have a ruby, uh, a ruby necklace, it's... It belongs to somebody named Ruby. Oh, right. As far as as far as and pearl and diamond and all of the sports clubs are in there with their proper you know capitalized mm-hmm. nouns. So you have to go through and take out buccaneers and pirates and jazz <laughs> and whatnot. Uh, but by this time, I've been using it long enough that I know what I have to take out. Right. And I know that uh, if I want to uh, to make sure that it understands that I am talking about the ocean. Uh, instead of a uh, uh, the verb to see, mm-hmm. okay. Instead of saying see, I say see singular. Mm-hmm. And if they're sailing the seven seas, it's they're sailing the seven seas sing- sea plural, right. <laughs> so that it 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 knows where I'm going. And I have actually gotten to the point where it's just as natural for me to say that as it would be for me to say the actual single noun that I'm right. I'm I'm using. Um, so you learn some tricks, but the beautiful thing about it is I don't know anybody who can actually write at this speed, but you can dictate it 250 words a minute. Wow. That is fast. Holy yeah. cow. I could, t- I could, t- I did. I never learned to touch type. Oh, really? Um, I, yeah, I'll hit any key on the keyboard with any finger. Um, and I could type about 110 words dirty and about 80 words a minute clean. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, before I broke the wrist. Okay. Uh, but with this. Seriously, you know, I spend probably half the time that I'm writing going back and fixing places where it misunderstood me. Mm-hmm. Ah. It picked the wrong homonym or, or something like that. Um, and it also, it extrapolates your meaning from the sentence that you give it. So it mm-hmm. really would prefer for you to give it everything between the punctuation marks. Before it thinks it through, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, um, and, and sometimes you can't do that when you're writing. You're like stopping thinking about the words you right. want to use and so forth. But it's, um, I think my production is probably 25 to 30% higher wow. using the voice-activated I- software than it would be using a keyboard. I still use the keyboard to edit. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Because Dragon really doesn't like it if you if you load a two hundred and twenty five thousand word document yeah. into memory. <laughs> you talk about glacial. <laughs> okay, yeah. I remember I when I did when Steve White and I did Insurrection, our very first novel. Mm-hmm. I did it on an Osborne portable. Oh yeah, so, that's Osborne. Okay, sewing that's machine with the little index yeah. card size display, yeah. two ninety two K single side floppies, yep. and all the operating system, everything had to go on to one ninety two K floppy nice. somewhere on the other side. Um, and we had a stack of floppies which I had punched so I mm-hmm. could use both sides. Oh, of course, right. and these were the big floppies, right? The five and a okay. quarters, yeah, you got yeah. It. That yeah. was literally I measured it with a ruler. It was eighteen inches tall. Wow, nice. that's a lot of floppies. That was wow. a lot of floppies. And I remember when I got my first hard drive, <laughs> oh, and yeah. it had like six megs. I know. I remember those days. Very and well. I was never, ever <laughs> going to use all that space. No, up. six megs is plenty. <laughs> yeah, well, I, it was um, because of 
uh, typesetting rules and whatnot, uh, which I believe had something to do with unions. <laughs> um, I was on to... <sighs> I'm pretty sure, if I'm remembering correctly, that Honor Among Enemies was the first book that I was able to simply email the files to Bain on. Oh, wow. And then they converted them straight into the, into the typeset page. Wow. Uh, before that, I'd send it to them on floppies so that they would have it if they wanted it to search or whatever. But they needed a paper copy to be marked up and copy edited and sent to the typesetter and everything else. Oh, wow. So... It's when I look back over the, I sold the first one in eighty nine. Yeah, it came out I think in uh, ninety. Um, so this is the twenty third year that I've been a published author. Wow, wow. It's when you look back, you realize how much things have changed. When you're in the middle of it, it yeah. you don't notice it. Yeah. Right. Okay, but when you look back, and, yeah, <laughs> a few 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 months ago. I have 20 11-year-old daughters, Megan and Morgan, who were born in Cambodia. They're our beautiful adopted daughters. Uh, and then there's Michael Paul, who is our homegrown red-headed son. Uh, somebody once asked us if we were going to tell the girls that they were adopted. And I said, no, we're going to tell Mikey he's adopted. <laughs> you know? uh, but anyway, um, Morgan, I think, uh, asked me, what games did you have on your computer when you were our age, Daddy? <laughs> and I said, Daddy didn't have a computer. We had rocks. And they, look, they looked at me like, oh, my God. And they said, well, what games did you have on your computer in the seventh grade? <laughs> Daddy didn't have a computer. <laughs> what computers did you have on your in, in the ninth grade? Daddy didn't have one. <laughs> what? what did you have in high school? Daddy was the last class to graduate using slide rules. What's a slide <laughs> rule, Daddy? You know, and and well, what did you have in college? I said, Daddy didn't have a computer. Wow. You know, they're like they're like, how did you live? <laughs> uh, and and seriously, you know, you look back and you say, how did I live? Um, but I was out of graduate school before I ever had a PC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was a that was a Radio Shack Tandy, <laughs> right? Uh, the Tandy. Okay, yeah. Right. And, and and the word processing package was called Scripsit. I remember Scripsit also. Yeah. And it did pretty good yeah. actually. But yeah. yeah, that that is that is the author ruminating, and you know, I I yeah. will turn sixty one this year, and as you get older, your brain starts to go off on these these. I remember back when. David, I always wanted to ask a science fiction author this because I, I, I find it fascinating as a huge sci-fi fan myself and then also as a huge, you know, my, I'm a technology nerd as well. Yeah. Um, I always find it, two things fascinating. One is how predictive uh, science fiction uh, can be or has been. Um, but then also, do you find, like when you look back like that and you just realize that in, in, a, in a single lifetime, You've seen such amazing progress in, in even just a small area, like like how we interface with machines and the fact that we have portable machines at all, and how much more portable they are. Oh yeah, and we're not too far from neural. Well, right. Well, look uh, at look at a smartphone. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the, that's just a crazy when you think about how far you were talking about an Osborne not two minutes ago, and now look at yep. your 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 cell phone. Um, Those guys on Apollo thirteen would have loved to have had. I know, right? Do, do, do you do you feel like as you see technology go that fast? Does do you feel like does that make it harder for you as an author to be like, am I is my is my universe sci-fi enough? Does that even come into your mind? Or, you know, how does that impact the, how you the kind of things you include in your works? Well, I come at it from what what I was it, my my graduate studies and everything. I was trained as a historian. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it shows in the books, <laughs> um, but I look at science fiction as. I've said this at cons. Science fiction is the fairy tales of a technological civilization. Mm -hmm. And it serves the same functions that fairy tales, like cautionary tales, inspirational mm -hmm. tales, you know, you name it. Uh, but it's instead of elves and dwarves, you have AIs and cyborgs. Right. And instead of magic ships, you have, you have starships and whatnot. And my goal when I write science fiction is to not step on anything that we think we know. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and I do this from the position of a, a layman mm -hmm. rather than a trained scientist. Now, the, the Bu-9 guys 
we have some guys in there who have master's degrees in spacecraft design right. and, and whatnot. Um, and they have actually, I, I didn't step on too much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, which makes, makes me happy. But when you talk about the predictive ability of science fiction and how much I've seen in my own life, my grandmother was 101 and a half when she died. She was born in January 1900. Right. Okay. Um, when you look at what she saw in her life, you go, wow. But I realized a few years ago that I have seen in my life, at that point I was about 50, mm -hmm. that I had seen in my life two-thirds, maybe more, of what she'd seen in her life mm -hmm. in terms of changes. Because of the rate of change right. increasing and, right. and, and the, the spillover effect mm -hmm. into other areas. And when I think about what my kids are going to see, right? okay, that's scary. And I think about E.E. Uh, e. E. Smith, Doc Smith, uh, with the Lensman series, mm -hmm. which, of course, is it's a classic of science fiction. Mm -hmm. And his, his guys are still navigating around the universe using slide rules. Right. right. Yep. Because he started writing before right. anybody had built a computer. Right. right. Okay. So there are there are things that the best science fiction writer is going to that's what that is what science fiction missed mm -hmm. in the forties and the fifties was was computers. Mm -hmm. Right. That was the huge thing that they missed. And I think that the huge thing that they missed in the seventies and the eighties was the biosciences. Right. Ah. Okay. I'm not I'm not I use nanotech in my books. It's usually in the background. I have mm -hmm. some qualms with with uh, uh, nanotech because, as far as I'm aware, nobody has repealed the laws of thermodynamics, <laughs> which is going to create a few problems. Right. Here. <laughs> I love that phrase, uh, "repeal the laws." It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know what, what the hell, you know. But uh, but I, you know, it's like you you. I ha I actually had a discussion mm -hmm. with a, another science fiction author who has uh, PhD. Uh, has two PhDs mm -hmm. in the hard sciences. And we were talking about who writes the better science fiction. Somebody who is really, really informed on current theory and everything, mm -hmm. or somebody who has basically a layman's knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. And we came to the conclusion that for near future science fiction, the guy with the, the training has it head and shoulders over the guy without the training. Mm -hmm. But if you get more than a couple of hundred years out, it starts swinging the other way. Right. It, in, yeah. the, in the short period, the sh in, in the near term, he, he knows what's going on. In the mm -hmm. long term, he's blinkered by knowing what's going on mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that that's probably true. Of course, we had had quite a few nice loggers while we were having the discussion. So <laughs> we, were, we were at that point of solving all the problems of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I really believe that, there is, uh, that there's some truth in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I, I think the other thing that we have to bear in mind is that we're writing about human beings. Okay? Right. Most of us are mm -hmm. writing about human beings. Mm -hmm. And until human beings become something we will no longer recognize as human beings, until mm -hmm. they become, in effect, an alien species compared to us today, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a lot of the same motivations. You're going to have the same reactions to threats, to mm -hmm. rivalries, to opportunities, to love that, that we have today. And that if you go back and look at the Odyssey, although they were you know, a little crasser and cruder about it, uh, the, the Trojans and, and the Mycenaeans had. Mm -hmm. uh, when Homer was around, I mean, my God, if you go back and read Shakespeare, especially if you read it in prose form without the, the verse structure, right? okay, he really understands, read Romeo and Juliet, okay? Mm -hmm. That man understands teenage angst. Right. right? Right. All right, and it hasn't changed that much. Right, he <laughs> okay. he totally could have done Twilight. I think he probably yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it wasn't him, it was probably Chris Marlowe. That's right. all I got to say. You know? right. uh, and what's interesting too, I think, is some of the stuff too. Like if you look at like iRobot and those kind of books that are that only now 
are we even getting to the point where where that kind of thing is is is, is an a issue. real concern right. rather than yes and yet way back then he was already on you know identifying the idea of of what happens when you put project humanity into into an inanimate object kind of thing yeah. you know yeah it's, I, I find that kind of stuff really fascinating well actually one of one of my friends um is especially fascinated by the character of Merlin in mm-hmm. Safe Hope yeah because he's like is this really Nimue Albin? Right. Okay. Or is it somebody else entirely? And does Merlin have a soul? Mm-hmm. And I think those are some of the issues that we're going to have to decide. Now, you may not believe that anybody has a soul, right. but if you're talking to a self aware, intelligent mm-hmm. being, okay, yeah. how do you, if you believe in souls at all, right. how do you? dispose of this person without granting this person a soul. Mm, right. Um, it's one of the things that <sighs> I was not a huge um, uh, Star Trek fan. Mm. Um, I, I liked, um, I liked uh, Deep Space Nine mm. more than I liked uh, Next Generation. Mm-hmm. Of course, now I've probably spoiled a little bit by being old enough to remember the original, original Star series. Trek at right. first. Uh, yeah. But one of the issues that I think they did deal with, not the way I would have dealt with it, but in many ways well, was the question of data mm-hmm. and whether or not he was property mm-hmm. right. or a person. Right. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I've always thought is technology is basically an enabler. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the things that it does is it forces us to confront what we truly believe. Um, Before the introduction of mechanized farming, you could say, well, we have to have a huge labor force to work the farms, and nobody's going to do that willingly. Therefore, we have to have a slave class to work the farms. Mm hmm. But when you reach a point where you can send Cyrus McCormick's reaper out right. to, to cut the wheat and you can build a machine that will pick cotton uh, and, and whatnot, then all of a sudden you can't justify it anymore on the basis of, well, you know, I really believe that all men are created equal, but somebody's got to work the farm. Right. right. Okay. And the same thing with women. Uh, when, you are, when you move mo- more and more steadily to a brain-based society rather than a brawn-based society, mm-hmm. all, of the, all of the official reasons for keeping women out of the workforce um, because they don't have the upper body strength, because they don't have the size, because whatever, they go away. Mm-hmm. Now, there may be other considerations involved. There, should be con- there are other considerations involved for anybody who is a human being as mm-hmm. to whether or not they're suitable for this job or that job or whether – I cook. I'm the cook at home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sharon, says, uh, Sharon says, I'm a very good cook. It's just that nobody really likes boiled water. Okay. <laughs> so I do all the cooking. Um, and we're perfectly happy with that. Okay. I mean, you know, it's, it's – it's, the the notion that you have to decide who does what based on how their chromosomes are arranged is just dumb. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, societies who want to feel that way, um, the one good thing I can say is that my kids won't have to compete with their kids uh, because they're cutting themselves off from 50% of the human race right. and 50% of the capability of the human race. Right. Yeah. And I feel the same way about anybody who draws lines because of the color of somebody's skin. I mean, yep. you know, Give me a break. Yeah, that's awesome. um, and, but the, that's all because of technology. Right. It's technology that forces us to look at what Jefferson said and say, do we really believe it? Right. Okay? Yeah. And, and you have to make a choice. And technology requires you to make choices. And that's what I mean when I say that I see science fiction as sort of the cautionary, the predictive mm-hmm. fairy tales of a technological society. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, now, <clears throat> to get back to writing a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was all about writing. Come on. Well, no, no, no. I know. That was, that was <laughs> hugely about writing. I, th- th- now, like maybe the n- nitty gritty a little bit. When, when you're first starting a new property, David, when you've got like a new idea that's germinated and it's not, uh, it's not a continuation of one of the many series that you're doing now, mm-hmm. um, where, do, where do you get some of your inspiration? Like where do the, where do the ideas spring from and what form do they take? Do you, do you just like 
Like I, I've heard some authors say, like I, my idea is always how this book, how how is the story going to end, and then I have to figure out how to get there. Or I see a scene in the middle, and I know, like I know exactly what I want to happen, but I don't know how to. I, I have to learn how to get there, and then what happens after. Like, what do you see, and how do you turn that into a novel? Well, um, that's one of the things that's hard to to explain. Uh, because I think everybody does it in, in a different way. Uh, for me, I think the first thing that comes to me is a question. Uh-huh. Um, the Dahak novels, uh, Mutineer's Moon, The Armageddon Inheritance, and Heirs of Empire, which, by the way, I have two more books planned in that series if I ever get back to it. <laughs> I hope you do. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I was, I was sitting on the front steps. And I looked up, and there was this huge moon up there. And I said, gee, what if that isn't actually a moon at all? Mm -hmm. What if it's a giant alien starship? Ooh, shiny. You know, because then I had to start asking myself, well, who the heck would build a ship that big and why? Right. And how has it been here long enough to be covered over with stuff we're pretty sure was around when the star system was being, you know, yep. uh, coalescing? And why is it still here? And what happened to the crew? And all of the all of the, the yeah. stretch of of that those that of that trilogy came out of that initial question. When I sat down to think about Honor Harrington, what happened there was that. It had turned out that everything that I wrote was spawning sequels. Uh huh. And Jim Bain suggested to me that since I obviously was a series writer, it might be a good idea to, I don't know, plan a series before you launched into it. And so he asked me to pitch uh, some concepts to him, and I gave him 10. Um, and of the 10, one of them became Honor Harrington, mm-hmm. uh, one of them became The Multiverse, um, and one of them became Safehold mm-hmm. eventually. Um, but Jim had been looking for somebody to do uh, a, a space-born Horatio Hornblower for 20 years. Yeah. So as soon as I told him, you know, Horatio, uh, Honor Harrington is a six-foot-two-inch Eurasian starship captain, he was like, ah, oh, send him a contract, send him a contract, no, <laughs> send him a contract for two books, no, make it three, oh, hell, make it four. <laughs> and at that point in my career, I was like, okay, I can do this if you want four of them, you know, trust me. Um, but in that case, I sat down and I said, okay. What kind of a model do I want mm-hmm. for the universe in which this story is going to take place? Right. And I built my concept of the universe before I built any of the characters. Mm-hmm. Okay. I wrote uh, roughly 85,000 word essay on the honorverse. Wow. Before I started the wow. first novel. And it wasn't until I got to like the last section that I wrote anything about Honor Harrington and who she was. Right. Okay, the rest of it was history and technology and politics and, uh, you, know, how do, you know, how am I going to handle hyperspace in this one? There are a couple of things that I did in the Honorverse that, looking back, I wish I had done differently. Really? Uh, yeah, well, bear in mind that this is Honor's 20th birthday mm-hmm. this year. Uh, which is why we're having Honor Con here in Greenville and why Bain published the uh, leather-bound uh, autographed Basilisk Station commemorative book this year. <laughs> and so you have to cast your mind back 20 years in terms of where uh, computers and everything were right. at mm-hmm. that point. All right, well, I had just finished doing um, uh, The Armageddon Troll, uh, which the the apocalypse troll, excuse me. Which, by the way, when people said, you know, when it was released like five years ago, they said reads like Seminole Weber. It's because it was the first solo novel that I ever sold to anybody, and Bain lost it. Ah, they they lost- didn't they didn't realize they had it. I got a call from got a call from Marla Ainspan at Bain. She said, Yeah, David, you're going to think this is funny, but I have a uh, uh, a contract here from you from 1990 that was never filled. Uh-huh. And I said, really? And he said, she said, yeah, it's for something called the Apocalypse Troll. I said, 
Marla, that book was written before Jim wrote me the contract on it. She <laughs> said, really? And I said, yes, I've revised it three times because, oh, the Berlin Wall fell. <laughs> you know, there's no longer a Soviet Union. <laughs> and she was like, oh, well, I guess you'd like the delivery check then. And I said, yeah, how much <laughs> is it? She said, $1,000. And I said, send it on there. But that's why that book reads like very early Weber. Uh -huh. But in, in both the Apocalypse Troll and in the Mutineer's Moon books, I had direct neural interfacing, I had, and Path of the Furious mm -hmm. also in there. Uh -huh. I had direct neural interfacing, I had um, uh, fully aware AIs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I started the Honor Harringtons, I wanted a different tech base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why they use keyboards. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and, um, the, and also in the Honorverse, I took it as a given that there never would be truly self-aware AI, uh -huh. that, it was, that it turned out you couldn't get there from here. Right. Okay? And so what they have is they had a whole bunch of really, really brilliant software, but not self-aware mm -hmm. software. And that brilliant software, it's all there, but it's hidden in the background. Mm -hmm. And Honorverse people don't talk about it any more than you talk about the power plant on the other side of the light switch when you turn it on and off. Right. It, it's just there. And you'll see references to it you know, scattered through the books, and you'll see references to nanotech scattered through the books, and yet people don't pick up on it that mm -hmm. heavily because I don't emphasize it that much. That's not the part of the story that I'm telling. Mm -hmm. um, and if it becomes important, to have, you know, how the nanotech works, and I'll tell you how the nanotech works, <laughs> and if it doesn't, you know, don't worry about it. Right. Yep. Uh, I, I sometimes think that that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of philosophical approaching this movie project. Uh, with the notion that a whole bunch of the stuff that I tell you about in the books will not be told to you in the movies. Right. You'll, there'll be other places where you can go to get that information if you want it. But I've always, people may not believe it given the info dumps, but there are huge chunks of what I know about the Honorverse that nobody has ever seen in a book. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps keep me centered. Right. The, the reader can sense when there are rules and constraints that yep. the author, even if they don't know what they are, right. they know they're there. And it gives a sense of structure mm -hmm. and continuity that I think is a big factor in the people who say, wow, you know, you're a world builder. And I'm right. like, well, I was a dungeon master for 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. I've learned to build a few worlds. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's, um, but as far as, as far as, you know, whether or not you're going to be dated as a science fiction author, whether or not you're going to get something wrong. You are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely you are. Um, and you just sort of have to accept that going in. If what you wrote is good, mm -hmm. if what you wrote appeals to a readership, then you'll have, a, you'll have some longevity in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But it's like, okay, H.G. Wells. All right. Um, H.G. Wells wrote some classics of science fiction, but his, uh, what was it? Uh, War in the Air. Yeah. Okay. Nobody reads it today and nobody reads it for really two reasons. One is it's not his best work. <laughs> right. Uh, the other one is that his politics got in the way of the story he was telling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and and that happens too. Mm -hmm. If you read, I, I mentioned Doc Smith earlier. <sighs> Doc Smith is clearly, clearly uh, a a uh, product of the era of the struggle between authoritarianism mm -hmm. and liberal democracy. Um, Boscone and the Edorians and and whatnot. They're you know uh, uh, godless communism. Uh, on an intergalactic scale. Right. Uh, that doesn't prevent them from being thumping good villains. <laughs> right. Okay, But this is definitely an all-or-nothing, mutually assured destruction kind of war. Mm. Right. And that's the war everybody was worrying about then. Mm. Yep. And you get into the stuff that's being written now that's got a military or uh, a, a warfare component to it, and people are looking, by and large, at different kinds of wars mm. because our experience is different. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, res in that, that's an illustration of the fact that all science fiction really mirrors the present. Mm -hmm. Right. 
uh, we do our best to 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 create a coherent possible future mm-hmm. in which to tell the stories. But one of the things that that lets us do is it lets us tell some stories that would be maybe a little too close to home for right. a lot of people to deal with if it were written in contemporary right. mm-hmm. history. Yeah, I think that's one of the hallmarks of great sci-fi is they can bring current social and political and other problems to light, but because it's couched in, these are all, you know, different alien races flying around in spaceships, it's it's mm-hmm. not offensive, you know, or, or not immediately well, offensive. I have a friend who's black <laughs> yeah. who had <laughs> he'd read probably... We were up to um, honor the queen. No, we were up to we were up to honor among enemies. Mm-hmm. He'd read all the books, you know, and he re- read them like two or three times. And he came up to me and he said, "Queen of Manticore is black." <laughs> and I said, "Uh huh." He said, "You don't understand, you know, the Queen of Manticore is black." And I said, "Uh huh." And he said, "Well, nobody says anything about it." And I says, "That's what they're saying about it." Yep. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that one thing that bugs me is when you take the same problems and you project them a thousand years into the future mm. and assume nobody's found an answer to them. Right, yeah. right. Yep. right, right. That's, I, think, I think that near-future science fiction is a perfect fit for, say, feminist science fiction. Mm-hmm. But if women are still facing the same glass ceiling 2,000 years from now... right. right you better come up with a damn good explanation for why they're putting up with it. Right. <laughs> okay? Because women are not going to put up with it. Right. You know, you may have, you know, things may shake down closer to the, 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 the traditionalist ideal of the first half of the century once mm. technology's had a chance to sort, it, sort itself out and so forth. But if it does, it's going to happen because the women involved want it to be that way. Right. Okay, because they ain't going to put up with anybody telling them, hey, back into the kitchen. Okay? <laughs> um, and anybody who tells them that is going to find out what a double orchidectomy feels like uh, <laughs> pretty quick, and, and deservedly so. Mm, yeah. uh, my grandmother, uh, the same one who lived to be 101 and a half, was an inspector in a bombing plant during World War II. Oh, wow. And uh, she actually uh, uncovered a sabotage ring in the plant. Oh wow! Because she kept good inventories, <laughs> uh, and she like she told her super, her foreman. She said, "You know, we got too many parts." And he said, "No, no, no, Pauline, too few parts is a problem." <laughs> okay, right. and she said, "No, we got too many parts." And he was like, "Okay, okay, fine, go, you know, do your thing." So they had a rep from, um, I think it was Boeing. I think it was B-17 plant, not a B-24 plant. But anyway, um, a, a rep from the, the company came through, and she insisted on talking to him. And she took her inspector's book and her inventory list, and she said, she said, we have too many parts. And he said, what are you talking about? She said, we have too many of these parts. And he took a, list, a look at her list and just was like, oh, my God. Because it turned out that what happened was the group of guys in the plant were leaving components out of the engines of the bombers that were then being ferried across oh, wow. the Atlantic, oh, wow. and they weren't making it. Oh, okay, wow. and the and as soon as he because see she knew this was like a early just in time delivery mm-hmm. uh, system, and she knew you know we should not have this many parts left. Right. Well, when they when they mothballed the plant after World War II, she was the only female inspector they kept on. Yeah. And they wanted to move her out to uh, the B-29 plant where they were, you know, ramping up post-war production. Mm-hmm. And she said, no, my country needed me. I was here. I'm going home now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she did. So when people criticize Robert Heinlein about his, you know, his, his, female characters who could be nuclear physicists but want to make brownies. Right. Okay, he's really talking about my grandmother, and I strongly suspect that he's talking about Virginia uh, uh, Heinlein. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I always gave him a little bit of a pass on that. Although Annie told me, Annie McCaffrey told me one time that what inspired her to become a science fiction writer was to do something besides Heinlein heroines. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and she loved she loved Honor Harrington. We were yeah. she was supposed to do a um a short story for one of the anthologies, but schedule and then health got in the way. She was going to do the story of the tree cat who makes the breakthrough into understanding 
spoken language. Oh, cool. And someday I'm going to have to do that story myself, but every time I sit down to do it, I just, I miss her so much. Mm. Yeah. That, you know, she, when we went, when Sharon and I were married, we went to Ireland for our honeymoon. And uh, Annie and uh, her son, uh, Todd, uh, took us to dinner at uh, the Peacock in Dublin. Okay. Um, and then we stopped in to visit her on the way. We drove down to, to Cork and then up and around to Galway and back across. And she was just as lovely a person as I had always hoped she would be mm. uh, from her books. And it's a plus. It's a big plus when you meet somebody whose work you've enjoyed and they turn out to be neat people. Right. Okay. It's really a pain when you meet somebody whose work you enjoyed and you think, my God, what a prick. <laughs> right. And I've, I've had that experience too, although I will, name, I will cheerfully name names about the people who turned out to be great. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the people who uh, turn sure. out not to be great. But it's kind of like, you know, if there's an actor who really pisses you off, it's hard to separate him from the role he's playing. Yeah. Yeah. The next time that he's in the next time that he's in a movie and I hate it when that happens, but I don't really know anybody, no matter how much you say, "Oh, well, I don't, you know, you know, it doesn't matter to me." I really don't know anybody who I think that's true of. Mm -hmm. um, we carry the baggage of how we feel about the artist into our appreciation of of his or her art. Yeah, right. Uh, and you, I just don't know how to how to divorce yourself from that. It is hard, especially, especially if you are passionately interested in the mm -hmm. type of art that they perform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I, I'm just, I, I don't want to keep you too long tonight. Cause I know you got a plane tomorrow morning. Uh, Craig, got any last minute questions here before we wrap up with David? No, I, uh, I was, I was, um, I kept thinking we needed to wrap it up, but I didn't want to stop him. I know, it was David. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your, out of your, as we just learned, frantically busy schedule. <laughs> Ridiculously uh, busy. For schedule. a little podcast yeah. like ours, we are really flattered and 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 so excited you've taken the time to join well, us. You today. guys, you guys are your. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, the the thing that I enjoy most at conventions is not the panels. Mm. Okay, the panels are cool. All right, yeah. but when I can actually sit down with uh, a, a little clump of people who want to talk writing or want to talk history or or whatever, and actually be in a responsive format with them, right? Okay, um, I think fans sometimes don't appreciate how much the pros appreciate them. Uh. Um, I have talked to a couple of writers who shall remain nameless if this is going on the air, uh, who feel that <laughs> fandom is. is the worst thing that can happen to a writer. Because oh. after all, if fans could write, they wouldn't be fans. They'd be writers. So if you start allowing your work to be shaped by what their expectations are and so forth, you will no longer be doing your best work. Mm. You are the one who's supposed to be in control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't see it that way. Um, no, I'm not going to tell the fans, yeah, sure, where do you think we should go? Fine, we'll go there. Because I have a story that I'm telling. Mm -hmm. Right. But these are the people I'm telling it to. Right. Okay? And if they want to say to me, you killed Andrew LaFollette, uh, <laughs> you know, then I, you know, I need to hear it. Right. Um, and, and it's just, fans are what make it possible for pros to be pros. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and so I'm one of those people who thinks that it is not just a matter of self-interest, okay, but it's a matter of paying honest coin to spend time talking to the people who read your books if they want to talk to you, yeah, okay? Yeah. Um, and so I love... Uh, uh, the opportunity to do that at conventions. Sharon and I usually try to stay over for the dead dog party at mm -hmm. cons because the, the, the con committee so seldom gets to spend time with the guests right. because they're so busy running the con. Right. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, we just see it as we see it as payback. Um, That's awesome. And I, I've never been able. I know. I know a couple of writers who are just paralyzingly shy. 
Mm. And it's really hard for them to interact with large numbers of people. It just, seriously, it's hard right. for them to do it. But I've known other writers who are like, eh. <laughs> you know, right. I'm, I'm done. I'm out of here. And I don't understand that mindset. Hmm. Well, we, we really appreciate you taking the time, and I'm sure our listeners do too. David, if, you know, we talked a lot about Evergreen and all the stuff you've got going on. Is there a place, if people are listening, they're like, I want to see what David's up to. I want to follow what he's, what he's doing. I want to know when, when more announcements come out about the movie and, and all the other properties around Honor. Where should they go to keep track of all that stuff? All right. Well, they can go to davidweberoneword.net. Mm-hmm. That's my that's my website. Somebody else owns davidweber.com, and they'll sell it to us for a mere fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> um, and uh, they can go to honorcon mm-hmm. one word dot com. That's about the convention that's going to be here in Greenville in November. Nice. Uh, there is not yet really an evergreen honorverse site. Mm-hmm. Uh, when there is, I'm guessing it will be Honor Harrington the movie. Uh, or something like that, uh, and when we get it, we'll link from uh, from my website, and I'm pretty sure Bain will link from the Bain Books website uh, to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's uh, probably going to be a pretty good um, route uh, yeah. to find out what's going on. I between books, I spend time on the site. Mm-hmm. And they they know that I'm working again when I suddenly disappear and no longer <laughs> am writing three thousand word essays on the design of World War II battleships. <laughs> uh, y- you have to go look at the site to understand right. how That's you awesome. get into there. Uh, but um, yeah, that would be the best place to go. DavidWeber.net. Great. Well, thank you again, David, so much. And uh, very quickly, when yeah. is HonorCon for uh, listeners who might want to try to get there? HonorCon is in November, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure that I have this absolutely correct because Bu9 is actually uh, handling the con. I think it's the first weekend in November, but I'm not positive about that. Um, it is November 1st through 3rd. I just looked it up at HonorCon.com. See that? that's, a, that's about the first weekend dishes you can that's get. That's right. You, you were right on. The there you go. You were right on. Well, it's got a lovely this was, picture of This was originally planned as a one-time only uh, 20th anniversary mm-hmm. of Honor Harrington uh, event. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is beginning to look more and more like it may be a repeat, uh, uh, a repeat con. Nice. Um, that we, we, you know, Greenville is sort of midway between Charlotte and Atlanta, uh, down here in the southeast, and there is not currently uh, a science fiction convention in the Greenville Spartanburg area. Um, hasn't been for years, and I think maybe it's time. Uh, from what I'm hearing from other people, it's less. Oh boy, you know, Honor all by herself would be able to carry this forever because I don't think that's the case. But it, um, I, I think it may be the toe in the door to a permanent, uh, permanent uh, convention organization here in, in our area. And that would be cool. That is cool. Well, yeah. David, thanks again and best of luck uh, in, in your plane ride tomorrow and all your work coming up for uh, your various projects, especially with Evergreen and all the movie efforts and everything. That's exciting. Yeah, that's, that's being exciting. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Looking for news, reviews, and interviews? The D6 Generation. It's groovy is, it's groovy does defy, baby. The D6 Generation. Born the game. Oh, yeah. And, of course, with the end of each summer, each young gamer's mind turns to thoughts of lo- Oh, well... No. Mostly vacation, though. Yes, traveling and doing more geeky stuff. That's right, and there's nowhere better to travel and do geeky stuff than with Geek Nation Tours. Exactly right. You know, a lot of you may have missed Gen Con, and you're watching all the coverage from these wacky websites like our own, and you're thinking, you know, where could I go that would be just as cool, if not cooler, than Gen Con? You know what that would be, Craig? Where would that be? Uh, well, uh, well, there's a couple different places I'm thinking right. of. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. One would be Comic Con in New York, and the other would be, of course, Scotland. Yes. Now, let's say you're like Russ. I'd love to go to Comic Con in New York, but uh, as you well know, it's sold out. Whatever shall I do? Somebody hearing you might actually think you are just being cruel and rubbing their nose. But, in but the we are not. Of- we are giving our friends at Geek Nation tour right now are offering you the chance to win your very own ticket. 
yep. to Comic Con. We're giving away three tickets and three, three different tickets to three different winners. Yes, so three lucky chances to win. What you want to do is go to the d6generation.com and you want to look for the Comic Con ticket uh, contest right there on their website. Click it, and there's multiple ways you can win. You can win by checking out Geek Nation Tour's website. You can win. You can get entries by ch- following them on Facebook, following us on Facebook, following us on Twitter, retweeting it. All kinds of social ways you can get involved and get chances to win these great tickets. Yes, indeed. Now, let's say you're like, that's fine, but I don't really want to go to Comic Con. I've already been to Comic Con, or maybe it's something a little larger, a little bigger scale. Like maybe I going really to- like to go to Scotland. Exactly right. Well, no worries. Geek Nation Tours got your back there too. In 2014, around this time, September, October, they're going to be going to geek out with miniatures in the UK, Scotland. Uh, uh, so uh, now is the time to plan for that, get involved in that, do the geekiest things possible you get, whilst you're, on your tour. Eight games on the bus between historical yes. and, uh, and, and vacation-y things. That's, you know, Craig, that's a great point. We should talk about that because you're, you know, you're on a, t- a bus tour and you can't wait to get to the next site. You're on the bus now, when you're traveling with fellow geeks and gaming on the bus, the bus ride's almost more fun than where you go. It's crazy. That's w- the kind of stop. You are talking about one of the most beautiful places in the world. Indeed. And they are going to be going along the coast. They're in the highlands. There's they Nesses. Are- there's Nesses involved, I've heard. There, there's a Ness involved at yeah. one point. The oh, William yes. Wallace Monument. You're oh, yes. talking about castles. You're right. talking about uh, modern cities. I mean, seriously. There's- seriously. You are going to be seeing everything, and in between all of these different things, you are going to be playing games with people, like-minded individuals exactly such as right. yourself. So head on over to geeknationtours.com and check out all the hotness, or visit our website to enter the cool NYCC contest. <laughs> This edition of Jever Notice is brought to you by Worldsmith Industries. Do you play Warhammer 40,000? Do your vehicles explode? Search for Worldsmith Industries on Kickstarter through the end of August for resin exploded vehicle markers that let you look good while you're getting tabled. Thanks for your support. Do you ever notice how hard it is for some people to talk in public? Some people just seize up and they start to shake and their voice has that quavering sound to it that just breaks your heart and makes you want to hug them and tell them that everything is going to be okay and they don't have anything to be nervous about. Well, those are the people who are obviously shy, right? The people who are obviously nervous uh, in, with public speaking. And then there are people who fake it. And... Uh, Today, I am going to admit that I am one of those people who fake it. Um, A lot of people find that hard to believe when I tell them that I'm shy, uh, but I am. I am actually extremely shy. Uh, A lot of people assume that you can't be shy if you're a teacher because you're speaking in front of 20 or 30 students at a time right there. And I don't know how to explain that one. Uh, speaking to a bunch of students, there, there's a power dynamic that I think takes part, uh, part of the, the, the shock and the nervousness away. There's also the fact that I'm just more comfortable around teenagers. I don't know why. Uh, a lot of people assume that you can't be shy if you're an actor, and that is actually completely false. Many actors are actually shy. They hide behind their characters. They hide behind the lights. They hide behind the the cameras and the technology, and then when you get them uh, alone, you'll see that they're very shy. Um, I was always extremely shy, and for some reason, uh, on stage, I could do whatever I needed to do. In front of classes, I could do whatever I needed to do, and now, in front of a microphone, I can do whatever I need to do. Of course, as I speak to you right now, I'm sitting in a nice little comfy chair in my pub, looking around at all of my little gaming stuff, uh, and I'm all by myself, literally. The only other living creature in this house now is a dog. So so it's not really, that doesn't really enter into it. But if you were at the, um, at our event, at our Play by Mob event at Gen Con, and you were sitting in the front row, then you may have noticed something. And that would be my leg shaking at a mile a minute the entire time we were talking. And that's... That's why, because I'm super nervous, and as a great torturer once said, 
uh, anticipation of pain is worse than pain itself. So the longer I have to worry about being in front of a group that I don't know, that's more adult and, and, and whatever, uh, the ner more nervous I get, which is why I don't sleep at all, really, the night before our Play by Mob event, and I never have. In fact, last year I think I did a rapid-fire question about the fact that I hadn't slept. Um, and this year I didn't sleep and I just didn't make anything about it. But I, I, a couple people in the front I know saw me... Uh, I mean, there was a tablecloth, so you couldn't see it unless you noticed my whole voice, my whole body, like, sort of, like, vibrating rapidly. Um, I think this really struck me this summer because of um, a, a new trend that I've noticed with my friends uh, where they're inviting large groups of people to their parties that I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, and that, like, keys in with another... I don't know why I'm being so... Uh, confessional today. I, I I'm tired. It's been a it's been a, an interesting summer. Tomorrow school starts. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So I go to these parties and I walk in and I don't recognize anyone. And uh, I know that I can go and talk to anybody. I mean, I'm sure they're all nice people, but I have no not not only no interest, but like a, a fear of talking to people. And I get angry, like irrationally angry. There's no reason that I should be angry, but I get upset. Like I I want to go to my friend's house where I've hung out for countless times before and just be comfortable there. But instead, there's a bunch of people I don't know, and I get all I get all nervous and I get all wrapped up. And that happened that happened twice. Two of my closest friends this summer. Both had parties where they invited many people from many different circles of friends, and I was just like, I don't know. And of course, your friend, when there's many multiple circles of friends, then their you know their time is divided, and I don't know. I was just, I was. Just, it's just been a very nervous summer for me. Um, uh, the writing has gone well. I'm, I'm, I'm actually supposed to be writing right now. Um, uh, I'm about, almost roughly halfway through the second book. The first book went to reviewers last week, so that's a little nerve wracking. Um, but it's been a it's, it, there's been a lot of work involved in that, um, as, as I'm sure you would expect. And so when I, I when I go to these parties, and instead of being able to relax, I'm like all nervous. It just makes me even more nervous. Um, and so I, I've spoken with several people about this over the summer and, and told them, yes, I'm really nervous. And, of course, everybody says, you can't be nervous, you're a teacher. You can't be nervous, you used to be an actor. Um, most of the people that I spoke to after the, uh, after the play by Mob, they oh, you didn't look nervous, you were in front of a whole room of people. And that's, that, that, I don't know why and I don't know how, but for some reason I have, not since high school, I mean, in high school I was very nervous and very shy and didn't talk to anybody really. Uh, except for, you know, my friends. But after high school, I sort of learned in college, okay, I, I can't, like, I can't be uh, handicapped by this. I can't socially limit myself by this inability to meet new people because now I'm surrounded by new people. And this is, I think, why I wanted to talk, to the, to talk about this. Because basically what I learned was I just have to throw myself into these situations so that... I'm, I'm working moment by moment, my brain is working moment by moment, and I'm just not really thinking about what I'm doing. I'm not thinking about the fact that I don't know these people. And I think, I think if, you, if you do that to yourself, I think it might, it might help those of you who are shy like me. Uh, but it's faking it. And that's the thing. So what you'll do is that's how you look, that's how you meet people, that's how you make friends, and that's how you get comfortable. But the ultimate thing to remember is it's still faking it. So deep down inside, you're still nervous. You're still you're, you're terrified given some circumstances. Uh, uncomfortable almost all the time. It's really, really not a great way to live. But it's the way I live. So uh, that's what I that's what I learned. Um, and that's what I thought I might pass along. You just got to try it. You just got to get out there. And I know many people who were shy who tried it. They get out there and they're fine. And that's I, I, I envy them. And quite often I feel fine in the moment. I'm only nervous before and after uh, now, really, unless it's something that you know is planned ahead of time, like uh, like the play by mob event. But that's it. Um, yeah. So if you're shy like me, then first of all, I feel your pain. And second of all, uh, 
make it a point. Try to find yourself a situation with, that you want to be a part of. Don't just force yourself to do it for the sake of doing it. But if find yourself, when you find yourself limiting yourself socially, you want to do something but you're afraid, do it. Throw yourself into the situation so that it's sink or swim. And 99% of you, I think, will swim. I think that's the key is, is it, most of us will rise to the, to the, to the occasion. Uh, and you might be one of those lucky people who breaks through that barrier and you're great for forever. And you might be one of those people who you're great in the moment and you make friends and you convince everybody you're, you're you know, you're totally, you know, normal to use a, a loaded term. But, um, but you might make friends and you might make a situation that could conceivably be more difficult later on easier for you. And if you're meeting somebody who you think is is outgoing, always keep in the back of your head that maybe they are shy too. Because I think more of us are shy than aren't shy. Most of us just try to get along. And that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for listening and good night. Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA Discussions Forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalanes. The following song by Danny Burt is not, repeat, not the official theme song from the upcoming Honor Harrington movie. But, you know, we think maybe it should be. Anybody read David Weber? song is kind of what happens in David Weber's At All Costs. You'll probably recognize the tune. Missiles fly from the pod knot, coherent lie gives the dreadnought. A bellicose sight, we're freaked out tonight. Manticore and Haven back at war. Honor Harrington's raiding, their eighth fleet is invading. The VAT system smashed, our fleet there got thrashed, Manticore and Haven back at war. In a bolt hole we can build a new fleet, 500 super dreadnoughts, maybe more. We can throw them on their home system, and the best part is they don't know what's in store. Later on, if the Sollies say that we Follies will simply say they started it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go and haven back to war. <laughs>